Good morning. Welcome to uh, Bridge Builders 2021. We're going to go ahead and uh, ask everyone, if you would, begin to, to make your way in, and we'll be starting our program momentarily. You can go so in case I need it. All right. At this time, we're going to have Mr. R.T. Floyd uh, with our invocation. If you would, please join me in prayer. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to, to be here today. We ask that you use today's events to make a positive impact in our community and in our hearts. We ask that you bless this food to the nourishment of our bodies and our bodies at your service. This we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. No. Go ahead. Thank you, R.T. Uh, just a couple of highlights, um, and please share these with those who will come in, and you can even ask them when they sit down at your table, did they get the following? If you're sitting at a table, did you get at least one ticket um, for registering for our overall prize. And then if you're a student and or teacher or both, uh, you should have gotten a second and third uh, ticket. So if you did not, please, uh, between now and before the drawings, please make sure that you uh, get a ticket. I want to encourage you that we have some great vendors who are part of today's event. Uh, those vendors include Stillman College, Tuscaloosa Education Foundation, Kristen Emerson Youth Foundation, Boys and Girls Club, Clubs of West Alabama, Tuscaloosa's Angels, RE101, Tuscaloosa's One Place, Backpack Connections, True Vine Foundation, and Alabama One Credit Union. Uh, and Alabama One Foundation. Uh, please make sure you take time throughout today to, to visit our vendors, and uh, we appreciate them as well as our sponsors who we'll be highlighting throughout today. If you did not get food, food will be out there and available until 9 a.m., so please uh, stop by and pick up some food, and, uh, and then we'll have uh, bathrooms and if you go back out to the left and or right, there's bathrooms to your left and or to your right. So uh, please feel free to, to utilize those facilities as needed. Uh, in just a moment, uh, I'll be back up to introduce our speaker. So please continue to um, you know, fellowship and, and talk and communicate. And like I said, uh, take time to visit our vendors we will have a break and an opportunity for you to do that, and we'll also have lunch provided as well. Uh, it's going to be a great day, and we want to thank you so much for being a part of 2021 Bridge Builders 
conference, building a bridge to the future of education. Thank you so much, and we'll be back in just a moment. Take the photo. Hey, Brad. Bradley. You got email to me? Good morning once again. Uh, for those of you who uh, may or may not know, I'm not going to leave my picture up there, uh, but uh, we want to thank our sponsors. But I'm Martin Houston, uh, and I am so honored to be a part of Alabama One and uh, part of Bridge Builders, and we're ready to get things started for the, today. And our first speaker will be Ms. Janice Spencer. She's the founder and CEO of Venture Life Coaching which offers coaching, training, and speaking. The mission of her business is aimed at offering coaching services for personal, spiritual, and professional development, offering customized training services to businesses, organizations, and churches to facilitate leadership development and growth outcomes. She's been doing this for over 25 years, speaking as keynotes throughout the Southeast at conferences, retreats, and seminars. She's also written and taught on countless Bible studies for more than 30 years. She's actively involved in serving her community and is a member of Montgomery Chamber of Commerce in the Pike Road 
emergency team. She's a member of St. John UMC Church, where she and her husband have pastored for over 23 years. So I bless them for that. Amen. And Denise is passionate about helping individuals and organizations take life-giving and intentional next steps uh, for their future. So she's been married, uh, and as we said, uh, they've been married for 32 years and have three awesome children. If you would, help me welcome Miss Denise Spencer. Well, good morning. It's bright and early. Are y'all ready to get started today? We are ready. I know it's going to be a great day, and I am so honored to, to be with you this morning. And I just want to thank Jackie and her whole team. They've done just such an outstanding job. I know y'all want to thank them this morning. So we're going to be talking about uh, the topic, No Limits maximizing your potential. No matter where you are and, and what you're doing in education or any other type of organization, I think the heart for all of us is to figure out how to keep growing. And so today, that's really what we're going to talk about, is how you can maximize your potential. Some of these things are just good reminders for us as we get started for this conference event. Just a little bit about myself. This is my husband, Lester. He's here with me today. We've been married 34 years, and uh, it has been a journey, and we have three awesome kids that we love, and we've loved being in ministry together, loved serving together. Our oldest on the left, Harden, uh, is a, works for a congressman up in Washington, and our daughter is working on her doctorate at UAB in nursing. And our son, Joshua, is a credit analyst for Crestmark Bank. This was a momentous day. And those of y'all that deal with anything regarding finances, our daughter got married. And they all came off the payroll. Amen? <laughs> Jobs and insurance. And it was an awesome day. And this is her husband, uh, Alex. And they live up in Birmingham. So the question today I really want you to wrestle with is really, do you want to maximize your potential? Don't be quick, too quick to, to answer that. Do you really think there are no limits to your potential? I'm not talking about just upward mobility. I'm talking about where you are, where the Lord's placed you, and I am a person of faith, so I'll be sharing a little bit of that, but where you are, do you believe that you have the potential to continue to make an impact? All of us want to make a difference with our life, right? I love what John Maxwell, I'm an executive director with John Maxwell team, and I love what he says. He says leadership is all about what? Influence. Influence. So when you think about maximizing your potential, you want to think about can I continue to find ways to influence people in greater measure? I, I want to tell you a, a story about a guy. His name is Jesse Itzler. You may be familiar with this story. He's actually a multimillionaire. He owns the Atlanta Hawks. He's partnered with Zico Coconut Water. He's co-founder of Marquis Jet, which is the largest private jet car company in the world. His wife is a billionaire, ladies. She started Spanx, okay? Can I get an amen for Spanx, okay? But this was the deal. He was training for this 100-mile race, and he was running the relay. And when he got to mile marker 70, he noticed something about this guy that was also running the race, but he was running it solo. He said when he got to mile marker 70, he noticed and he had heard that this guy, both feet, all the small bones in both feet were broken. He had gotten wind that this guy was suffering kidney failure. And when he got to the end of the race, he noticed that this guy 
finished the race. And so, after the race was over, he stalked this guy. He called him, cold called him, found out where he was, told him his name, asking, could I come visit you? He goes to visit this guy. The guy's name was David Goggins. In this conversation, he said, listen, I want to know how you mentally trained yourself to finish that race. I want what you got. He didn't know that this guy, David Goggins, was a Navy SEAL. He didn't know that this guy held the world record for the most number of pull-ups in a 24-hour period, 4,025 pull-ups. So he said, I, I, I really want to ask you a question. He said, I want to learn from you. I want to grow. Would you be willing to come move in and live with me for a month? And I want to learn everything from you about how you train your mind. David Goggins agreed. He said, I've never had a proposition like this. David Goggins agreed. He shows up at his house and he said, look, you remember what I said to you? If I was going to come move in, you had to do whatever I asked you to do. And so he says, the first thing, I want you to give me a hundred pull-ups. <laughs> Jesse Isler just died laughing. He said, a hundred pull-ups? Are you kidding me? I can't do that. He said, give me a hundred pull-ups or I'm leaving. So he said, Jesse Itzler gave him eight. That's all he could muster up. He said, give me a hundred. And over a period of time, Jesse Itzler did the hundred. He said, David Goggins told him something that day. He said, there's a principle I live by, and you need to remember this as we go through this month. And I want to challenge you to think about this. He said, just when you think that you've tapped out your potential, just when you think there's nothing else that you can do, no more ways that you can grow, you think you've hit the end, you've peaked. He said, the truth of the matter is most people have only tapped into 40% of their potential. Think about students. Think about families. Think about who you work with. He said, that's the truth. He said, I live by the 40% rule. So the question is, if that's really true, then there's a whole lot more for you. There's a whole lot more for you, for those that you work with. And so today, as we sort of chew on this a little bit, if I were to tell you that I think that the way you could maximize your potential was all tied up in one equation that I want to suggest to you today, this would not be the equation. A limited mindset plus limited action equals limited or no personal or professional growth. You have a handout on your table that has this information there. So if you have a limited mindset, you don't think there's any more ways that you can grow or stretch yourself, and you couple that with no action, then you're looking at a very limited or no personal growth. So what's the outcome if that's the way you think? If you constantly are putting yourself or your students or the people that you work with, if you're constantly putting limiting, limiting ideas on there, what does that lead to? Feeling bored in your job? A rut, complacent, lack of productivity, lack of creativity, insecurities, and a maintenance mindset. Would that be true? So let's suggest this. In your leadership style, this is what I want to challenge you to think about. That you would choose to have a growth mindset. Couple that with action means there's no limits to your personal or your professional growth. So what's the outcome of this? What do you think? High productivity, excitement, creativity, passion, people that take risks, people that are courageous, 
people that do things out of the box. So this is the deal. So the first key for any of us, any leader who wants to maximize their potential, is to choose this, an intentional growth plan. I work with people all the time, organizations, and I always ask them, do you have an intentional growth plan for yourself? Do you have an intentional growth plan? You're not going to maximize your potential without an intentional growth plan. And what is that going to entail? The two things that we just said. That you would choose a no-limits, growth-oriented mindset. This is going to change the way you make decisions, the way you do things in your everyday work and choose action. You're not just going to talk about it. So let's look. We're going to kind of dive in to 10 different mindsets. If we were to choose a growth-oriented mindset, what would that look like? What would it look like? Because this is the way you begin to maximize your potential. The first one, choose to see possibilities over problems. Possibilities over problems. Are you the person around the table who's always thinking this way? I love working with teams and people and staff who when we bring an idea and we bring something to the forefront, somebody says, that's awesome, how can we make it happen? How can we make it happen? Versus, we can't do that. There's no way we can do that. We've done it. We've tried it. It didn't work. That's not the way we do things. That costs too much. We don't have the resources. We don't have the backing. We don't have the family support, parental support. No, a possibility person is always thinking about what? How can we grow? How can we do this different? How can we do this better? What would it take? How can we get creative? So I want you to think about that, of choosing to be a person who sees possibilities. The second one is choose to be an anticipatory leader over a reactionary leader. Remember that the second piece of these are really those limiting beliefs. As a leader, what does it mean to be an anticipatory leader? The difference between a good leader and a great leader, a good leader reacts to things. They're constantly putting out fires. They're constantly taking care of the next crisis. But an anticipatory leader is 10 steps ahead. They are anticipating what is to come. So what does that look like? Anticipatory leaders solve problems before they become big problems. An anticipatory leader sees potential before other leaders see it. They see what can be, not just what can't be. Anticipatory leaders in this day and time, they build margin in their day, in their week, to vision and to reflect. They build margin to do that. Because guess what? The truth of the matter is, we know now, where we used to make five-year plans and ten-year plans, everything is moving so fast that it's obsolete. So the truth is, the strategies and the structures that you have in place will be obsolete real soon. Now we're making six-month plans when I work with organizations, one-year plans, two-year plans. So an anticipatory leader knows one of three things. You're either going to outgrow your systems and structures and strategies. You're going to stall out and eventually lose ground to your competition or the market's going to change and leave you in the dust. So anticipatory leaders are always thinking down the road. They're creating future. They're thinking that way. Choose bravery over perfection. I love this. I love this. Growth-minded, no limits, potential, high-octane, high high-potential people, they are people that take risks. And you say, that is not the way I'm wired. I like my nice little list. I like to check everything off. 
and I don't like anything that requires risk. And I want to challenge you in this. I want to challenge you to think if you are not taking a risk somewhere, professionally or personally, then you're dying. If you're not stretching yourself somehow, some way, then there's no faith that's required in what you do and who you connect with. I want you to really think about where am I taking a risk? Where am I choosing to have sort of a pioneering spirit? And listen, in education, we need that, don't we? We need people that are taking risks. We can't continue to do things the way we've operated, right? To some degree, some of those things aren't working. So you guys are some of the ones that are on the front lines that can begin to think that way. The fourth thing is choose to go the extra mile versus a minimalist attitude. Choose to go the extra mile. Do you think that is where our culture is today? No. It's what we can get by with. It's the easiest thing. It's the simplest thing. It's the thing that's going to take the least amount from me. We rarely see people that take and go the extra mile. I remember when our youngest son, Josh, was playing soccer. He was playing JV, and he was one of the co-captains. And I went to pick him up at school, and he comes and jumps in the car, but I saw all these boys out on the field, and they were picking up balls and all the equipment. I said, Josh, what are you doing? He said, oh, those are the freshmen. The freshmen have to do that. We don't have to do that. I said, Josh, are you the co-captain of the team? He went, yeah. I said, though, you're one of the leaders. He said, yes, ma'am. I said, then you need to get yourself out there and you help. You lead by serving. You go the extra mile. He and I have talked about that often as he thinks about his work. I said, Josh, well, you will catch the eye of people if you choose to go the extra mile. Choose people over projects relationships trump everything, right? People trump everything. They trump the deadline. They trump the checklist. That person in front of you is the most important thing, right? I remember I had an assistant once and someone came into the office and needed help with something, but we had a deadline that we were working on getting a brochure together to get out, to get to the printer, so when that person came in, she was just real quick to go, I'm so sorry, I don't have time. I've got to get this deadline. And that person left and I came in. I sat down with Diane. I said, Diane, no, 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 no. We're in the people business. That person right there, you just stop everything. That person in front of you is the most important person. I want to tell you a quick story my youngest brother, David, when my daughter got married, they were staying at a hotel, a Hampton Inn of all things, in, in Montgomery, Alabama. He calls me the day after the wedding, and he goes, Sister, you are not going to believe this. I said, What, David? He said, I went to get on the elevator. Lori and I, that's his wife, we were checking out. I went to get on the elevator and you're not believe he was on the elevator. You're not believe this. I said, what happened? He said, well, I got on the elevator and I looked at the guy that was on the elevator and I knew he was somebody famous. He said, I looked at him. I said, you're somebody famous, but don't tell me. And the guy, you know, just kind of got puffed up, just puffed up. And he was smiling, you know, real big. And, and he said, oh, I know who you are. I know who you are. He was racking his brain. His wife's sitting there and he says, I know who you are. You are Kevin Costner. And his whole face just dropped. And he went to get off the elevator and he said, no, my, my name's not Kevin Costner. My name's Dennis Quaid. And the guy, the guy, David walked with him and he kept talking to him and he got to out, got, they were getting ready to walk out the door and David said, hey, can you wait just a minute? Can you wait? I, I would really love for you to sign something for me. So he's like, okay. He said he was just, Lori, his wife said, I was just humiliated. I could not believe that he did not know that was Dennis Quaid. So he runs to his truck and all he can find is this little square piece of paper. And he said, the guy was so nice. 
he, 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 he signed it. It said, David, Dennis Quaid, not Kevin Costner. <laughs> not Kevin Costner. Well, let me tell you something. When my brother told me that, and Lori told me how kind he was and how he took time and how he didn't make David feel stupid, and he was so gracious, and he was trying to get out of that hotel. Guess what was most important? That person, my brother. I became a quick Dennis Quaid fan. You know what? I just want you to remember that, that people are more important than projects. Let's go to number six. Choose to be predictably positive over being predictably negative. You can choose that, right? Do you love to be around people who choose to be predictably positive? No matter what's going on in their life, no, and I'm not talking about being Pollyanna. I'm not talking about not being authentic with people. I'm just saying that means that you show up and you're going to be the one that is looking to see the good. You're going to be the one that is choosing to be positive. I love this scripture in Philippians 4.12. It says this, I've learned the secret of being content in every situation. Therefore, I can do all things with Christ who strengthens me. We can work with people that you don't know whether they're going to be mad, sad, happy. It's just an emotional roller coaster. You don't know whether to go into their office or not. You don't know about that child or not or that family member or not. But you can choose to ground yourself and purpose yourself to be positive. I remember when I would come home from work after a long day, three kids, pastor, pastor's wife, caregiving for my parents, by the end of the day, I had nothing left to give. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You have given every ounce, and there ain't one ounce of patience left. You get home, you won't talk to nobody. You just want to go and hibernate in your room, right? But I can remember sitting in my car. My kids would ask, Mom, why do you just sit in your car when you come home? I would sit in my car, and I would just ask the Lord, fill me with a little extra patience. Fill me with a little extra wisdom. Fill me with a little extra love to give. That enables us to be predictably positive, right? The next one, choose investments over withdrawals in relationships. I love this. Somebody invested in you, right? Somebody helped you get where you are. We can be so busy, too busy that we forget how important it is to put deposits into people, right? Speaking life into those students, speaking life into parents, speaking life into your team. Invest by being that cheerleader, helping people see their potential. You may be the only person in your organization that does that for somebody. I'm so grateful for the people that spoke into me and saw something in me that I didn't see in myself? Or are you the person that's constantly taking? Constantly taking, you're constantly needing. I want to encourage you just to stop and pause and invest. The next one, choose perseverance over quitting. That's an easy one, right? Easier said than done. When things get hard in your organization, it's easy just to want to go what? I'm, I'm over this. I'm done. We know now, we see it all the time. We live in such a mobile community. People don't stay in jobs as long, do they? There's such turnover. But you can model that. I love what David Goggins, you know, he would not let Jesse Itzler quit, would he? He just pressed through. But that's a choice that you make. Choose integrity over personal or corporate gains. Now this is a challenge, isn't it? To be people of integrity. But guess what? People that maximize their potential, people that see no limits to their growth, they commit themselves to be people of what? Integrity. Not just in the big things, but the little things. The little things. 
If you run copies at your office for personal use, you do what? You pay for it. You use stamps at the office for personal use, you, you pay for it. There is a scriptural thing that says, you know what? If we're faithful in the little, if we honor God and we're people of integrity in the little, then he'll trust us with what? Greater things. Choose to be a person of integrity at all costs. Don't you want to be known for that? People that maximize their potential, they're choosing that. No little white lies. If you're sick, you're sick. If you don't feel you can go into work, you don't say you're what? Sick. Be honest. Be people of integrity. The last one. Choose to lead from a place of rest over exhaustion. Well, that is easier said than done. I work, again, with so many different groups, individuals, couples, families, organizations, and I hear all the time how people are what? Stressed out exhausted all the time. People are tired. I remember when it hit me years ago, I thought, you know, there's a lot to be said about taking a Sabbath, right? Well, of course, we work on Sundays. It's like Sunday's not a Sabbath. When's my rest day? When's your rest day? People pride themselves in not taking vacations. There's nothing healthy about that. There's nothing healthy about that. When you look at the calendar, if you look at your calendar, the first day of the week is what? A Sunday. The first day of your week is supposed to be what? A day of what? Rest. And so guess what? People that maximize their potential, people who are leaders, they are relentless about making sure that they build margin to have what? Rest. Whatever that looks like. And this little thing, you know, your little phone you got, it steals our rest. We're accessible 24-7. We need to find setting boundaries to shut that thing what? Down. Shut it down when you get home. Have you ever thought about doing just a detox so you can rest? I remember two Thanksgivings ago, all our kids had been home and I needed to unwind. I needed to unplug. So I told my husband, we sort of live out in the country in Pike Road outside of Montgomery. I said, I'm going for a walk. And we have this little small neighborhood, but the back of the neighborhood is a lot of land. I said, I'm going to go hike on some of those trails back up in the woods. So I took a hike. I came back that morning. I said, oh my gosh, honey, it's so awesome. And he said, well, look, I'll get up with you and go the next morning. I said, okay. So we get up the next morning early. We head off these trails, and we get to this one point on the trail. And Lester said, hey, babe, did you notice that? I thought he was pointing to the deer stand. I said, you mean that deer stand right there? He said, no, 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 no. He said, I'm talking about what's on this tree right here. I said, what's on that tree? He said, look right here. It's a deer camera. I said, a deer camera? We got any hunters in here? Any hunters? I said, what in the world is a deer camera? I do not know what a deer camera is. And he said, oh, it takes pictures so we can see when the deer are coming in and what time they're coming in, what size they are. I said, you mean to tell me that that thing is a real camera? He said, oh, yeah, it's a real camera. I started hooping and hollering. I am screaming. I am behind that camera. He's like, what in the world is wrong? I said, do you see that tree in front of that deer stand? He's like, yeah. I said, I had two cups of coffee yesterday and I couldn't make it back and I baptized that tree right there. He said, honey, honey, oh, you did what? I said, oh my gosh. He said, I got some bad news for you, girl. I said, what? I said, whose camera is it? He said, it's our next door neighbors, honey. <laughs> so listen, the moral of that story, I was trying to take some rest and trying to decompress, be careful. You can't even, you can't even safely do it out in the woods, right? <laughs> do what you need to do to build in your rest. If you're not doing that, I want you to look at these 10 things. And as we think about, so we wrap up here I want you to think about which one of these principles is a growing edge for you. Like which one do you really need to work on? 
And I want to encourage you on the back of the card, you, you don't have time to do it right now, but on the back of the card, think about what's your strength. You can write it down and think about an action step. That's how you maximize your potential, right? Naming what you need to do and taking an action step. I want to conclude with this story about my brother that I was talking to you about. Six kids in my family. I'm the fifth of six. My youngest brother's two years younger than me, David. Because my parents had been parenting five kids, they knew when David came along something wasn't quite right. So they had him tested. He was almost five years old. They knew that his eye-hand coordination was slow. They knew he wasn't processing fast. They'd go, they'd get him tested by a psychiatrist. They'd come back and he'd... They found out that David's learning issues were severe. He had multiple learning disabilities, and they communicated to my parents that he would not get past the fourth grade level. They came home. They never told us that. They never told David that. They sat down with the family, and they said, Look, your brother's going to learn differently. He's going to learn through repetition, and he's going to learn visually, and it's going to take the whole family helping him. My mom turned to me and she said, you're going to teach him how to tie his shoes. It's going to take a long time. You're going to teach him how to kick a ball. You're going to teach him how to hit a ball off of a tee. Because these things are going to take him longer than other kids, and we want him to be able to do that when he gets to first grade. My parents dug in and they tutored him. And back then, they were learning disability classes, right? Those kids were separated, and they were the dumb kids. David was ostracized, made fun of, called stupid, all of that. But he wanted to go to the same schools that all his brothers and sisters did. My parents tutored him all the way through. They got him tutors. He would come home from school, and he was digging in. He wasn't outside playing. He made it through high school. When he graduated, I thought, that's it. He'll probably live with my parents till my parents die. I came home from college for the summer. I stood in the kitchen with my mother, and I looked out in the backyard, and our yard in the neighborhood was the neighborhood yard to play. Remember the days of playing wiffle ball, baseball, football? Ours was the yard. And my dad was in the backyard digging up half the yard. I said, Mom, why is Dad digging up the field? She said, oh, we got some great news. Go out there and talk to him. Ran out there, grabbed my dad. I said, what are you doing? He said, daughter, your brother is going to college, two-year college, and he is going to major in horticulture. And I'm digging up the backyard because I'm going to teach him. I said, you don't know anything about gardening? He said, I know I don't, but I'm going to learn. I said, well, listen, he can't get into school. He doesn't have the grades. He doesn't have the scores. He looked at me and he said, oh, yes, he can. He's in. I said, what do you mean? He said, he's going to Reinhardt College. It was a two-year school. Now it's a four-year school. I said, how did that happen? He said, your mom and I made an appointment, went up, met with them, brought David with us, and we said to them, we said, look, we know our kid doesn't have the grades. But if you'll work with us, we believe he can do it. If you'll let us buy two sets of books like we did for him in high school, one for him, one for us, David's agreed to let us come pick him up. We lived in Atlanta. Pick him up every weekend and bring him home. And I'm going to dig up my backyard and I'm going to teach my son how to do horticulture. He said, where our son lacks for intelligence, he will make up for in drive and his personality. They met David. He graduated from Reinhardt College. Became Mr. Reinhardt, so loved on the campus. Married a woman who had a brother who had a learning disability got his license, and when he did my parents' funeral, he spoke at it. He said, I'm the man I am today because my parents believed there were no limits to my potential. 
I want to tell you something as we close out. You get to choose, right? You get to choose to believe that God can multiply whatever you bring Him. You ought to look that scripture up. There's no limits to your potential and there's no limits to your future. And I want to encourage you to believe that for yourself and maybe believe that for somebody you work with. Thank you for this morning. Be with you. Thank you, Ms. Spencer, for uh, those words of, of encouragement. Uh, I'll let that sit there for a second. Um, it, you know, it, it's pretty awesome. Today is all about building a bridge to the future of education. Uh, and so she, Ms. Spencer started off by encouraging all of us to not have limits, to not put boundaries in, to not get caught up in this is what someone says or this is the way things have to be done. Uh, and so that's why that message was because you're the people who need to build that bridge. You know, many times I hear people say stuff about the next generation. Oh, and they dog the next generation. And I never forget Bishop Jakes one time was preaching a sermon and, and he was talking and, and he said, man, he said, when, when I was growing up, man, we worked hard. And everybody in the audience said, hey, man. And, and he said, and, and we respected our elders. And, then, and, and the crowd was going, to, hey, man. And then they got to the next person. And, and, and he, he just kept going and building them up. And, and he said, yep. He said, thank God for our parents. And then he turned around and said, if you can't say the same thing about your children, it's not your children. It's you. OK, so so if, if, if we can't, if our kids aren't going to be able to have a pastor get up and say, man, my parents taught me to work hard and to be disciplined and to. It's not the children. <laughs> they only learn from what parents teach. And and I had no idea about her brother. But what we're talking about today is building a bridge to the future of education. Guys, COVID has thrown a wrench into our educational uh, process and system that we're going to have a hard time recovering from unless we dig in and build a bridge. What she just described was her parents took and looked at a huge gap of where David was and where he needed to be. And they put the work in to make that bridge. And every one of those bridges may be different for, for different students, for different kids, for different learning things. And as you stick with us throughout the day, you're going to see that we have uh, topics and speakers that are going to address some of those bridges that you and I can help build. But nothing better than, than um, the uh, young man that I'm going to introduce next. Uh, uh, such such a, a blessing and... Uh, when I see young men uh, like this, um, it, it, it lets me know that America can be great and can have an awesome future if we continue to build bridges for young people like this. Uh, Mr. Sean Smith, uh, as you can see, is an IB senior at Central High School right here in Tuscaloosa. He's the National Future Business Leader of America, Southern Region Vice President. Uh, and, and the state FBLA president uh, and oversees or represents 12 states and thousands and thousands of students. Uh, he is also a leader in uh, the um, Give It Up for Central High School, High Flying Falcons Marching Band. Any, any, any alumni in here? Well, uh, nah, all right, represent. <laughs> represent. And, and he's currently the senior president. Uh, senior class president, and uh, he spends time uh, outside of uh, school and all these other activities leading uh, the Northport Kappa League uh, and several other uh, great, great things. And you can see he plans to attend Howard University. Uh, this young man is not going to, he's not able to be here with us in person because he's out doing business, but we have a video uh, a presentation 
uh, forum, Mr. Sean Smith. Growing up, my mother always stressed the importance of getting an education. She wanted nothing but the best for me in life, and she knew it had to start with a proper education. That's why I always worked hard in school and did more than what was expected of me. You see, my mom simply wanted me to do my work and get good grades, but I wanted more. And it was high school that truly exposed me to the abundance of opportunities available to students like me. Once I entered high school, one of the very first organizations I joined was Future Business Leaders of America, better known as FBLA. Now, I initially joined this organization for free food and the chance to travel, but after my first national experience, it soon became clear that FBLA was much more than its surface. The reason that I joined FBLA is not necessarily important. The reason I stayed in FBLA is what matters. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Sean Smith, and my FBLA journey truly began in 2019 when I ran for Album FBLA District 2 Vice President as a freshman in one. It was not long after that moment when my advisor and I had a discussion. She asked me, is this going to be it or are you going to go further? And I'm sure you can all guess what my answer was. Now, here I am, a senior, serving not only as the Alabama FBLA State President, but the National FBLA Southern Region Vice President. Because of FBLA and because of the positions I've held, I've gained such a broader worldview. FBLA is a co-curricular organization and it's a part of one's educational experience. Right now, the way education looks is very simple. It's passing your classes, it's walking across the stage and getting your diploma. But education is so much more than that. From my experience over the past few years, students don't value education enough. Why? Because what it looks like is exactly how it is. And what I mean by that is our students are not pushed enough to pursue the opportunities along the way towards their end goal of rocking across the stage and getting their diploma. In the future, my hope is that schools will stress the importance of a well-rounded education, which is more than just various AP or IB classes, but experiences that build character, develop life skills like public speaking and respectability, and create young leaders like myself. With there being many layers of education, there is one particular layer that offers these experiences that our students need, and that is career and technical education, better known as CTE. CTE is a program designed to equip our students with the hands-on skills based education to prepare them for the workplace. The beauty of CTE is that it spans across 16 different clusters to match whatever a student may be interested in. From environmental science to medicine to business, there is something for everyone in CTE, no matter their future plans. CTE is needed because it puts an emphasis on the exact skills that a lot of students today lack when they graduate from high school. The opportunities that Career Tech offers goes way beyond what students learn in the classroom, but in life as well. CTE opens up the chance for students to explore multiple areas of interest, experience life beyond the four walls of what they may use to, and network with individuals in their desired career path, which nowadays is beyond important. This is why a component of the improvement of CTE includes a better connection with the local businesses and schools. As career tech helps students prepare for jobs, there has to be not only real life representatives from these areas to assist them, but actual opportunities for them to go to. There are a variety of ways to implement our local businesses into our education to fully expand the future of education. Businesses have the chance to give personalized workshops on employability for their field, as well as create programs that allow students to potentially shadow their workers or either directly work through an internship or even a part-time position. Building connections directly with business professionals is one of the keys to success when it comes to real world experiences. And what makes it even more special is a chance for a mentor. Having that person who has been in your position to guide you along the way and provide their insight is more than just comforting, but imperative to a student's success. As many like to say, it takes a village and that applies to educating students as well. The future of education lies in the hands of organizations such as FBLA and career and technical education. The experiences and opportunities that are offered between these two alone are unmatched, especially in high school. 
A commitment to the development of CTE is a commitment to the development of our students and our society. In closing, I want you to imagine the future without CTE. There is no true education without CTE. Students are left lacking in the areas that matter the most, and that forms today's leaders. The future of education is only as bright as we make it, and the light is career technical education. As Sir Ken Robinson, an education reformist, once said, what you do for yourself dies with you when you leave this world. What you do for others lives on forever. Thank you. Can everybody say wow? wow. Yeah, I'm going to try it and let you say it backwards this time. Wow. wow. Yeah. <laughs> what an impressive young man, right? Um, and, and we're going to have um, a couple of our speakers uh, today uh, talk about that career tech. You know, uh, I think education, uh, not I think, education to me has two roles. You need to have students college ready or workforce ready. Uh, and CTE is, is one of those things. And we have another speaker later on in the afternoon uh, that will speak to that transition and how important it is uh, to do that. But um, earlier this year, our next speaker uh, was a part of our program uh, that we did through our luncheons and it was on mental health. Uh, and uh, it was an interesting presentation to say the least uh, and a great presentation and she showed uh, just why we had to have her back uh, uh, again as she handled that process and if you want to know what that is come see me offline I'll tell you but uh, Miss uh, McNeil ha has served as a community uh, agent of change for more than 15 years uh, as a mental health professional a school social worker and an entrepreneur she is the founder of Soaring Sisters, a 501c3 nonprofit that serves adult sexual trauma survivors and the owner, owner of Viatra. I, I knew I was going to mess it up, so I'm glad you're on the front. One more time, tell them what it is. Viatru. Y'all got it? Everybody say Viatru with me. Viatru. All right. Viatru Life Solutions uh, and Counseling. Uh, and consulting services. She's married, mother of three, who currently serves as a social worker within the Tuscaloosa City School District. In both her professional and personal uh, life, she aims to empower people to become the best expression of who they are. Would you help me welcome Miss Vashandra McNeil? Right. Look, I'm going to start off with a good old happy Thursday, everybody. <laughs> Look, I'm going to be honest. I'm just happy to see faces versus just all eyeballs. And so, and so that's a blessing in itself. And even those that I can only see eyeballs, I see happy eyes. And so that's a good thing. And so it's truly an honor to be able to stand and just to share a little bit of information in regards to mental health and education. Because when it comes down to it, that is a much, much, much needed topic, especially considering the times that we're living in now. We have been pressed in ways that are absolutely unimaginable. And so we have to talk more about mental health. When it comes to me, um, Mark, um, he, he read the bio about it, but I'm a married mom of three, and I'm just so excited to have two sons in college, almost out of the pocket, but not quite, so y'all keep praying for me, and one um, in the 10th grade. I celebrate the small things, and I'm not sure um, if my husband was able to make it in, but I was really excited when I came in and saw that I was dressed like I was a part of the Alabama One team, and said, so y'all give it up for my husband, because he actually, he, he chose this shirt, and so I'm just like, woo, wait a Oh. All right. And so getting ready to get started and talk just a little bit about mental health and education. Um, we're going to go ahead and get it started. Let me make sure I'm going. No. Okay. 
in just a second. But yeah, we're gonna get that um situated. And so they're going to get that PowerPoint set up and then we'll get ready to get started. But I can go ahead and talk a little bit about the objectives um, as they get things situated. Today what we're going to do, we're going to examine the prevalence of mental health disorders impacting education. We're also going to talk about ways that um, we can identify and recognize how to positively respond to mental health challenges um, that sometimes impact students, families, and educators. And I like to bring that out because mental health is one of those topics that a lot of times people are not the most comfortable even discussing or even acknowledging that it is an issue. But when it comes down to it, we have to be honest and recognize that mental health is something that does not only affect our students, it affects parents, families, and even those who are at the forefront of classrooms and who are operating buildings. And so we have to be honest and open about those things. Another objective that we'll cover today is that we're going to highlight the importance of intentionally taking steps to consistently address self-care needed to maintain one's personal mental mental health and wellness. Because when it comes down to taking care of our mental health and wellness, we cannot do that if we are not intentional about taking care of ourselves. We have to be more intentional about that. As serving and helping professionals, it is so easy to prioritize everybody else's needs and at the end of the day, we give ourselves what's left over. But when it comes down to it, if we're going to operate and function at our best when it comes to our mental health and wellness, we have to prioritize us too because we cannot give other people what we don't invest in ourselves. So why talk about mental health and education? Um, when it comes down to it, mental health and education is a very important topic because when we think about especially the public education system, we serve students that come from so many different walks of life that come to us with so many different experiences. When children show up at our doors or when young people show up to be educated, we cannot discriminate or determine and decide who gets to come in and who doesn't. We have to accept all students that come into the public education school system. And so with that being said, we know that it goes without saying that students come in with so many different issues and experiences um, sometimes that really impact the way that they do navigate the education system. It impacts the way that their mental health allows them to function on a day-to-day -day basis. But the beautiful part about mental health and education is, is that although students may show up with so many different experiences that sometimes can negatively impact the way that they navigate the system, system, they also get an opportunity to get exposure to people and systems and processes that can also mitigate some of those things that they have experienced. And so education and mental health goes hand in hand. And so we have to um, be more intentional about talking about that. All right, and so moving right along, when we think about it, one of my favorite quotes um, that I, or one of the quotes that I like, because I have a lot of quotes, I'm not going to say the favorite one, but there was one that stood out to me as I was preparing this um, presentation, and it simply says, what mental health needs is more sunlight, more candor, and more unashamed conversations about illnesses that affect not only individuals, but their families as well. And this is from actor Glenn Close. We have to become more open and honest about the things that impact our mental health and our functioning. For so long, people have been led to feel like they cannot be truthful about the things that they experience. And we expect students who navigate systems to tell us and to be open about things. But the truth is, how many of y'all know adults who really have a hard time being honest about where they stand when it in regards to mental health? It's not the easiest because we have to work through so many different things like people's perspectives of us or the misconceptions that sometimes come along with having a mental health diagnosis. It's a hard or a tough area to have to process or work through. And so as I thought about that quote that I just read in your hearing, um, I was reminded of another quote that I really love and it talks about how the shortest distance between two people is a story. Sometimes the things that separates us the most is the mere fact that we don't take time to sit and talk and to figure out that guess what, we're more alike than different. And so I'm gonna do a roll call. As I know in presentations, I get tired of sitting. If you know someone whose life has been impacted by mental health, take a stand. This is to give you a break too, so you can get a break. All right, thank you. So as we can see, thank you all for standing. When it comes down to it, whether we know someone personally, Professionally, we work with someone, there's almost very, there's very few people who can probably say they don't know anyone who's been impacted by mental health, even if it comes down to us having to be honest about a lot of things that have taken place in our community and society. 
Sometimes it's just the mere fact that we hear about mental health challenges on the news or other areas that we sometimes have to address. And so just looking at a few statistics that I think are important for us to consider as we talk about mental health and education, when it comes down to it, NAMI pointed out some very important um, stats that I feel like we have to consider. For one, one in six youth between the ages of age six and 17 experience a mental health disorder each year. One out of six. I believe the adult number is one in five. And so the truth is sometimes we, we feel or sometimes people lead children to, live, uh, to believe or to think that you're just a kid. You don't have anything to worry about but going to school and being a good student. But the truth is the statistics show that children have a lot of the same challenges that we as adults too have. And so we have to recognize and give voice to the fact that guess what? There are challenges that they have to face too. Another stat that was shared was that 50% of all reported mental illness begins by age 14. That's middle school, heading into high school. 50% of people who have their mental illness to onset, middle school to high school, it happens. 75% of the onset of mental illness, 75% of cases that onset begin by 24. So if you consider that in between middle school and college, that's 75% of the mental illness that begins or begins to show signs. And so why not talk about mental health and education? Because that's where the majority of it manifests and begins to show itself. And so we have to have more conversations about that. One of the statistics that really stood out to me is that when it comes to suicide, suicide is the second leading cause of death for children or people ages 10 to 34. The second leading cause of death. We have to have conversations. No longer can we close our eyes and act like these things don't exist and let's just not talk about it. And what I really love about this conference is that it talks about how we bring faith, education, and the community together because sometimes there are some barriers to us having these conversations when we make people feel like there's something wrong with you when you have certain challenges. We have to be more open and honest about that. We must prioritize addressing mental health within educational in institutions when the majority of those impacted are in school age or education, education age where they're going through the education system. All right, and so as we look at it, we talked about COVID and the impact that it has had on mental health in general. But when it comes to children, that's even different. I want to share something with you that I read. It says from March to October 2020, we know what happened in 2020. Pandemic, onset, okay, it began. When we think about it from March to October 2020, the proportion of ER visits related to mental health increased 24% for children ages five to 11. And it spiked to 31% among adolescents ages 12 to 17, compared to the same period the previous year. How many of you all think the pandemic impacted mental health? It did. Even my own mental health. It's difficult when we were created to be relational beings for us to live in isolation, for us to wear masks. It also, pre it also presented challenges because if you think about it, when we have on our masks, it's kind of hard to assess some of those things we would generally assess. And so therefore, people can kind of fly under the radar and children can navigate through systems without anybody knowing you're hurting because honestly, they can only see this much. And what I learned is, is that some children have mastered the happy eyes because they know that I look for them. And so they'll give them to me just because I know I look for them. But I go a little further and say, hey, drop that mask. Let me see what you look like under there, okay? And so sometimes this, pan this pandemic has truly impacted the way um, that people operate in the mental health of individuals. One thing about this information that was shared when it talks about the spike in, in ER visits in regards to mental health is that it did not take into consideration those people who were even receiving services at community agencies or private, private organizations. We have to realize that the numbers were even higher. This was just reported in regards to ER visits alone. And so that highlighted that. What we do take away from that information though, even though we do not have a complete picture of the um, services in their access, is that we need to know that with the spike, there's an increased need for qualified mental health services in the area. Think about it. They talked about the effect that we're going to feel from this pandemic for years to come. And we have to realize that guess what? This is something we have to be prepared to address as individuals and to have services in place to meet the needs because guess what? When the demand is going up, we're gonna need some more supplies, some more quality services supplied, okay? Thank you. Awesome, awesome. Looks like we're tired of me. <laughs> All 
All right, so appreciate you. All right, and so let me get us on track with this one. And then we can keep on rolling. Oh, I'm sorry. All right, and so we're going to look at, I'm just trying to get us in the right spot. All right, mental health during the COVID-19 pandemic. All right, so as we look at mental health problems often displayed during the pandemic, depression, hopelessness, anxiety, angry, um, angry, angry um, situations within education systems, and that was something that I saw a lot of, especially coming back into the school system this year. We have to deal with a lot of behavioral issues, trying to work out those social emotional things that children had kind of gotten out of the routine with, with being at home over a whole year almost. And so those are things that we had to deal with. As we look at it, the pandemic disrupted many school-based services and it increased the burdens not only on parents and students, but educators too. Because the truth is so many of those that are serving within the education system, they have families of their own. And so they were being called upon to answer the needs for the students that needed to be served while also trying to make sure they were taking care of their own needs and taking care of the needs of their family. And so that's a lot to impact mental health as we look at it. What I thought about as I was thinking about mental health during the COVID-19 pandemic is I think we have to really take into consideration the fact that because we have experienced this wrench that has been thrown in here, there's a lot of grieving that takes place and that affects our mental health. When we think about students who were preparing, high school seniors who were preparing to graduate from high school and to get a chance to experience something and share it with their families that did not get to do those things, that was a big deal. When I think about the number of brides and grooms who were prepared to engage and, and get married and get, uh, get, get together in holy matrimony, when it came down to it, they didn't get a chance to do a lot of those things. And so there was a lot of grieving and that still continue, continues to be a lot of grieving that takes place within the lives of those that have been impacted by the pandemic. But the unfortunate thing about that is, is that so many times this grief goes unaddressed and it's not really respected or even recognized as an issue because it's disenfranchised grief. Because when people don't think about it in terms of loss or death, they don't really understand that guess what? These are things that impact people's mental health and functioning. You wanna ask me about it? My second son was preparing to graduate from the Air Force. Think about it, your child goes off for six months away from home for the first time, and we're getting ready to go to see him graduate from the Air Force, and the night before the graduation, they say, we're not having it. They were on, the kids were on, the, uh, the airmen were on the, phone, were on the phone crying, parents were crying, it was a terrible situation. Because the truth is, it was something tough for us to deal with when you were preparing for so many things and you had worked so hard to see something happen and not to get a chance to enjoy that. What we need to think about is we think about this non -tradition, these non-traditional losses that sometimes impact mental health and functioning and cause us, causes us to grieve. We have to recognize that when it comes to different age levels, people respond differently to the challenges that they face. When we think about adolescents and young adults, um, when it comes to dealing with mental health challenges and coping with the changes that they have to deal with, sometimes they're not as vocal about the things that they may experience. And what I have learned working with young people within the education system is that children want to protect parents or caregivers. And so they're not open and forthcoming because guess what? They don't want to hurt mom. They don't want to hurt dad. They don't want to hurt the guardian. And the same thing applies when it comes to those who are taking care of those young people. When it comes to mental health challenges, parents don't talk as much to children because guess what? We don't want to hurt them. We don't want to make them concerned. And so therefore in the process, there are a lot of conversations that need to be had that are not even being had. And so therefore people suffer in silence and try to navigate these things without the supports that they could possibly receive. We have to recognize those things. Mental health disorders by age. And so as we look at it, I wanted to pull some information when it came down to just mental health disorders by age, because we know that yes, mental health does impact so many different people but it also um, has a different impact depending on the age of those that are impacted. And so as we look at the information that is shared, many families, communities, and healthcare factors are related to children's mental health. Among children ages two to eight, boys were more likely than girls to have a mental, behavioral, and developmental disorder. Among children living below 100% of the federal poverty level, more than one in five had a mental, behavioral, and developmental disorder. That stood out to me because when we think about people that are living in poverty, they're already considered a vulnerable population. 
and then you couple that with mental health challenges that they have to face, that's even more of a stressor on that family system. As we look at it, age and poverty level affected the likelihood of children receiving treatment for anxiety, depression, and behavioral problems. When it comes down to it, there are many needs that need to be addressed as we look at mental health challenges in education. One thing that I was thinking about is that there needs to be more education regarding mental health in general. And I'm so glad that there are programs that are available like Mental Health First Aid so that lay people can receive general knowledge to help them know how to identify some of those signs or how to know how to intervene and assist when someone may be experiencing a mental health challenge. Because the likelihood of us coming in contact with someone that has a mental health challenge is very high. Whether we're working with someone, whether we're serving in church with someone, whether we're engaged or married to someone, there may be mental health challenges that come up. And so we cannot leave that up to the qualified mental health professionals to have the knowledge to know how to address those things. All of us need a basic level of knowledge about addressing it and intervening if needed. Evaluation, we have to make sure that as we see these things or as we recognize warning signs in the lives of those that are navigation, navigating through the education systems, that we help them to get connected to services quickly. I like that because one thing that, I, that stood out to me when I was doing some research for another project is that when I thought about the age of onset when, in comparison to how long it takes people to get connected to services, research shows that it takes approximately 11 years, 11 years that people find out or start to having symptoms up until the point that they actually get services. That's 11 years that people struggle. 11 years that they try to navigate systems, um, symptoms, 11 years that they go without treatment before they can actually get services that they need. And so we have to talk more about these things because why would we want somebody to go through something for 11 years when we could possibly intervene or increase the outcomes of them having a better experience and a better prognosis because they did receive services? We got to have conversations. Access to services and support. We pointed out that the rate or the need for more services is available, and it's already here because of the pandemic and other things that we're experiencing. But we also have to make sure that people have access to services that are needed to address mental health challenges. And what I like about working in the city school system is that we have steps in place to make sure that our students can get connected to services. We can get referrals and things done to help make sure that they get the services that they need. One thing that I thought about in regards to mental health um, by disor mental health disorders by age is that I was thinking about a gap in services that there is more services needed for, and that's the age of five below. When we think about children ages five and below, we need more service providers. We need more people who can help meet those needs so that we can ensure even our younger children are able to receive the services that they need. Because just because you're a qualified mental health professional, it does not mean that they'll see every child all the way down to five, four, or three. We have to make sure that we have people who are skilled in that area also. And so let's look at this um, graph that was um, published by the CDC back in 2020. I'm not going to go through a lot of the details about this. I just wanted to point out one thing that stood out to me, especially seeing that I've seen so many different people coming into my practice for anxiety-related disorders. As I looked at anxiety in regards to children, um, we see one thing, and it's easy to notice, even if you're not a statistician, it goes up substantially from year to year, from age to age, it goes up. And so we have to recognize that guess what? There's a need to address mental health in the um, education system. Some of the stats that stood out to me in regards to anxiety is that 25.1% of 13 to 18 year olds are diagnosed with an anxiety disorder each year. 25.1% of children are diagnosed with an anxiety disorder. The average age of onset, what do you think it is? Just hold up your hand. Average age of onset for anxiety. 25? Seven. The average age of onset for an anxiety disorder is seven years old. And think about it, a lot of times when people see children navigating through education systems, we think children don't have to worry about anything but being a child. All you have to do is go to school, make good grades, and just make mom or dad proud. But the truth is, so many times there are so many other factors that are affecting our children that we may not even recognize is an issue. When it comes to social anxiety and its onset, the average age is 13. That's middle school. What happens in middle school? People think that children in middle school don't need as much attention. They don't need as much hands-on contact. They're like, hey, they don't want us involved. 
But the truth is, they need us. They need us. And so we have to recognize that and not back off, but actually get closer to them so that we can make sure that their mental health needs are being met. When it comes to having a generalized anxiety disorder, those generally onset in the late teens to early 20s. So if you think about it, starting at age seven, that can be an onset of anxiety in general, but we can also see those things manifesting in middle school uh, or a late high school, early college. We need to keep our eyes peeled for those things because a lot of times we think because children are aging, they don't necessarily need the support and guess what, they got it, they're developing, we want them to have their independence, but we still have to make sure that their needs are being met. All right, I'm sorry, I jumped too many slides, y'all. And so as we go back, let me see, it's taking me the wrong way. I'm so sorry. All right, and so as we go back, I'm going to keep going. I want to talk about the youth ranking when it comes to Alabama in general, because a lot of times we want to look at the numbers and see exactly where we fall as a state. Because when it comes down to it, there, there's research being done to show, I don't know, it's just not cooperating with me. Is there any way I can navigate this from here? I'm sorry. Yeah, I'll push and it won't go. Okay, I'm sorry. All right, and so now we're getting back to our youth ranking. I wanted to look at the youth ranking when it comes down to it. Alabama was ranked 24th um, by the State of the Mental Health publication back in um, 2021. And so when it comes down to it, they looked at some factors that impact education and mental health. And some of the things that they looked at were um, diagnosis of major depression disorder, substance abuse, um, the severity of that diagnosis, how much access children had when it came to receiving services. And also they looked at exceptionalities when it came to um, individualized education plans or IEPs within the school. And so Alabama, when it came to to meeting the needs of youth in mental health disorders, we rank 24th. Guess what, I was a little bit excited, that's not great, but normally when I see Alabama, we're normally at the bottom of the list, so that shows that guess what, we're doing all right, but there's a lot of room for improvement, and so we have to continue to press forward and make sure that we take care of that. When it came down to the adult ranking, let's see how we're doing as far as taking care of adults, because think about it, even though we address children navigating through the education system, one day our students are growing up and they're gonna be adults that have to address mental health issues. When it came to us addressing adults, we ranked 40th. So that meant that, guess what? We're not doing as good of a job when it comes to taking care of the adult mental health needs as we may be doing when it comes to addressing the needs of our children that may, have, that may need services. So let's look at this um, next slide because I want to talk about stats because I've given you several um, stats that I thought were important for us to discuss and talk about. But what I will want to say is, is that I like to point out that when it comes down to it, we cannot just focus on simply what statistics say. Statistics are great. I respect them, I like them, all of those things. But I put this slide in here because I thought about my son one time, he came home, my older son, older son, he said, I'm leading the team in sacks. He's a football player, was a four-star athlete. And I said, okay, son, how many, how many sacks you have? He said, one. <laughs> I said, so that meant nobody else on the team just had one. And so I think as we consider mental health and education, we have to go beyond this presenting data to figure out what other information is there that is not being shared. Because it sounds really good to say, I'm leading the team in sacks, but once you go further, we realize that there's more information to it that we have not even considered. The same thing applies when it comes to mental health and education. I share statistics because I thought it was important for us to know that, but I don't want us to stop there because that's not a true picture of what we need to try to capture, how we need to intervene when it comes to navigating the system. What I was thinking about when I put this slide in is as mental health, as mental health and education, as we focus on that, we have to go beyond just the numbers to recognize that there are so many other factors that need to be considered when it comes to measuring the quality of life that individuals are having who may have a mental health diagnosis. 
It's more than the number of visits that you've attended with your, with your psychiatrist. It's more than the number of visits that you've had to, with your therapist. We need to take into consideration things like their health. Guess what? How well do they feel about living independently and having autonomy? How, what kind of sense of self-worth do they have? Because when you think about it, sometimes when you have a mental health diagnosis, it will challenge you or cause you to have to rethink the way that you thought life was going to be. That can be a real shocker. That can be something that you really have to adjust, with, adjust to, not just for the individual that may have the diagnosis, but even sometimes for parents who have students that have received diagnosis. You think about it. It's different because you've already envisioned what you thought life would be like for that child or that individual. But to find out that they have to navigate with these challenges, it causes us to have to rethink things. And so we have to go beyond the numbers. So recognizing changes and behavioral look for us as we talk about mental health. There are some things that we need to just be mindful of as we serve students and families, because remember, you don't have to be a qualified mental health professional to be able to recognize red flags or things that may stand out. And so here's a list of things that we can look for as we engage students in the education system and try to make sure we stay aware of what may be going on with them. Um, some of the things that they talk about is disassociated behavior or just having these exaggerated reactions. One thing that I thought about, especially with ch children with trauma um, histories, sometimes they have a very exaggerated reaction or they're very hyper vigilant about things that may go on in the environment. We need to recognize those things. Students who may be tearful or despondent, they don't want to really engage. I've seen students battling things like panic or anxiety disorders and they'll hide in the restroom and people may assume that guess what? This is just a student who wants to skip class. They just don't want to go to class, but the reality is if we go beyond and we ask more questions and we get them assessed, it could possibly be an anxiety disorder that's causing them to want to pull away and not engage the way that they should. Disrupt, disruptive or withdrawn, um, obsessive perfectionism or compulsive, that one really stood out to me. Because sometimes, especially when we have students who are considered overachievers and they're doing things really well, their mental health needs can go up, fly under the radar. We don't even recognize that just because your grades are good, just because you're excelling in academics, just because you're on the most light list, you too can still have mental health challenges. And so we cannot let those children go unaddressed and not address the needs that they may have. Um, you can look through the rest of the list and just kind of take a picture of this slide if you like, but we just want to be mindful so that we can know what it is that we need to look for. So what do we do when we see some of these things? What can we do to assist to make sure that we can help students if we see these things occurring? The first thing we can do is make sure we have a basic knowledge of what these things may mean, okay? We don't have to know how to diagnose, but we have to know that guess what? I recognize a change in you that has been occurring for a period of time, and I want to help make sure you get connected to someone that can best assess you to see if there's a need that needs to be addressed. The next thing we can do is show sensitivity and make accommodations for that child in the least public manner as possible. We don't want to ostracize children or cause them to feel different because of the way their brains may be wired. We want to make sure that we provide services and get them connected um, to the people that they may need. Check in with our students regularly. And as we think about checking in, um, especially during the pandemic, we want to go beyond the surface level. Hey, how are you doing? Because the most, most of the times kids gonna say, fine, good. Even with our own children, they're gonna give us the basic. And so we have to go beyond that and ask more questions. How do you know you're doing good? What lets you know that? How, how's your thinking? How's your mind? How you feel about the things that's going on around you? We have to go beyond those things. We also need to be culturally sensitive because the truth is not everything that we see may be a mental health disorder. Sometimes things may be culturally related, okay? If a child comes in and says, guess what? The Lord talked to me and he told me that he was going to send me to this college in Nebraska. I can't say you have a mental illness. <laughs> we can't say that because the truth is Culturally, that's their faith may warrant that, guess what, God talks to them. And we have to respect that process. And so some things that we should not do is to embarrass the student or the individual, um, to also advise parents about medications, because guess what, none of us are qualified to do that. So that means that even if my child takes a medication, I cannot say, hey, guess what, my child is on this, so your child should possibly take this. Leave that to the professionals. The last thing we do not want to do is to label them or give them a diagnosis. It looks like you have anxiety disorder to me. 
<laughs> we don't want to do that because we're not qualified to do that. And that could possibly serve as a liability for us if we operate outside of our area of expertise. All right, so when it comes down to it, in suicide prevention, everybody has a role to play in this. Um, as I looked at this, I think about the suicide prevention hotline number. I like to keep that one in my phone. Not necessarily that I may feel suicidal, but the truth is we never know who we may encounter who may, may need this resource. And we want to help people to get connected without having to figure out or find out how to get connected to that one. So I normally save that one in my phone so that I can share that contact or have it easily accessible. When it comes down to it, these are, uh, this is a brief list of things that we can do to kind of help curtail suicide and try to make sure that we address it in the best way. We don't want to let anxiety or depression go unaddressed. When we see students, faculty members, colleagues, family members that are going through something that lasts for two or more weeks, we cannot just act like, oh, that's, that's, that's just them. We have to kind of help to see if we can help them get connected to services. We also want to take time to listen. Because one thing that I realized, this pandemic has left us really isolated and separated, especially older women, okay? We have to reach out and be intentional about connecting with people and really taking time to listen to see how people are doing, okay? That's really important. We need to seek professional help right away. Everybody say professional. All right, so just because we've experienced a similar situation that does not qualify us as a professional, we have to make sure they get connected to the services that they need, and we need to recognize that different uh, mental health professionals have rights or privileges to do different things, and so we need to know what that is depending on what we're looking for. Staying active also helps, and so we have to encourage people like, hey, I think it's a great idea, even though our bodies or minds may tell us, withdraw from people, stay in the house, don't interact, don't socialize. Hey, let's go for a walk. Let's get active because sometimes that helps our mental health functioning. It's amazing how God has created the earth to provide us medicine and therapy without us not necessarily having to pay for it. The sunlight is a beautiful thing. Getting outside and getting fresh air is a beautiful thing. Those things help our mental functioning, and that's just the way that God has created it. And so we have to encourage people to stay active. We have to encourage others not to demand too much of him or herself. And we got to be intentional about that because honestly, working remotely, you will end up working all day and all night and pushing yourself beyond limits that we need to go beyond. And so I really like that she pointed out in the, in the first presentation how we have to set good boundaries. The next thing they talk about is just maintaining realistic expectations when accessing services and supports. As we help our students, families, colleagues, family members to get connected to mental health services, we have to recognize that guess what? These are not um, genies. They do not work magic. Sometimes getting the help or the results that we need takes time, it takes process, it takes open communication about the effectiveness of the treatments that we're receiving before we can actually get to what works best for us. We also need to encourage our families to remove or safely store any firearms or anything that can be harmful to, harmful to children, especially living in the dirty South. Because we talked about hunting, and in some families, hunting is a big thing. And so sometimes people have open access to firearms. And so if you have a student, a child, a young person, or a person who's struggling with mental health challenges, we do not want to leave those things unattended. We have to be responsible with maintaining those. A few things that stood out um, as I was thinking about suicide prevention and some things that we take into consideration when we have to assess for suicide is sex matters. When it comes down to it, not sex like getting your groove, but sex as in, <laughs> look, I just wanted to make y'all laugh. I, <laughs> but when it comes down to it, sex matters. Males are more likely to complete suicide than females. So that's why I say sex matters. So if a guy, a young man, or a male, we feel like something's going there, we need to take that really seriously. Because guess what? They're more likely to complete that process than a female would be, okay? The, also, the next thing we need to take into consideration is age. Our younger middle schoolers, impulsive, younger kids, we have to take into consideration that sometimes children will act or do things before they even think about the consequences of it, if they can even consider the consequences. And so we have to realize that sometimes age affects decisions and not just younger people, even those people who are aging, getting older, those things affect our decisions. When it comes down to it, we have to consider if they're depressed, that's something else to take into consideration, whether they've had a previous attempt before, we have to take those things serious. Alcohol use, especially excessive alcohol use. 
take it serious because alcohol is a depressant. And sometimes people think that, guess what, this helps to numb the pain, pain away, but actually it depresses us more and causes us to go further down the path that we really don't want to go. Okay, so keeping that in mind, lack of social supports, we need to make sure that everybody has somebody. And I really love it serving at Westline Middle School where God has blessed me to be able to serve for almost 10 years. Our motto this year is a place where no student is invisible. We wanna make sure that every student, every child, every person know that they're not only seen, but that they're heard and that we feel them. Because it's important for people to know that because it's so easy, especially when you don't make a lot of noise, especially when you don't have a lot of things to go on, going on, to fly under the radar and nobody to even know that you're really hurting, okay? It's especially easy to do that when you're a colleague or a professional that can really get the job done and people think you get good results, but at what cost? They don't really know, okay? So those are just some things we can keep in mind. So when it comes to addressing mental health and education settings, um, some things we can do is increase our, increase our education and awareness. That was one thing that we already talked about. Have wellness conversations. Just how are you doing? Just really finding out about the whole person because a lot of times, especially in work-related environments, it comes down to how productive are you when it comes to completing the tasks that we need to get done here. But the truth is there's more to that person and we need to just know how you're doing in general, aside from the project, aside from the deadlines, aside from the profit margin, how are you doing just in general? We also need to make sure that we have universal access to qualified mental health professionals. And I do emphasize that qualified, not all mental health service delivery services are created equally. And we have to understand that. And so if there are specific needs that students or families or individuals need, we want to find people who can specifically address that need and who are qualified to do that. The next thing or the last thing that we want to do is to make sure that we're really, really, really intentional about self-care. Build ourselves into our schedule. And that's something I had to personally learn. Sometimes we need to physically put ourselves on our schedule so that if somebody asks us something, we can say, oh, I'm sorry, that's already, that time is already taken. Do we have to explain that that's my time to go and get my nails or hair done? Absolutely not. That time is just taken, okay? And so schedule yourself and don't be afraid to do that. Encourage other people to schedule yourself and not be afraid to do that. They don't have to know what it means. Just know that the slide is taken, okay? Don't y'all question me about my slides if y'all contact me. I'm like, I don't have to explain what's going on. All right, and so I wanted to shine the spotlight because honestly, I'm just one of several social workers within the Tuscaloosa City Schools District. And what I love about Tuscaloosa City Schools is that they get it. They understand that social workers are qualified mental health professionals that truly make a difference. What I will say is prior to the pandemic, we were just general um, social workers, school social workers, just doing our thing. But after this pandemic came, we became some of the coolest qualified mental health professionals I ever seen. Yeah, we did. And I'll be honest, thanks to our supervisor, Ms. Audrey Ellis, she really helped us. Look, they geared us up, y'all. While families were in the house during the pandemic, they gave us masks and gloves and all kind of uh, apparel so we could still go and do home visits in the, in the heat of the pandemic. And so these people were making a difference. They were in the trenches when a lot of people were trying to be isolated. They were in the trenches when we had students that were not accounted for. They were in the trenches when we wanted to lay eyes on kids to make sure that you're okay because we know that parenting stress has gone up. We knew that the family dynamics were the best. And so y'all give it up for my friends. All right, just a few more things that I wanna share. The empty chair, I wanted to put this one in here because anybody who, or most people who know therapy, there's a, a psychotherapy approach where you use an empty chair. Have y'all heard of that concept before? If you have, raise your hand. Awesome. All right, well, that's not what this is for. What I wanted to point out with this empty chair, <laughs> this is not therapy. I wanted to point out with this empty chair is because I was really asking God, like, God, what should I share? And he made it very clear to me about a week and a half, two weeks ago, I was in a, in a telehealth therapy session with one of my clients. Her camera goes out, her thing shuts down, so I turn my camera off and my microphone off, and I drop something on the floor to go down and get it. And in the process, the chair throws me onto the floor and it's sitting on my back and she comes back on camera, but I'm glad that she can't see me. And so I get up and I fix my hair and I be like, mm-hmm, okay, sure. The truth was in that moment, I had to recognize that guess what? There was an empty chair, 
But it, it wasn't because I was doing therapy, it was because I'm human and life happens. And so as we navigate education in the mental health arena, we have to recognize that guess what? We are human and life happen and happens and we have to give ourselves and those around us grace and permission to navigate these processes, recognizing that we're not perfect people. I don't care where we sit, I don't care what our credentials are, we are still regular people that fall out of chairs, that get up and fix our hair and act like everything is okay. We're regular people, and so we have to even tell ourselves that sometimes, because sometimes we put on our own Superman or Superwoman cape without even being asked, and we feel like we're there to save the day. But the truth is, we have to recognize that we have limitations. Sometimes we don't always get it right, and that helps our mental health in general when we, when we don't put the extra pressure on ourselves to um, try to perform or be perfectionists when it comes to operating. What I wanted to point out finally with this empty chair is that guess what? Helping people can often be hurting people. And we need to remember that. Not only students, but sometimes people serving in positions to help educators, students get the services they need to um, navigate mental health systems. Sometimes helping people are also hurting people. So remember your bosses, remember your colleagues, remember those who wear the heavy weights, remember those shot callers who are at the top of the, uh, uh, at the, top of the ranks. They have issues too. And we all do, and that's okay. It doesn't mean that they're a bad person. We just have to give each other grace to be open and honest and say, guess what, girl, guess what, guy? I realize we don't get it right. We all have issues that need to be addressed, and we need to do our best to do that, okay? And so to close us out, we'll skip through that one. Helping professionals who need help too, what I want to point out is that self-care is important, and empty lantern provides no light. Self-care is the fuel that allows your light to shine brightly. If we are going to make the greatest impact, do not shy away from taking care of your own personal mental health and your own self so that you can best meet the needs of those around you. All right, these are some things we can do to kind of help us do that. But I, uh -oh, I'm sorry, I wanted to share this later. Okay, but the final thing that I want to share before I got ready to go, look, this PowerPoint had worked with me today, y'all. But I do want to remember, and guess what? That reminds me that I'm human and life happens. And it's okay. All right. The last thing I wanted to say is that we want to remember as we navigate the mental health arena is that outcomes begin with the expectations. The pandemic has been tough, but hold on to your hope because hope is a rope. And as long as we don't lose sight of that, we can make some great gains. Thank y'all. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, Ms. McNeil, and uh, what an awesome and informative uh, presentation. And at this time, um, I want to remind you that if you came in and you did not get a ticket uh, as a registrant, that um, you need to, to uh, go see Ms. Jackie in the back. If you're a student and did not get a ticket uh, as a student, and if you are a teacher and you did not get a uh, tick, ticket as a teacher, please go to the back. At this time, I'm going to ask uh, our panelists, um, Principal Katie Ando, to come up to the front, as well as Dr. Karen Thomas Thompson Jackson to come up and. Um, If, if, while, while I'm reading this, if you, everyone needs to stretch, we're going to have a break after this, but we're going to do a, a panel here on men, mental health, uh, digging a little bit more into the school system. But if you need to stand up, stretch, whatever, uh, please feel free to do so. Uh, Kate Ando has been in education for 15 plus years. She has um, received her uh, Bachelor of Science. Let me get it right. Uh, and uh, from the University of Alabama in May of 2007. She graduated from University of West Alabama with an MA in Instructional Leadership in 2013. And she served uh, nine years in the Tuscaloosa City School System as a special educator. In 2016, she transitioned to Hale County Middle School as an assistant principal and athletic director. And she has a strong belief that relationship building is the key to providing students with excellent education. Dr. Karen Thompson Jackson uh, graduated, grew up here in, in, in Tuscaloosa uh, County, uh, Northport area, uh, County High graduate. I guess I got to give a shout out to the Wildcats. 
Wildcats. Uh, what? Whoa. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> She's currently the executive director of Temporary Emergency Services, uh, held that position since 1990, uh, background in social work and emphasis on community services. Uh, she's been a critical player in meeting the needs of so many of our indigent citizens and helping in that arena. She is uh, currently Tuscaloosa City School Board representative for District 1 and uh, was elected as the first uh, African-American minority um, leader, or president of the Junior League of Tuscaloosa uh, in its 90 year plus history. She's involved in many other uh, services in, in West Alabama and a graduate of the Leadership Alabama and Leadership Tuscaloosa program. She has numerous awards, including the Rotary Rose re recipient in 2005 and the Leadership Tuscaloosa Award in 2005 as well. Um, she is, I hope I'm gonna say she is the husband. She and her husband, Paul, have five children together and they enjoy time in their community and going to the beach. All right, I'm gonna go over and join them. Um, Is this on? Yes, all right. Well, thank you all so much for being a part of uh, today's panel. And first of all, thank you for your service uh, already in our community and in our education system. You know, mental health is one of those words, it's a buzzword, everybody says it, everyone thinks they know what it mean. And, and, and it's, it is a hot topic, but it can have so many tentacles on it. Uh, I wanted you all to kind of set the stage of where you would be discussing it from, from your understanding. So uh, I will start with you, uh, uh, Dr. Karen, and ask you, when you think of mental health and you hear that term, what does that mean to you as either your professional life or as a parent and a community leader? So for me, the word is related to my state of well-being or your state of well-being doesn't mean you're diagnosed with anything. It doesn't mean you're happy or sad. It's a state of well-being. It's like, is your blood pressure up? You just have high blood pressure. You may not. You could have been out jogging this morning. You sure weren't jogging with me because that is not what I do. So therefore, <laughs> my state of well-being is great. Um, thinking about it, there are a lot of factors that go with it. I always usually when I'm talking to my students, try to bring something that's realistic to the table. My mental health status right now at this current moment is not very stable, only because I am a social worker um, licensed. Last night, the one of the ladies that um, I care for that is 93, received a call from DHR and she doesn't wanna leave her home. So, her son is 50 something. Um, his mental health is a little bit challenged. And he's knocking on my door at eight o'clock last night. And he's like, you gotta come down here and see mother. And I was like, okay, what's going on? And when he explained to me, we've got to deal with DHR again, which is fine. Do you think I slept last night? Absolutely not. This woman does not want to be out of her home, this is her home, this affects her mental health. So my mental health was affected by her mental health and only by a conversation. And of course, I get up this morning to meet the social worker at eight o'clock, knowing that I needed to be here. And guess who's not there at eight o'clock? The darn social worker, <laughs> she's not there. So I can't complain, can't get upset. I have to do what I have to do, but it does affect my status doesn't mean I'm depressed. I'm not happy. I'm not sad, but my mental well-being is a little unjusted because I've got to process what I have to do. I've got to put this in compartments while doing everything else that I have to do. So to me, it's, it's, it's a state of your mind. It's a state of your well-being. It's not a label. It's not good or bad. 
It's just right now my blood pressure is up because I'm sitting here and I believe that darn social worker called me about 15 minutes ago <laughs> from a non-ID number and I have to deal with her later. <laughs> Katie. Um, so mental health for me or for my children um, is how you handle unpleasant things. Um, how you handle challenges that you have no control over. And uh, my principal, he's in the back because he's an amazing supporter. Um, he taught me this phrase and you can't tell me how to feel. So it's important when dealing with mental health, if it's something that you don't think is a big deal, it is a big deal to that person. And you have to, I even use that phrase with my husband now, you can't tell me how to feel. <laughs> and it works great. Thanks, Mr. Perry. Um, but, um, and so if you remember that, it, and you also have to remember in the realm of education, if you don't know what your children are going home to, you don't know what their mental state is. Um, something that resonated with me this week, um, I have lots of different things going on um, as far as learning opportunities I'm involved in. Uh, one thing, one that uh, we're involved in right now is the Hope Initiative with uh, Liz Huntley. It's amazing. If you've never heard Liz Huntley speak, she's amazing. She has a book called More Than Birds and get it. It's a short, easy read, but good night. Make sure you have time to process it because it's, it's pretty deep. Um, but one of the things that was brought to my attention this week that I haven't really thought about and it's helping me think of our children's mental health state right now. Um, 30, 40 years ago, the school system um, was well supported by the nuclear family and by the churches. So a child has support normally in three areas, school, home, and church. Children today generally only have school. Because of the pandemic, a lot of times, or right now, churches are not meeting, youth groups are not meeting. and the nuclear family is disintegrating. Um, I'm thankful that I come from a family um, that my parents have been married for almost 40 years and um, I got to watch them work it out. They didn't quit, they worked it out. But I am my husband's second wife um, and he has a son um, with his first wife. And um, so my son comes does not come from a nuclear family. Um, and so, those are things that we have to think about when we are dealing with children in education now is the school, so, so often I hear educators say, and I've said it myself, we are not here to raise these kids. That's their parents' job. Mm -mm, that's not it. And so when, when I heard that this week, I was like, duh, a light bulb, ding, 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 Ando, get your life together. It's the school's job to raise these kids. So that means we accept their mental health, we accept their physical health, and we accept their intellectual ability. And I like that you pointed out um, about how is our responsibility, because honestly, we operate in lieu of parents. That's how we operate as educators working in an education system. And so we're charged with really helping to make sure that students' needs are met, whether we help to create those issues or not. But when I think about mental health, I think about those psychological, emotional, or life experiences that have that impact the way that we show up because i'm real big on how people show up because i think that shows us a lot about our mental health not how we see ourselves but how we show up in different environments i think that's a real reflection of our mental health thank you and as you see that's three interwoven uh, uh definitions of mental health so often when we hear the term mental health we think mental illness and that is such a limitation on who we pay attention to when there's mental struggles. So that's why I wanted to do that because mental health uh, is on that continuum that goes from I'm having a bad night because I didn't get any sleep all the way to, you know, I may be dealing with a, uh, a mixed blended family to you don't understand. Alabama one, you all just put me through it with that PowerPoint. Now you want me to, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> empty chair, baby, life happens. 
and it usually happens right in the middle of life, right? Uh, so the, 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 the first question I'll ask, there's, there's no question that a, a child's social and emotional uh, health and well-being goes into their success in education and in performance and in sports and all that. How can we address what you just talked about? How can we as parents, community, schools, churches, et cetera, get back involved and help with uh, that social and emotional well-being? Fortunately, out of the 15 years I've been in education, um, 12 of those I have been in small environments. I was at University Place Middle School. We had 150 kids. It was like utopia of education. Um, we could do all kinds of things with these kids. Um, and then at University, I mean, I'm at Hill County Middle School, not University Place Middle School anymore. Hill County Middle School, we have 267 kids. And that gives us the ability to really get to know these children, to meet them where they are, not ask them to meet us where we are. Um, we are able to do things and get creative. Um, we are, our, our school, we're on the same campus as the high school and we are the community hub. People come to us to have events at our school. We hold community events. Before, um, before COVID, we had some grants in place where we were, have, we were feeding the community. We were um, providing them with information about eight days before COVID, we gave them all this information about summer activities that they ended up not being able to do, but we're able to provide those things because people trust us. Uh, I can't tell you how many phone calls Mr. Perry and I get with parents asking us questions about things that don't even relate to school. So we're able to meet people where they are. Um, we have something in our school called Pride Academy, and it's a social emotional learning facility for kids who are having trouble staying in the general education classroom. We, uh, Hale County has West Alabama Mental Health. They send social workers to the school or counselors or therapists to the school to meet with their clients. So parents don't have to take off work. Parents don't have to figure out how they're gonna provide transportation um, to get their kids to their appointments. It's amazing. And it has truly um, been an eye opener and a life, or a life changer for a lot of our students. Um, so I think when you get down and you bend down to our students and meet them where they are, and you can really individualize a plan for them, that makes all the difference in the world. Would either one of you like to come in on that? Absolutely. When we think about SEL, um, especially with Tuscaloosa City Schools, one thing that I love about is that we're really being intentional these days about trying to make sure that we educate our, uh, or educate and inform our faculty and staff when it comes to trauma-informed practices so that they can be sensitive to the needs of our students, but also about providing resources such as Panorama to make sure that we can adequately assess where our students stand in regards to their social emotional learning skills, and we can pinpoint specific areas where we can help them to develop develop um, in those areas. Um, also, school-wide, I know that we're also using zones of regulation to try to help our students to better learn how to identify emotions, consider options, learn how to make decisions that will ultimately transfer into them being better citizens as a whole and knowing how to regulate and function as they prepare to move forward and become citizens, uh, productive citizens. So events like today, when we're talking about the community piece, we want to make sure the community is aware and engaged and involved in all of our schools. And sometimes it's not easy because those eight hours I'm at work. So I'm not at the school, but what we want collectively is events where we have topics like we're talking about today, where you can bring the platform where we can, you stream it all out to the world, to our community. We get our community back. When I was growing up, my grandfather was a principal of Druid High School. McDonald Hughes was really tall and really big. When you were truant, he walked through the halls, he walked to the neighborhoods, he could actually put his hands on you. Now we can't touch these kids now. They put your hands on them now. It's a no-no, but he could do that. And when he grabbed you, it was big head boy, why aren't you in school? And the community would rally around and bring that child back to school. The parents sat down. It wasn't an argument with the principal. Well, you're not going to argue with a person that's six nine anyway. I mean, you're going to lose the argument anyway. So there was this community piece where we were all engaged. 
So I think now it's just a matter of making sure we're all on the same level set. We have to make sure we're engaged. Now, y'all came out big time for this mask. Y'all sat in the rooms, you hollered, you screamed, you gave us some love, you gave us some shout outs, whether you were for or against masks, but you came out. We need you to come out for everything else, not just about masks. We've got schools that need everything. Um, I can't speak for any other system right now, but Central. We've got athletics that we want to improve. We've got, we turn around elementary schools. We were talking about even something so simple as pressure washing. I looked in the audience and there wasn't that many parents there. And I understand you're working. I'm not bashing anybody. That is not what I'm saying. I'm saying, I want you to be as passionate and come out and let's talk about everything as a community, not as a single instance, not because of masking, but as a whole. Let's just talk about the discipline issues that our, these women are having to deal with. I'm on the other side. It's not easy. So let's come together and have more events where we can bring to the table individuals and we all share common knowledge and it's called community relationship community connection and action so um you know and, and as you said find something you're passionate about mask uh kind of mobilize everybody but there's a lot of other issues that exist and that's really my next question is mental health really came to the forefront because of of COVID, and so the things that have been caused by COVID, we're addressing but was mental health uh, issues really already something that was going on in our schools that we should have been addressing? And what are some of those issues that we need to make sure that we address those as well? I believe, that, yes, absolutely. We know that mental health were mental health challenges were issues that existed prior to COVID, but I, I just think that COVID shined more of a light on it, and it also opened the door for more funding and resources to implement different things to better address those needs. And so I think as a community, we have to continue to press forward and continue to make sure that we provide universal access to not only our students, but educators too. And I think about our district as in general, um, when it comes to things, and I'm really big on encouraging people, especially people who have employee assistance benefits. A lot of times we don't even capitalize or take advantage of the fact that our jobs very often cover services for us to make sure that we can take care of our mental health without, without having an out-of-pocket expense. But there are so many people who during the course of a year, they will not even utilize those services. If there was ever a time that we need to invest and use those services, I encourage us to start doing that and building that in is just as a normal part of our self-care practices to make sure that we address our mental health so that we can also assist our students and those that we come in contact with on a daily basis. Anyone else? Either. Okay. Well, the, um, you just mentioned resources. Um, I know as, as a parent, grandparent, uh, community person, a lot of times there may be a desire to get involved but don't know where to go. Uh, how would someone um, go about getting involved or helping or assisting in your area, are there any resources that they could help plug into? Contact the schools. Um, Ms. McNeil mentioned SM, or mentioned money. Yes, we have lots of money coming from the federal government right now, but that money is going to go away. We have a deadline to spend that money, and guys, for those of you not in the education realm, when that deadline hits and that money's gone and that money's not spent, that money goes back to the federal government. Okay, so. Once it's gone, it's gone. So once we spend it, it's gone. Um, so the here and now, yeah, we're looking really good financially. Three years from now, two years from now, we're gonna be back in the same boat we were. Cause it's not like we can budget this money out and budget over the next 10 years. We have a deadline. So financial, um, financial donation or monetary donations are always welcome but what we need personally in hill county because we are if you know anything about hill county um our industry has gone way down over the past 40 years uh, we are very high poverty and um, a lot of our kids have never gone one mile up the road and gone over the uh, hill county line into tuscaloosa county come to us 
come to our elementary school, come to our middle school, come to our high school, be a mentor, build relationships with our students, invest in them, come to their basketball games, come to their football games. Youth, youth sports are huge. Um, we have, we now in Moundville, we have a baton company. Uh, we have a lady that teaches twirling, come to the recital, invest in your community schools. Um, that's the best thing you can do, whether you have children that go there or whether you have, you don't have any children, you're young and you haven't had children yet, or you have grandchildren that are somewhere else, still invest in your schools because whether they're blood related to you or not, these people, these children are your future. They are our future. Invest in them. Absolutely. And I like that you pointed out about the funding that will eventually go away. I think we have to be smart investors when it comes to utilizing the funding. The truth is the funding does have deadlines to be spent, but the truth is we can invest in companies' greatest capital, which is their employees, by providing them training and knowledge needed to better serve students moving forward. Even after the funding is gone, we can make sure our faculty, our staff, our, our administrators have knowledge that they can continue to use even after those funds are gone. And so I think we have to be smart investors and build forward um, when it comes to making decisions and not just put everything to focusing on what can we put out or how can we address the issue right before us but how can we plan or or, or create a platform for us to build for it even after things have changed and the funding may not necessarily exist in the sense that it did and for Tuscaloosa we have a system and I'm gonna be honest if you know me I'm real talk I'm not gonna sugarcoat it we have a broken mental health system you know Indian Rivers is there's not enough employees to handle everyone that needs mental health services. So when you hear about issues here in Tuscaloosa between Bryce and Indian Rivers, if you can advocate to the state level, we've got to do something about our system because what's happening is our children go home to their parents. If mama needs her medication and she cannot afford it, it's hard. It's a system that needs some repairing. And it's gonna take like-minded individuals that are sitting in this room to say, I'm ready. Now, don't put it on my plate. I got 12,999 things I'm advocating for. It's time that we put some of these things on others' plates. If we want to make change, somebody has to step up. It cannot be the same set of people that are always saying, oh, our mental health system is broken. Okay, we know that. What are we gonna do about it? What are we gonna do? Can I add something? And I also encourage you who are in this room right now to get to know your community, your city of Tuscaloosa. Find out where the students are doing okay and they, come, they have uh, more resources than maybe other students do. Don't go invest where it's easy. Go invest where it's hard. Go invest where you're gonna be challenged because you, don't, you can't relate to that child because you've never felt that way but you can be there for them and you can become a mentor for them. It's easy to go to a school where they make all A's and they're, you know, when it comes to AYP, which is uh, annual yearly prior, or, or accountability or whatever, if you look at um, the report cards, the schools that have A's, go look at the schools who have C's and D's. Go to those schools and invest in those children. You will find that the environments those children come from are not as rich and they will benefit more from your support. I'm not saying don't support every school, don't, hear me out, support everybody, but find where the greatest need is and go there because that, that is where the biggest difference will be made. In, in speaking to that, um, do you feel that cultural um, background, cultural experiences uh, have an impact on not just on the impact of mental health, because you showed us, uh, Ms. McNeil, that what 20% of the kids uh, that are below the poverty line have mental issue episodes. Just FYI, Tuscaloosa, 20, over 20% 20 of our population is below the poverty line. Just to give you some numbers to think about what she's referring to there. So it, that's a lot of people, but Culturally, do you see that playing a role in whether or not they admit it, hide it, and deal with it? Yes. <laughs> if you, <laughs> when you are, um, <clears throat> excuse me, 
when you were raised to be tough and you were raised to be strong and your tears mean weakness and your poor, poor, pitiful me mean weakness, then mental health is a stigma. I, um, I have to take medicine for anxiety. And it was the hardest pill literally I've ever had to swallow, no pun intended. Uh, after COVID, um, when we shut down on March the 15th, I didn't know what to do with myself. I wasn't driving to Moundville every morning and my baby was with me all day and I love my baby, don't get me wrong, she is seven, she was five, she is precious, but there is a reason why God made me want to work and her go to school, okay? And there's a reason why the Lord did not make me an elementary person. He made me a secondary person. Um, I didn't know what to do with myself. I, w I couldn't even put my contacts in in the morning, okay? I was having some serious issues. And I would not call my mama, who is a 40-year um, social worker in mental health. Wouldn't call her and tell her. Wouldn't call my daddy and tell him. I just quietly went to the doctor, got on my medication, and quietly started back into, you know, my routine. Um, and I grew up in a supportive environment. My mama, with her goal in life was that mental health is not a stigma, but I still felt it from society and what I had built myself up for. So when, when mental health has a stigma, when it's a sign of, when people believe it's a sign of weakness, it absolutely is something that you wanna hide. Yeah, and definitely, I love that you pointed that out and I appreciate your transparency too. Thank you for sharing that. Okay. Um, what I say is, is also too thinking about us being Alabama, Bible Belt, sometimes culturally, I think it comes down to an issue of people not wanting to receive services because from a spiritual perspective, people perceive that as, oh, that must be a spirit or that's a spirit of this or a spirit of that. We have to recognize not everything is a spirit. And I do believe in spirits. I do believe in God. I do believe in all those things, but we still have mental health needs that need to be addressed. Um, and so we cannot make people feel like, guess what? That means that you're not Christian enough because you have these challenges, we, we, we have to recognize that even Christians have mental health needs that need to be addressed. And God has provided people to help us to navigate through those processes. But we have to be willing to do our work because the scripture says that faith without work is dead. And sometimes we sit and we wait for God to fix everything when truthfully we have to take our steps and really watch things come, to part, come together. So... When I look at it, I also go back and think about it professionally in your work life. If you're sitting at work, unless you're getting a divorce, you don't want the world to know that you're having an episode. So professionally, when my daughter was in the Tuscaloosa school system, I had to come very close to really suing the school system. Thought I was gonna have to sue DHR because my daughter attempted suicide at Westlawn two times and everybody in the world said, you are a social worker and you are the executive director and we don't want you on paper. I said, hell, put me on paper, save my daughter. But they couldn't see that because they see this great person who's supposed to be able to navigate and handle her own. I have blue cross, use it. That's exactly what I had to tell everybody, use it. I can't do this alone. But sometimes professionally, we want to save ourselves and we want to save our coworkers rather than let the process flow. We ended up institutionalizing my daughter. I had no problem with it. I think DHR and the school system cried. I even had the firemen and the police that would come to my house because they were more concerned about my well-being. They didn't want me on paperwork. They didn't want my name and my child going through the system. I was good with the system, but professionally, sometimes that mental health, that can block you. And people don't understand that. I'm the rarity that that happened to. Yeah, and you know, all we're saying is there's one word uh, that to me surrounds mental health and that's shame. Uh, you know, the, the person who's going through it a lot of times don't know that they are they need help until they're so far gone that they don't recognize that they need help. Uh, but if we're able to recognize those things early on uh, and stop putting shame behind it, then we're able to, to move forward. And, 
we even see now, uh, I don't know if you guys, you know, Calvin Ridley, a professional football player, literally took time away from playing professional football for his mental health. And so um, we, we're out of time, not enough time uh, to, to get to everything. Uh, but I wanna thank you all for sharing openly and honestly. Uh, and, and you notice we did, they both got a chance to share their mental and I'm sure uh, Ms. McNeil and if I was sharing, I have my own uh, mental things as well. And, and, and so the reality of it is guys, let's be real. Uh, stop playing games, stop faking it, um, and, 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 and ask the questions. Uh, I, I do a radio show and every day I, I, I say, uh, take time to notice someone, love someone, serve someone, and be the difference you wanna see in the world today. And, and guys, from, from the parents who are struggling, <laughs> even though they may be professional uh, or they may be counselors, they're, they're out there, the kids are struggling, we're all struggling, so we all need each other if we're going to uh, build that bridge uh, on, on sheer foundation. So thank you all so much. At this time, uh, we're gonna have a, a break. Uh, let me make sure I, I get you the right time. We'll start things back up in here uh, with a, a presentation and a giveaway at 1025. Please make sure that you, if you do not have one of the three tickets or all three tickets based on whether you're a, just a registrant, a student, a teacher or a student and a teacher, please uh, get that ticket and also stop by our vendors uh, in the back. Um, and we appreciate you being here. We'll be back in about 10 minutes. Thank you.
Ten twenty nine. The mic's on, right? He's talking to the same person, so I didn't want to interrupt him. I've tried to get his attention a couple of times. Sure, sure, that's fine. Where, where, oh, we don't have to We're just going to announce it, and then I was going to ask him to meet me back there so that we can write to each other. Hey guys, we're going to get ready to get started again, so if y'all could make your way back to your seats, we're going to do a giveaway in, a, in just a few minutes. Hello everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started, and, and we have our first drawing. If you all can make your way back to your seats, that would be great. If you wanted to stand right there, and then that way I'm passing it when I make the call into that way. Oh, look, very fun. Yes. <laughs> He's our but he, he has a pretty good opportunity for some events. Give me the whole, give me the whole something. There's only two. Did we split the money? Did we split the money? This is for the students. And we just we just need their name and uh where they're from. All right, guys. Um, we're gonna do a drawing. I want to make sure that all of the students that are here got a white ticket this morning. Whenever you came in. 
Are there any students here that do not have a white ticket? Maybe not. All right, so the drawing that we're doing right now, it is a student, it is a student giveaway and it is sponsored by Alabama One Foundation. So pick one and then call the number out, okay? 848-4662. Is there anybody out, out in the hallway? A lot of them? <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> All right, we're going to do the next one. There's only two students here, so it's 50 50 chance. 848 4663. They, may, maybe they left? All right, well, we'll move on to the next one in a little while. Thanks, guys. <laughs> for a, a, a true treat um, with our next speaker. Matt Freeman is in his eighth year uh, serving as the welding instructor at Tuscaloosa Career and Technology Academy uh, for the Tuscaloosa City Schools. He's been happily married to his sweet bride and I was told I have to say sweet bride, uh, Brooke <laughs> Freeman, for a little over 20 years now. Uh, they have two smart, hardworking children. Anybody notice... Um, Anything about his description, like, he, he pours into his students, uh, his sweet bride, smart, hardworking children. You know, Joseph is 18, currently freshman at the university. Shelby's 15 and is currently a sophomore at Tuscaloosa County uh, High. Matt grew up in a small town of Slap Out, Alabama. Slap Out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> 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 It, it, of course, that had to be. Come on, come on up. That had to be where it came from. But <laughs> uh, he graduated from Hopeville High School in 1998 and served our military uh, in the Army for a total of six years. Thank you for your service. We appreciate it. If you would, welcome Matt Freeman. <laughs> Thank you. All right. He says so I don't have to yell, but I'm probably going to yell anyways. I'm just going to be on. I'm just going to be honest with y'all. All right. So I, I really, you know, I think I just want to stop and thank Alabama One Credit Union because I don't think it should go unnoticed that they did this today. So involved. Uh, I just, you know, I, I wonder why it is that some entities just decide to be so involved in the next generation and helping our community and just doing good, you know, and um, 
Not really throwing shade at people who cannot do that right now, but it's just a blessing when people who can do it actually choose to do it. And that includes so many of y'all in this room. Um, so I want to tell you how I got connected with uh, Alabama One. I had this student um, by the Nick, I ain't going to say his first and last name, but I, he, he went by Big Homie, Big Homie Vine. And this dude, 6'4-ish, 270-ish, didn't play football, I don't know why, uh, but uh, just huge heart, you know what I mean? You know these kids just got like a big heart, just not, they look like they're going to cry at any given moment, just kind-hearted all the time. He used to wear my welding shirt, which was way too small for him, but you know, that was Mr. Freeman's welding shirt, so I'd, be, I'd see him, I'd be looking for my welding shirt, and I'm like, what? Big homie got my welding shirt on, he's going to tear it up. Just looking like this, can't even put his arms together. So, uh, big homie, uh, his um, his dad passed away when he was ten. Um, so he had a little bit of extra character, you know what I mean? Like just just you could tell something happened, just gave him a little bit more depth. It just seemed than maybe he would have otherwise. And so he was really tight with his mom and his brothers. He had two younger brothers, and um, we clicked. You know, we just clicked, and um, so one day he got in a little bit of trouble, and um, and and I, I heard that he was going to the office, and one of my students said, "Hey, big homie went to the office." I was like, "What? How's he? How's he in the office? Something happened on the bus. Things of confusion." Well, I see his mom and him walking out, and I I break the rules and I leave my students and I run outside, and I said, "Ma'am." I don't even know what your son is, is, and I hadn't met you and I introduced myself, but I don't know what your son did today or why he got in trouble, but I do know this. Every day he comes in my room, he's super kind to everybody. He's very respectful. He's hardworking. So, and I look over, and big homie just got huge gator tears just coming down his face on both sides. Like, you don't know you just saved me. My mom's going to go crazy on me. <laughs> so, so but he just looked at me, didn't say nothing, and just crying, and I said, and she said, thank you. So I don't know what happened. About a week later, she uh, she passed. So now he ain't really, you know, got anybody. And so, uh, anyways, uh, thank God that next week, the next week was uh, spring break. And so just a few days later, I got to go and sit with Big Homie and, and all his buddies that were on the football team and, and the funeral. And it was just a sad time. His closest living relative, she was in the... Uh, she lived in California. It was his aunt. And she had to fly in from California to help out with the funeral and stuff. And um, Anyways, he was allowed to stay on his own, and, and we stayed in touch. And uh, so a, a few weeks after he, uh, his mom passed, he called me, Mr. Freeman, you at school? And it was like 8 o'clock at night, y'all. Uh, and so I said, yeah. He's like, I, I need to show you something. Can I come by there right quick? I'm like, yeah, hurry up, though. I'm trying to go home. So he comes by, and he pulls up in his Dodge Challenger. I was like, dude. Where'd you get that car? He's like, I got, you know, something when my mom passed and everything. So I went and got me a car. I said, what's your interest rate? I said, what now? I said, what's your interest rate? Did you get an interest rate? You know, you can get a loan and stuff. Did you get a loan? Yes, sir, I got a loan. I had some money put down there. I said, well, what's your interest rate? I don't, I don't know what that is. I ain't going to lie to you, Mr. Payne. So I sat there at 8 o'clock at night with a piece of soapstone. That's what welders write with. And I, and I drew on, on a table in the shop. And then uh, helped him shop back his car out and all this kind of stuff. And I said, this is it. I don't care what the curriculum says. You hear what I'm talking about? If I'm going to get fired, it's going to be for something good. You hear me? <laughs> I don't care what the curriculum says. World is stopping. For the next couple of weeks, we're talking about money. All right. And then I got to meet Miss Jackie Johnson. Y'all give it up for Miss Jackie Johnson for real. And, and, then, and then all these other good people at, at uh, Alabama One, I just don't, they got all the nice people, for real, it seems like. So anyways, and then we start this partnership, and they come into my school, my classroom, and they start teaching my kids about money, and they open up bank accounts for them right there in the shop. And they had a, I had a power cord out in the shop, and they had a laptop, and the students go one at a time and go out and set up their own account. When well, mamas don't have access to it, I'm just being honest. <laughs> Look, so anyways... Big homie now, is he's a welder. I talk to him often. He's doing well. He missed one day of school his following year, his senior year, and that's because he went to uh, on a field trip with his twin brothers uh, for ROTC or something like that. It was the only day he missed that next year. He worked at McDonald's full-time, lived on his own, 
I mean, good dude. You hear what I'm talking about? Like good, real, salt of the earth type dude. And so that's what I think about when I think career tech. Because I knew Big Homie for years. I have known him for years. I've known him for eight years now. I want to ask y'all, when y'all think about like the next generation, uh, when you think about what you want your kids to do, your, your niece, nephew, your grandkids, what you picture for them in their future, I want, you to, I want you to ask yourself what it is. Does it have anything to do with a title? Does it have anything to do with uh, how much money they're going to make? Does it have anything to do with they're going to be able to be happy, spend time with their kids? Maybe even stay married, you know, no hate and no shade. I'm just saying, what do we want? Not what happened to us. What do we want for ours? And I want to just throw this little CTE thing in the mix. Okay? I'm going to look at my phone because I hang out with teenagers all day. You can, can you tell I hang out with teenagers all day? It kind of, you know, you are who you hang out with. Um, so, anyways, <laughs> I ain't trying to get old anyway. So, um, so my story is, you know, I didn't connect with high school. Uh, my dad got fell 22 feet, broke his neck when I was 11. You can say that real fast, but that was very traumatic for me. I was the youngest of four. Didn't have a lot of money. My mom was in the banking, but she got in without a four-year degree and, and fought her way up. And, and we were struggling because my dad couldn't provide, help provide anymore. So everything got cut in half. And I went to school and I played baseball. Everything was baseball. Baseball, 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 baseball. Sports. You gotta be, you gotta be number one. If you want, we're gonna win, you got, this has gotta be it. Everything else is just details. But because I wasn't connecting to school, I didn't even make good enough grades to play my senior year. My 10th grade, I had the highest batting average on the team, was doing fine on defense. But my senior year, I didn't even, I didn't even get to play. I didn't connect with school at all. I had good teachers too, I'm not blaming them. So I went in the army. I made a lot of rank, I mean, I, I mean a fast rank, not a lot of rank, but I, I was in a short period of time and I, and I made sergeant under two years, which is not very normal and I did well. It didn't matter how good I did, I still felt like a failure because I didn't go to a four year school like some of my friends were doing, you know. I, I legit felt like a failure no matter how well I did, just being honest, just because that's the, that's the stigma that we accidentally, we, y'all, everybody say accidentally. accidentally. I'm not saying people doing it on purpose. I'm not saying people intentionally hurting folks. I'm just saying we accidentally put this stigma on stuff. I still only have three females in my program, and I'll be singing in the hall with some soul and everything, and I'll be trying to, hey, how y'all doing? Be silly. But it's so hard to fight what everybody has pumped in, accidentally pumped into our kids. All right. So, um, mm, all right. So, anyways, after I got out of the military, I tried college. I went in and, and you know, had the GI Bill and tried it out and everything. It just wasn't, still wasn't for me. Now I got family started. I, I met my, man, I got the best wife. I ain't just saying that. She is the real deal. And I, so we started this family, and everything was so good, but I still wasn't connecting with school. So thank God he led me into welding, okay? Long story short, he, he led me into welding, and I just fell in love. I, I did carpentry as a kid, you know, outside of school and stuff, so I already had that type of background, but I just fell in love, and it paid so good, okay? You know, I, I, I was uh, grossing about $2,500 a week when I quit welding. And, uh, you know, you can do the math real quick. You got any math people in here? I, I really do love math, not for real. Uh, I took four if I took four weeks off a year, I'd still racking in about $120. Huh? You know that the Tuscaloosa City Schools has a rate of pay that is very you know, uh, good in comparison to a lot of other schools, but you know, I started at $37,000 my first year. Now, I'm not throwing shade at the city schools. I got my bosses up in here. <laughs> I'm just saying, does this sound like that? that? That is very important? Huh? If I buy a $70,000 truck, do you think I like trucks? 
Hmm? I mean, uh, my preacher says, you know, you know, look at a person's checkbook and you figure out where their heart is, right? I'm not even complaining about my paycheck. I'm just saying in general, God, God blesses me. He pays my bills. All right, so, um, all right, so I, I'm obviously here to talk about CTE and the importance of it and how it meshes in. First off, I want, I want y'all to know something. Y'all know it's different. Y'all know I ain't no English teacher. Can you tell? <laughs> I use 38 double negatives per minute. All right, let me, let me, can I throw a football to somebody? Can I, I got to get a female now. All right. All right, all right, good catch. Oh, uh, I was, I was hoping to get uh, cross racial barriers there too, but at least I got the genders in. You got to be intentional about things. I throw a, little, a lot of little stuff in. You got to be intentional about things. You got to think about everything you do and how it looks, right? All right, so that's a football. That's a basketball. We all know that. If we acted like they were the same right now, people would think something's wrong with us. So, you know, we, we got beat by Texas a and Did y'all know that? Oh, Lord have mercy on Look, no, nobody say Nick Saban is not doing his job well because the kids ain't shooting three-pointers like they ought to. They ain't getting back. They got to get back down the court, man. They got to get back on D. Got to get down there and D up. Nobody says that. We realize there is a very, very, very big difference, right? Now, the football team, I watched them one time I went to an Alabama basketball game, the whole team showed up to support the basketball uh, team. And the basketball team sometimes will show up, the whole team, to support the football team. They support one another. Very different. Let me get, can I get my two people? All right, I ain't real organized, and I ain't in that slides, but I'm going to teach y'all something right quick, okay? I got visual aids. Visual, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know teaching jargon too good, okay? So, you got it? Yeah, you got it the right way. It's the same. Uh-huh. Now, look, y'all seen my little yellow highlighted thing on the list? Because I didn't tell them. Look. I'd be like, where'd big homie go? Big homie, is he vaping back in? Hold on. Where y'all going? Somebody come in the classroom? This is my job. Every day. This is me. Now, you talking about, what's, what's the kids doing? I don't know. I know what this kid's doing back here. I'm with, I'm with one. I had 49 in one class one time. 48 of them roaming with torches. I'm, I'll be so paranoid. Is the grown folk come in here? Because grown folks are mean sometimes. All right, y'all y'all appreciate y'all. Right. Look, when I tell y'all it's hard to go back in there and check an email like that, I'll stay out there on lunch break. When they say, Mr. Freeman, can you help me work with my weld? Day after day, I'll be out there on lunch break. And I, it's hard for me to do the things that another teacher has the ability to do. Just like, and, and, and they're great at what they do, but it's very different, right? So what I want to tell you is, when we're talking about the importance of career technical education and how it, how it is and how it should be, the first thing we got to do is figure out where we are to see where we're going to go. If we don't realize that right now, currently, we treat CTE teachers with the same expectations as we do English science and math teachers, we're not going to get better. We have to figure out that things are different. Not better for these people, not worse for these people, or, or vice versa, but they're just different. And let's all support each other in our differences, right? You see what I'm saying? All right, so I'm going to tell a couple of stories. I don't even know. I'm doing okay on time. I'm doing okay. Thank you, Lord. Um, so I just, I just added one dude to the list of things I wanted to speak about because he texted me, Mr. Freeman, what you doing tomorrow, man? I said, uh, I said, just school, you know, the same thing. He said, can I come by? I said, yeah. So uh, I will say his name. His name's Rod Rollins. And uh, Rod was in my classroom one day, I, and it was the class with 49 in there. 
And uh, I was almost trying to keep it a secret because I knew that, you know, I was going to get in trouble or something with so many kids. But I was like, maybe if they let it go a few weeks or whatever, they ain't going to change it. And that's kind of how it was that semester. And it was cool. I had no write-ups, the whole class, no real issues. Nobody got in a fight. Didn't catch nobody doing nothing crazy. So Rod was in there, and he would come in every day, and he had his, his dreads, were, you know, this growing out. So it was just about down to his nose, right? And, I was, and he didn't ever smile or nothing. He looked at me crazy. I'm like, I'm just going to be careful, you know. I'm just going to be careful. Hey. So, so um, one day I had another student that was sitting in the back. Well, you know, they lined the back wall. And we were in there, and, uh, and, and a friend of mine, an acquaintance of mine, had come in to help weld. And he was going out, and he happened to be a country white dude, you know, kind of like people might think about me. And so... I said, all right, brother. I said, you be good, all right? He said, yeah, you be good too, friend. Y'all, y'all learn now. And he said, uh, I said, hey, before you leave, what, how much money are you finna go make? He said, I'm gonna be on 45 and 100. 45 and 100. I said, what's that mean? He said, that means $45 an hour and $100 a day per diem. And the kids was like, for real? This, this dude? So we did the math on the board, did a math lesson. And uh, one of the guys in the back said, Mr. Freeman, and, uh, Y'all remember Terry Roller in the Tuscaloosa City Schools? Does anybody? I love that dude. He said, Freeman, I talk in black and white. We can talk. You understand? Speak to me in black and white. So I'm going to speak in black and white because I got love in my heart. And he, I, he said, Mr. Freeman, who makes more money, black folks or white folks? I said, y'all raise your hand if you're planning on making more than $37,000 a year. And everybody raised their hand. I said, it seemed like to me, everybody in here plans on making more money than me, and I'm white as it is. This is white. <laughs> Look. So I got to talking about it to the whole class. And a lot of my football players, especially C High, that's when my wife graduated. Yep, yep. They was like, dude, why are you tripping on Freeman trying to get him caught up in his words and everything, man? Leave him alone. You know he's cool. Don't, don't mess with him. So I was like, no, 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 no. We talk about it. I can talk about it. And so we talked about it in a little bit. And then Rod is over here doing the same look the whole time. He sat right next to him. You ever remember where the kids sit? You know, like, you remember where they were in the class? So he's right over next to the door. And, uh, and the next day he comes in, and I'm like I am now. I'm like all over the place. And so he comes up. He said, I just want to let you know something. I couldn't sleep last night. I said, how's that? You all right? He said, I was, I was up all night thinking about what you said. And I was like, what in the world did I say? He said, uh, and I just listened. I didn't tell him I didn't know what, I, what he was talking about. You know, I just listened. I was like, oh, yeah? And uh, he said, yeah, man. You know, I just want to let you know you're talking about I'm going to be who I, who, who I want to be, and it's just up to me if I want to blame somebody or something. It's on me. That's what I, had, that's what I went into because I felt like God gave me an opportunity to tell people, you can plan to not do well. You can plan your excuses out, or you can just be whoever you want to be. And God will bless your hard work, I'm telling you. And so... He, he came and kind of reminded me what I said. and He said, I just want to let you know I'm in all the way. <clears throat> all in. And he was. From that day on, that dude, his attitude was changed. Everything changed. Uh, he, he, he got out. He, <clears throat> he didn't start school in August after he graduated in May. He started school in June, like a week later. He went all the way through Shelton's welding program. He's making... Uh, and I say only because he's worth more than this, but he's only making $28 an hour right now, okay? And uh, at 22, I believe Rod is. And what he, he is doing is he come by the school tomorrow because I let people visit. Don't tell my boy. I let people visit and get ready for a weld test, former students and stuff. And they do. And my other kids are like, man, he did that, and he's doing this, and he's just so cool. And, you know, it kind of builds everybody up, right? <clears throat> and he's going to... Um, What's that SpaceX company or whatever? Y'all heard about this? He's going to take a weld test for SpaceX. And he just wants to get ready. He's always climbing. I broke down. I had a 66 Ford truck. I broke down on the west side, and I was trying to call some students. Here comes Rod showed up. He got one day off a month, 30 days. He was going to Shelton and working at two different jobs, and he came and helped Mr. Freeman get, you know, get back on the road and everything. But um, anyways, all right, so... Uh, I want to move on. Uh, that's, that's one story. All right. While, while Rod was going through all that growth, he
He had two of his best friends, and they both went to prison. Neither one of them stayed in my program. They both kind of dabbled in my program and then left. But they didn't connect, just like I didn't connect in high school. Did any of y'all have youth pastors y'all was close to growing up? I'm not trying to ostracize anybody that didn't, but I'm just saying, did, you know how you're with somebody for like two, three years? Or if you have parents and you're with them like your whole life? What about all the kids, I, I, y'all were talking about all the kids that don't have that? You know, I'm their dad. Care what I look like? I'm their dad. For three years. And I can make them connect to school. And it ain't about me, but God gave me that right and gave me that, that ability. I make them connect to school. I make them love people. I make them love work. That's happening in CTE classes all over the place, man. No offense to anybody, but they're not connecting to me from August to December and thinking, I ain't got to deal with him no more. They're like, this dude right here, I'm going to be in this class for three years. And then, I, and then I'm going to, I done talked to my homeboy, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be like linked up with him for five, ten years after that. So when I think about CTE, and I'm going to keep saying it, it's, it's like a whole different thing. It's like a different ability. And yet sometimes we try to throw shade a little bit accidentally. You heard what I'm talking about, accidentally? I was watching some videos trying to get ready for this, so I sounded halfway decent. And, um, you know, I got statistics, like 75% of career technical education students go, to, go on to a post-secondary education. Me and my program, y'all know what, what percent I'm sitting on going somewhere? 100. And I, got, I, got, I do have a lot of support. I really do. And so mainly God blessing it. That's just the truth. And so, um, you know, they all either go to the military, they all go to a career job, not a job, but a career position, or they go to college. I like all that. My son's on a full ride at Alabama. He's got 60000 in, in scholarship money. They're paying him to go to school here. You know, so I'm obviously for college. I'm just saying, like, it doesn't matter which one of those routes. So when I ask, what do you think about your kids doing? I'm not sure what my son's going to do. He said, he told me last week he's going to get a business degree. Dad, I'm not really getting it so much for the degree, but I'm getting it so I can learn because I really want to be in business. I want to, like, figure out what they got figured out so I can go and use it. But, you know, not just to say he's got it. Does that make sense? You know, so a lot of times people accidentally put these goals on their kids for them just so they can tell their friends, my son is... Um, He's getting his master's. So proud of him. And I feel good telling you. You know, it's not, a, what about your kids? I got a family member, and she, my, my cousin, she said, I'm going to be a nurse. And I heard her telling my mom and some other people, and her dad said, well, let me go to medical school. That's cool, too. I love doctors when I get, you know, and I need them. But it doesn't mean she wants to do that. All right, let me go on, let me go on, let me go on. All right. So, um, I used to not like it when people said school is not for everybody, you know, so they probably need to go to Weldon because it kind of sounds condescending if you think about it. If you're a Weldon student and somebody goes, so glad you're over there because school ain't for everybody. <laughs> you know, it makes them feel like, okay, I'm done then. All right, you have a good day, you know. So, um, I, I got a student that came through there. His name's Davis Bowers. He's from Northridge, got a 32 on ACT, got a full ride offer, you know, just a presidential scholarship at Alabama. Turned it down, went to Letourneau in Texas and paid some money so he can get a medical, metallurgical engineering degree, and that was the school of his choice and everything. And, and now he's going to be helping a, a, a growing company grow even more as their engineer and he was probably supposed to go do something else, but now he's doing something in the welding world. Um, I, you know, there's more statistics out there. Like, CTE students are a lot more higher percentage. Uh, they, they have a lot higher percentage in actually graduating from school, uh, from uh, uh, four-year universities. And you can look it up. There's on and on and on. But what I wanted to tell you today is that if we truly love our kids, if we can look at our kids and say, I love you, man, you want them to learn more opportunity. You want them to have exposure to more than just not dying on the class, but more than just the typical classrooms that all of us have gone through. 
You want them to learn that plus this. And you want them to connect. Lastly, I had a student last week said, I need to work on my fractions. I said, I appreciate you being honest. Because I'm, I'm about safety, you know. I'm about like, you can say it in here. And if anybody tries to jank, I promise you I can jank. I'm finna jank. I got something on every one of y'all right now. <laughs> jank on it. Jank some. So anyway, I wrote on the board one half. I love, I love dry erase boards. One half plus one half. To the other student. I don't know, Mr. Freeman. He's 17. He's super articulate. He comes up to me and says things like, Mr. Freeman, I just wanted to thank you for being so kind while we're working here. I'm learning so much, and I enjoy my, my time when I'm here. But this dude couldn't tell me what a half plus a half is. That's a problem. And I promise you, in December when he goes home from Christmas, he's going to know a whole lot more about fractions than that. He's going like, he, to like them, and, I, and he don't like them now. It's because I'm going to go out there and I'm going to do projects. I'm like, you see what I'm talking about, man? Live, like, hands touching stuff that half plus a half. And he's going to connect, and he's going to take that back into his math class. And he's going to do okay. He's going to do great. So if we really want our kids to succeed over here and, and – Traditional education, as some might call it, we need to say it's mandatory for them to take classes over here. And we need to act like in our hearts that we, we really want them to do that. You got what I'm saying? So we don't accidentally not love them. All right. I appreciate y'all letting me ramble on for a minute. I left some stuff. I'm going to sit this right here. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. That was uh, awesome and very enlightening. And as I said, our education system needs to build a bridge. And um, all of those things he was talking about was building a bridge uh, to the future of education and how we do that. And of course, Alabama One uh, is uh, excited to be a part of putting on this event, building that bridge. Uh, but part of what birthed this whole uh, entire conference was through our financial wellness department. And so we would be remiss if we didn't take a moment. It's great, you know, uh, $28 an hour, $50 an hour, whatever that is, uh, but you know how often uh, it's not how much money you make. Uh, it's what you do with it. Uh, I was blessed to play, play football in Alabama, and I had quite a few buddies that made a lot of money, and, uh, and a lot of them don't have any of that money today. Uh, and it's because they didn't know what to do with it and how to handle it. And when you don't know what to do with it, um, you get to go see this guy. <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, <laughs> And um, this guy is David Cottingham. Uh, I was a VA and a JD from the University of Alabama. He practiced law in Tuscaloosa and Northport for eight years. And in uh, July of 1996, he was appointed Chapter 13 Standing Trustee for the Northern District of Alabama Western Division. Uh, and he still holds that position uh, to this day. Uh, he's a member of the Alabama State Bar, Tuscaloosa County Bar Association, and the NACTT. And he also serves uh, as the CFO uh, of Harvest Church, which is a church that I'm blessed to pastor. Uh, and so he's going to come and challenge us and talk to us uh, a little bit on uh, finances and bankruptcy. Thank you, sir. You, you can take that picture down. I, I, I tell you, I, Bradley came and took that picture about uh, three weeks after I recovered from COVID. Boy, I really do look sick in, in that picture. <laughs> So you can take that down, Bradley. It's a pleasure to be here today. I just I appreciate uh, Alabama One. It's, Alabama One has been a, uh, just instrumental in, in everything that, that this Bridge Builders Conference has been great. Uh, 
I have the pleasure of being my third time to speak at a Bridge Builders Conference. I, I, I appreciate it. It's an honor to be asked back and just to come back and be able to pre, uh, speak. Uh, I'm passionate. I'm passionate. I'm, uh, Matt Freeman, I, I love his passion. I love his passion because I'm, I'm passionate. Uh, I, I'm passionate about service. Uh, I guess I want to tell you uh, why I do what I do. That's what I like to start off with every time, why I do what I do. You know, I do what I do. Everything I do is filtered through two things. One is my my belief and my faith in my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and what he's done for me and his servant leadership that he's called me to. And I, and I filter everything I do through that and my faith in Christ. I want to be a servant leader, and that's why I'm here today, to pour into others. Second thing, the reason I am the man I am today is when I was young, I had a person stand in the gap for me, and that was my Uncle Bud. If you ever hear me speak, you hear me talk about my Uncle Bud. And my Uncle Bud, he was that person that stood in the gap. And he, he closed the gap for me of things that was, that was missing in my life. And so what I want to talk to you today about is, is and I love the way Alabama One put it, and that's financial wellness. You know, I used to call it education, financial education, but we need more than that. It's financial wellness. And if you don't know, or if you don't know it yet, there's a great gap in our community for financial wellness all around us. Uh, and one of the things that we need to do is learn today what we can do to help close that gap. And I want, I want to do that. I want to share with you some concepts that I believe are very important. And if you would learn these concepts that I'm going to give you, if you would just learn them yourself, you'll be able, it'll be, it'll be a difference maker in your life, and then you can make a difference in someone else's life. Um, when I was growing up, one of the things that my Uncle Bud taught me very early on as a young man, it was very, it was very eye-opening to me. He told me this, he says, the choices, David, that you make today will follow you for the rest of your life. The choices you make today will follow you for the rest of your life. What I want to talk today is about how the art of choosing wisely, how to make wise choices. As Martin said, I'm the Chapter 13 bankruptcy trustee. I have been that for the last 26 years here in Tuscaloosa. When I started that position as a young man, uh, I, I wanted to make a difference. I wanted my... I wanted my uh, belief of being a servant leader to work through that. And I wanted to make a difference in people's lives. What I saw people was at their worst come into Chapter 13 bankruptcy needing help to reorganize their finances. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to, to help educate them, to help make them better when they left than when they came in. I wanted to make a difference in their life so that they could make wise choices outside of bankruptcy to have a fresh start, to start over and have a great uh, life after bankruptcy, because you can do that if you make wise choices. So we developed what was a debtor education program to speak with debtors uh, and teach them these concepts that I developed back then are still the same concepts we use today in our, in our teaching. And I wanted to make a difference. Well, it wasn't long after that that as I was doing that, I was seeing differences made, uh, but uh, you know, God laid on my heart that I could make a difference in, in, to be proactive. And that is, hey, if you could teach these concepts to young people, the same concepts that your uncle taught you. If you can teach these concepts to young people today, they can avoid ever seeing you later in the future to make these wise choices. So uh, we, we started uh, in Alabama what was called the CARE program. It's uh, credit abuse resistance education. And I began to throw out there that I was available to come and speak at schools, your senior high classes, uh, colleges, the freshman year. Uh, to go out because I saw some things as trustee. I, I saw a young lady at the University of Alabama, a freshman at the University of Alabama, had to file bankruptcy here because she had written 35 bad checks. And her answer was, I, I thought as long as I had checks, I had money in my account. Now that was a freshman at the University of Alabama back in 1997. That far, that launched me into, hey, that we don't have a really good uh, core system of, of, of educating people about finances and what's going on. So during this care program, I began to go out and speak. Well, quite frankly, it wasn't well received because people didn't invite me to come speak. I, I don't know what it was. But guess what? You know, I, I believe in this. You find someone that's as passionate about something as you're passionate about it, you have opportunity. That passion will breed opportunity. So I found a, a teacher at Central High School. Central? Everybody here in Central, right? Found a teacher at Central High School named David Truett. I don't know if y'all remember Mr. Truett or not. Mr. Truett was valuable to me because what he saw was the value in what I was talking about for his students. And he got me to come to his class and, and speak. The first class I spoke with Mr. Truett, I went in there with, uh, you know, just eyes of, of, how, of grandeur how it was going to be. 
Boy, that class, they put me over, wrote me over the coals, asked me the toughest questions I'd ever been asked. No debtor had asked me the tough question like that. I realized right where we were with our, with our education system. The first young lady said, Mr. Cottingham, I understand what you're saying, but what can I do about my credit? I said, your credit? She said, yes, I'm 18 years old, and I got my credit shot. I said, well, what did you do? She said, I didn't do anything. My mother got my social security number, and she ruined my credit. I realized then I had to do a better job of getting in as many schools as I could to start teaching because there was a gap in our financial wellness, and it started at home. My question to you today is, where is the gap in your institution, and what are you doing about it? I'm here today to, to speak to you, and I'm, I'm going to make it uh, as, as fun as possible because it's fun when you do these things because what I'm going to do is what Uncle Bud did for me. He took his experiences, and Matt Freeman back there, he's going to enjoy this. My Uncle Bud was a, had a sixth-grade education, but he was the wisest man I ever met. He was a welder. He made more money than anybody that graduated high school in his graduating class doing being a welder. But he was more wise beyond his years because of the experiences that he had. And I'm not knocking education. You know, I got, a, I got a JD degree from the University of Alabama. I've sat under some of the best teachers since that time. But I tell you, none gave me, poured into my life any more valuable information than my Uncle Bud did. I'm going to give you the same type of opportunities today to do the same for your students and your families. This is good for, for, for I, I speak at churches, I speak at uh, businesses, I speak at retirement centers, I speak everywhere I can because these concepts translate across the board. You'll never go wrong by putting these into place. So the first choices we make today will follow you for the rest of your life. Second thing Uncle Bud told me was this. He said, David, it takes a lifetime to build your reputation, but it only takes 15 seconds to lose it. It takes a lifetime to build your reputation, but only 15 seconds to lose it. We got, we got kids today starting off behind the curve because of what their parents have done to them. Like that young lady that Central that shared with me that day. I was able to help her. After taking my class, I gave out my email address to those, and I get people to email me back and tell me how you're doing. I, I, I want to know what's going on with you. I get emails all the time telling me things that I've taught them and made a difference in their life. So this is something that's important, folks, that's lacking in our, in our community today that we need to do. When our, when our mental health workers were talking about coming together for mental health, you know, one of the most stressful things in a family today is the finances. And it stresses so much. On, and you think the kids don't know it? The kids know it, folks. And it stresses them out, and it, it affects everything about them. So remember, the choices that we make are so important. The third thing my Uncle Bud told me to do was this. He said you have to prepare and plan for your choices today that you'll have to make in the future. And what he's went on to explain to me about this, if you wait till you're caught in that situation, you'll make an emotional quick decision that'll be an unwise decision. David, you gotta think about today and plan for it today so that you can plan out what your answer is gonna be when that happens. Now he did that across my whole life, you know. He went through every scenario and today my wife will complain. She'll say, you're so deliberate. Uh, you should even say, you're so morbid in your thinking. Oh, no, I'm just planning for all my contingencies out there. I want to know what's going to happen because I don't want to have to, be, when, some, when somebody back me into the corner, I don't want to make an emotional decision that's going to be wrong. I want to make a well-thought-out, planned decision so I know. Well, in our finances, the same way. Every one of you, when I get to some of these concepts, you're going to start laughing. You're going to say, I was, I'm right there with you, David. I made those choices. We've all made choices that are unwise because there were emotions, and because of our because of our quick decisions. So I want you to make sure that you put in the work. Let me ask, let me tell you this next thing that, that Uncle Bud said, and I, and I think it's ran across everybody that said this morning said the same similar thing. Everybody wants to have a good financial wellness, but everybody doesn't want to put in the work that it takes to have it. That's just where we are in America today. We're what we call a what I call a microwave society. We want what we want, we want it now. And guess what? And when I get to the end of this, I'll tell you about it. But there's, there's, there's institutions that will enable you to do just that without ever thinking about the consequences. Don't think about that interest rate that Mr. Freeman talked about. Don't think about all those things. They'll enable you to do it. But you'll be in a worse shape than you, are, you could ever possibly be financially. So remember that. Everybody wants, a good, wants financial wellness, but everybody doesn't want to put in the work it takes to invest and, do it, and to, to do that. So here I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you five concepts Five concepts that I promise you, if you understand them, it'll help you make wise decisions on your finances from here on out. First concept is make a plan. Make a plan. 
You got to have a plan. You got to have it written down. It can't be in your head. You need to write it down and make, make this plan up. Uncle Bud told me one time, and I, I, I never forgot it. He said, no one ever plans to fail, David. They just fail to plan. No one ever plans to fail. No one set out to be a, have a poor finances. No one ever did that, right? They just didn't have a plan to get them where they wanted to go. That plan that I'm talking about, it's, all, it's just going to be a vessel to get you to the true financial future in your life. You got to have a plan, and you got to make that plan known to you, and you got to write it down. Now, we call it a budget sometimes. Thanks to Jackie Johnson and others that work in the financial wellness department at, at Alabama One, they got tools for that. They got a budget tool that help you plan for a budget. But that tool is only good if you use it. It's no good if you read about it, think about it, say how great a plan, how great it is if you don't use it. Take it and write it down and put it, make it particular to your situation. So the number one thing is to have a written plan for your finances. Number two thing is you need to do right off the top when you're making this plan. You can budget with your money coming in and budget with your money going out. But if you don't get this concept down early on, it will wreck your finances for, for the rest of your future. The second concept is once you have that plan and you have a structure to work within, you got to identify the difference between wants and needs. The difference between wants and needs. Right now is a major problem in our society today of our wants and needs. And if you don't, you don't have to go very far to understand it. I can tell you life experiences of myself. I can tell you life experiences of my children. Uh, let me just give you an example. My child, my son, Jonathan, used to come to me and he'd say, Dad, Dad. I said, what is it, son? I, I, I need that new PlayStation game. Oh, he was excited about it. I need it. I said, no, you don't need it. You want it. No, I need it. No, son, you don't need it. You want it. No, I need it, Dad. No, you want it. It's a different, son. You don't have to have it. You want it. And it's okay to have those wants, son. But what we got to do is we got to put it in perspective for you to be able to work toward to get it. So let's cut it down and set up a plan for you to save in order to go out and get that, that game that you want. Nothing wrong with that. But let's make sure that your needs are met first. And that's the next step. Once you identify your wants and needs, you got to make sure that your needs are met first. Now, is that what everybody's doing today in America? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. You know that. Some people are doing is go out and do what they want to do, and then they're scraping around trying to make the needs get met. All right? So when you write down your financial plan, I, I encourage you to, to kind of pour this into your students. Make sure they know to, to decide what their wants and needs are. Well, you know what our, want, what our needs are, right? It's basic needs of food, clothing, and shelter. When you get out and get your first job, you've got to have food, clothing, and shelter. And then you've got to add to that transportation, other things such as uh, whatever else you need is particular to you. So identify what your needs are and write them down on a piece of paper. Write them down on a piece of paper so you can make it and visualize it. These are my needs. This is what I gotta be, this is what I gotta meet. So then don't forget about your wants. Your wants are important. It's important to your mental health to be able to have a goal or work, something you're gonna work toward. And that what that want is gonna become your goal in our, in our third step. So that want's gotta be written down on a piece of paper as well. All right? So you've got a piece of paper before you, it's got your needs and your wants on it. When the money comes into your household, getting it down just where the bare minimum understanding here for anybody to understand this when you get that money and I think they do a great job when they go out to schools to show you these little tests these little examples of when you get your money when you get your money the first thing you need to do is to pay your needs first save for your wants pay your needs first save for your wants seems so simple right but how come everybody isn't doing it because it's not what we want to do you know we want what we want we want it now I promise you, every child today that graduates high school, they want everything their parents have now, and they want it now. They don't want to invest the 30 years it took for their parents to get what they had. All right? They want it now. And I'm telling you, there will be companies out there that will enable them to do that, but they'll never realize the price they're paying to do that until it's too late, and they have to come see me. So make your plan, decide your wants and your needs, and the third thing is set goals. Set goals. Write them down. Not just any goals. It's what I determine to be what I call a SMART goal. I'm going to use the SMART as an acronym for you to remember what, a, what this goal. What, when, I, when I say it's a SMART goal, the S stands for specific. The goal you set for yourself needs to be specific. You don't want to say, hey, I want to save a lot of money. Not a lot of money won't ever come. And my, one of the things uh, growing up, 
My Uncle Bubba would say, well, someday, someday some we're going to travel. Someday some we're going to travel. You know, guess what I found out? We talked about traveling a lot. We never went anywhere. We really didn't. We never went anywhere. We stayed home and worked the farm. Well, we didn't go anywhere. We talked about it a lot. How many of y'all ever talked about something a lot in general terms and never did it? All right? Unless you narrow it down to specific goals, you won't ever reach them. Make sure your goal that you're going to set for yourself is specific. It's a smart goal if it's specific. The M stands for measurable. Measurable. It's got to be something you can measure. You've got to understand it. Don't say, I want to save money this week. No, I want to save $10 this week. It's something you can touch and feel and see. I want, you got to measure. It's gotta, you got to have a standard for which to measure your goal. So it's got to be specific. It's got to be measurable. The third A stands for attainable. Don't ever encourage someone to set a goal they can't reach. You know that? You don't do that. Every goal needs to be an attainable goal. You can't go in, for example, me, I, I've always been overweight. One time I was 323 pounds, huge, you know, huge. It was hard for me to say I needed to lose 100 pounds. I eventually did, but if my goal to lose 100 pounds, guess what? You know when people set a goal to lose 100 pounds? They usually quit because they can't reach that 100 pounds. But, man, you can reach a one pound. Man, after I fetched my first pound, you, you can reach that. Guess what happens? A New England Journal of Medicine study says that once you set a goal and once you check that goal off, magically something happens in your brain. Endorphins are released because you have been successful. So when you set a goal that you can reach and it's attainable, you check it off. Man, I saved $10 this week. You see it. It's measurable. You got it in front of you. You check it off. Well, does that make you want to quit? No, it makes you motivate you to want to do it next week. How much can I save next week? Same thing that Matt Freeman did when he talked to that, uh, talked to that guy in his class. He came back because he couldn't sleep all night because he was motivated. He was motivated to see, see those goals happen in his life. So you, once you can attain, when you see someone else's attain goals and once you re attain a goal, it will make you want to continue to do that in your life. The R stands for relevant. The goal you set for yourself has to be relevant, and listen closely, to you in your time and space. So this thing can change, right? Depending on where you are, this can change. Quick, bizarre example. You set a goal, you live in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Your goal is, above all things, you go and you sit down with Bill Wells, and you say, I want to I save money. I want to I save money to buy me a snowmobile. Living in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, that may not be relevant to you today. Right? Spend money on a snowmobile. Hopefully Bill would say, well, I don't have a chance. You're going to have a chance to use that. That's what I want to do. I want to set my goal to buy a snowmobile. Look, I use that as an outlandish example so you understand it. But every one of you in this world, in this room, has bought your share of snowmobiles. It just wasn't a snowmobile. It was something that wasn't relevant to you in time and space. If it wasn't true, you wouldn't have all that exercise equipment at home with your clothes hanging on it instead of you jumping on it. That's what I'm talking about, right? It wasn't relevant to you, but you bought it anyway, and you wasted money on it. But wait, let me change this. I go to Bill, and I say, Bill, I'm moving in two years to, Ar to Alaska. I got a job on a pipeline. I want to save money to buy a snowmobile. What's Bill say? Fantastic. We'll get you a plan together so you can buy that money, set that goal to buy your snowmobile, because you're going to have to have it where you go out there. right? It's relevant to you. So just because it's not relevant to you today doesn't mean it won't be relevant to you later. So don't take anything off of your wants list that's not relevant today. Leave it on your list to see if it becomes relevant to you at some point in time. But you've got to have enough understanding about what you're doing and setting your goal that you can say, hey, it's not relevant for me today, so I'm not going to spend my money toward it today. So the goal has got to be specific, attainable, relevant, and then finally the T just stands for time-related. If you leave it open-ended, you'll never reach it. You'll never, have a, you'll never have a deadline. Set a deadline that I'm going to save $10 a week I'm going to save $10 a week for six weeks, and we'll see where I am at the end of that six weeks. And then I'll adjust it to change it to, to increase it. But make sure your goal you set for yourself is time-related. So make a plan, determine your wants and needs, and set your goals. Now, what you do is look at that wants list. You set your goals, and you know they're smart. Anything on that wants list that doesn't, doesn't match whether it's a smart goal, don't, don't, don't set it. Move it off your wants list. If it doesn't meet the specific, uh, measurable, attainable, relevant, time-related, you don't want money spending in those areas because you'll waste your money. All right, fourth thing. 
Fourth thing, here's the biggie, folks. If I can get everybody to listen and lean in and teach this one concept to every person you come in contact with, this will be the one that saves you down the road. You've got to determine what is your philosophy of money. Now, all philosophy of money is what do you think about money and what do you think money can do for you? That's what philosophy of money is. And here's, here's, here's what you, why you need to understand what your philosophy of money is. Your philosophy of money determines your threshold of spending. Now, let me put it in perspective so you understand. All right, over here on this side of the stage is the richest man in the world, whoever he is there, I don't know. You used, used to say, I tell you, I used to say Bill Gates. I think he's been passed by several people now. But over here is the richest man in the world. Over on that side of the stage is the poorest man in the world, okay? He has everything. He has nothing. Guess what? You are. You know where you are? Every one of us is somewhere on, in between on this spectrum. Okay? Listen close. Teach this valuable lesson. Where you are on this spectrum determines what your philosophy of money is. Okay? I give a $100 bill down here to this man, this man who has everything, he's going to spend it one way. But man, you give a $100 bill to this man down here who has nothing, he's going to spend it differently. The way he thinks about that money is different. And therefore, his threshold of spending is different. I, I encourage everyone in this room, before you can teach this to someone else, is determine what is your threshold of money. What, when is it? And how, it's, it's easy. You got some money in your pocket. You go into a store today. What is the cost that you first start thinking about whether or not you should buy it or not? Is it $20? Is it $50? Is it $100? What is it? That's what you need to determine where it is because when you start spending above that line, you're thinking about it. But man, you're losing money when you start spending below that line because you're never thinking about it. You're never thinking about spending that money. And I, and I promise you, every one of you have done this because you walked into a store and you bought something. You said, well, it's just $10. That's just $9.99. It's just $5. You know, when you say just in front of something, you know what you're doing? You're justifying why it's okay to spend that money on that thing. That's what you're doing. And you never think about it. And, I, and that's, that's where I get all these emails back to these students. They say, well, I never thought about spending that $10 until now. You said, now I don't want to spend it at all. I said, well, good. I'm helping you out. I think about it because people making people aware of spending is so important. If you don't, you'll be, you'll, you'll be in a worse uh, shape financially if you don't know what your threshold of spending is. Finally, finally is, the last thing fine is, uh, number five is, be alert to things that will get you off track of your plan. I call these pitfalls, sinkholes, disruptions, destructive things. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step on some toes. I know my pastor there has a degree in marketing, so I'm going to step on some toes here, right? Advertising and sales techniques is the number one thing that will get you off your plan. You can't go anywhere. You leave this room today. You can't go anywhere within five minutes without having some kind of advertising media touch your senses to try to get you. Here's my definition of advertising. Y'all listen carefully. It's the David Cunningham definition. I don't get it in any dictionary. All advertising is is a big-name company with a whole lot of money paying a big-name entertainment or sports figure with a whole lot of money to get you to take your hard-earned money out of your pocket and put it in their hand. That's what advertising is. Uh, is that right? Am I right? Of course I'm right about that. Everybody knows what they're trying to do. They're trying to get your money. Everywhere you go, they're trying to get your money. Advertising and sales techniques will get you. Case in point, myself. I've always played basketball. I love playing basketball, right? My favorite player growing up, Michael Jordan. How many love Michael Jordan, right? I love Michael Jordan. Oh, I saw that commercial. You can, I can be like Mike. Oh, man, I saw it. $150 for a pair of the Mikey Air Jordan shoes. I had a good pair of shoes. Now, don't forget about it. I had a good pair of Converse shoes. No, you know them old Converse and shoes? $29 shoes. I could be like Mike. I saw the commercial. I saved my money, my farming money, my hard work money, my grass cutting money. I saved it all. Got my hand full of a, and you're talking about in the 80s, $150 is a lot of money to pay for a pair of shoes. Well, I wish I had them today. They'd be worth some money, wouldn't they? I went and bought those Nike Air Jordan shoes. Now, I know it's going to come to shock to y'all. I went out and played my first game in my Nike Air Jordan shoes. I was excited. Laced them up tight. Went out there and played. Guess what? I did not play like Michael Jordan. 
I didn't jump any higher, I didn't shoot any better, and I showed sure didn't slam dunk a basketball. But I think that's the first I could be like Mike. I couldn't be like Mike if I wore a pair of thousand dollar shoes. I played the same way I played in my $29 Converse. There wasn't nothing wrong with it, it was sitting in my closet back at home. I learned a valuable lesson that day. Advertising and sales techniques will get you off your plan. That's why every one of us fall. Don't, don't just laugh at me. Laugh at yourself. Everybody's fell for that. Everybody's fell for those things, right? Number two thing, get you off your plan. Impulse buying. Impulse buying. Everybody in here has bought something that you thought you couldn't live without and got it home, and now you don't use it anymore. If you've done that, raise your hand. Everybody in here has been a victim of impulse buying. If you've done that. Look, there are stores that, have, that, uh, that are set up for impulse buying. Number one store is grocery store. Set up for impulse buying. Walmart set up for impulse buying. Marketing marketing geniuses set up Walmart in a certain way. Had a, I had a privilege to know a man who was a, 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 a manager at Walmart. He gave me the book, pocket the book, the Bible of Walmart set up. It tells you exactly how to set the store up to get people to buy things impulsively. How many of y'all ever been to Walmart on a day it rained? What's at the front door? Umbrellas. They ain't there today. It's not raining. They're back in the umbrella place. Why? It's setting up for you to impulsively buy. Every Walmart store is set up to funnel you to the, to the men to the left and the women to the right. You're trying to separate the couple in the store, but they had to walk past everything to get by each other. How many of y'all look at y'all's wives in Walmart? <laughs> it's working. It's working. Walk past everybody in the store. Now, how many of y'all ever went to Walmart for a pack of AA batteries and come out with a list about, with a receipt about that long? How many of y'all been walking back to your car looking, oh my God, how did I get that? Impulse buying got you that. Impulse, every store is set up. Grocery store is set up. You can't go in the grocery store and stop at the front door and buy your milk and bread. You got to go past everything else in the store to get to it. You go to a cereal aisle in a grocery store, cereal aisle. Every cereal aisle has got the fun cereal at buggy height so the kids can see. You want that brand, you got to go up top and get the brand place. I'm telling you something that they don't want you to know. Every store is set up to get your money out of your pocket. Impulse buying to get you off your plan. Just like that. Just like that. The next thing to get you off your plan is predatory lenders. That's what I was talking about before. There are some lenders out there, not Alabama One. Alabama One does a great job of what they do. But the, the chief executive officer of Alabama One will be the first one to tell you there are people in his industry that are predatory lenders that have enabled people to go buy things today that they shouldn't have no business buying. Interest rates so high, and they'll get so much trouble, and I see them later surrendering that car in bankruptcy. Now, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, just talk, I'm just telling the truth, folks. I'm trying to get it real to you today. I got people coming through bankruptcy today that's got $70,000 pickup truck, pulling an $80,000 bass boat, living with their mama up in Samantha in our trailer. I'm not, I'm not lying. That person's never been told. Why would they, they've never been told how to, how to do that, what to buy, when to buy. That's what I'm saying. You've got you to you invest in the people today. So they ever don't come see me. Last thing, let me charge you with this. I know it's about time's up, right? About three minutes. Let me charge you with this. As Paul was writing to the young pastor, Timothy, he was sharing, like my Uncle Bud, to me, he was filling the gap. You know what? Timothy, Paul talks about Timothy's grandmother and his mother. He never talks about Timothy's father. Paul was standing in the gap for young Timothy. He was going to be a great pastor. He wasn't there yet, so he was standing in the gap for him. He said, Timothy, I'm pouring into you today so you can go and pour into faithful men who are doing go likewise, do likewise. And what I'm doing is this. Why am I passionate about this? I want to pour into you today so that you will go and pour into somebody else so they can go and do likewise. I want you to pour into your students, your employees, your family. But here's my point. Here's the point I want you to make. I want you to hear me. I'm being as honest as I can. You can't pour into someone else something that you don't already have. Most adults today really don't have a financial plan. Don't have, a, have, a, have what I'm telling you today. If you take these concepts and you learn them for yourself, you can take them. I am, I am more than happy to come to your school and speak. I can relate to kids. I can relate to adults. I can, do any, I can, I can speak. But look, when you got them, and they love you, and you're loving on them, and you can relate these concepts to them, you don't have to have a class on it. You can relate it in everyday activities. There are kids coming through your classrooms tomorrow that's got so much trouble with finances. They've never, I'm talking to just like that young lady. 
But the mama's already ruined the credit. They're coming through your classes tomorrow. And you can be the one to pour in. So my, my challenge is, three years ago I met a man named Bishop Benton, Kenneth, Kenneth, Kevin, uh, Kenneth Benton. He was speaking at Bridge Building. Man, we became fast friends. After hearing me speak, he, he, he wanted me to pour into him a little more. And so I began to pour in a little more. He's out. He's in Georgia somewhere. We should have been here today. He said this. I, he said, hey, I love your stories about your Uncle Bud. He said, man, you ought to write a book one day. I said, I'm working on a book. When I retire, I'm going to have a book about all the, all the wisdom, wit, wisdom of Uncle Bud. He said, what are you going to call it? I said, I don't have a name for it yet. He said, well, I'll tell you what. I can't wait to read it. And then he said these words. He said, everybody needs an Uncle Bud. I said, well, there's my name for my book I'm going to write. Everybody needs an Uncle Bud. But what he was saying was this. Everybody needs someone that'll close that gap, that'll stand in that gap. Our youth today need someone to stand in that gap financially, to close the gap for financial wellness in our community. My challenge to you is, will you be there, Uncle Bud? Thank you. David, thank you. That was some great information on how to build a bridge. And something that's really important for us to remember is if we don't share it outside of this room, it doesn't go any further. Um, For me personally, some of this stuff I didn't know until I was in my 30s. And I make sure now to to teach my children some of these same things. Um, All right, so for our next giveaway, everybody is eligible for this one. Does everybody have a blue ticket? Not you. (laughs) Everybody that's not from Alabama won because they have a blue ticket. <laughs> All right. Let Kim draw for us. I need to look closer. Okay. All right. Three, three, nine, one, four, three. Yay. All right, if you will meet us at the back, we want to take a picture with the picture. We want to take a picture with the basket. All right, and from here, we're going to dismiss for lunch. I have been told that the left side of the room back here is gluten free, and the right side is not. All right, y'all enjoy.
Hey guys, sorry, I've been asked to keep us on track. So um, my name is Jason Halperin. I am part of the Alabama One team, and I just wanted to, again, thank everybody for being here. The first thing we wanted to do was thank our vendor sponsors again. If you guys have not had the opportunity to go out and see them, please do so. Uh, we have Stillman College, the Tuscaloosa Education Foundation, the Kristen Amerson Youth Foundation, the Boys and Girls Clubs of West Alabama, Tuscaloosa's Angels, Real Estate 101, Tuscaloosa's One Place, Backpack Connections, True Vine Foundation, and the Alabama One Credit Union. If you guys have not been to the Alabama One Credit Union table, there's a, a wheel. If you spin it, there's all kinds of prizes out there, so uh, please go do that. And I just want to tell you guys real quick about a promotion we're running. We don't want to make this about Alabama One, but with all the talk about saving money and financial education today. We are running a very, very good um, loan promotion next Wednesday. We call it our Black Wednesday loan sale. And it is it works very similar to how Walmart runs their loan sales. It starts at 7 a.m. You can apply online and we have car loan rates. Anybody that qualifies for a car loan, you can do a refinance or a purchase at 7 a.m. between 7 and 8, the rate is 1.99%. And so it's really an opportunity for us to give back to the community it's an opportunity really for us to help people. I was actually just talking to someone at a table and we were talking about their credit card debt, just like Mr. Cottingham was talking about. They have high interest credit card debt and they have vehicles that have equity in it. And it's an opportunity to take some debt that's at 18%, put it down at 1.99%. So again, just something we do to help the community. Uh, again, thank you guys for being here. And uh, if you have any questions about that or anything else, let me know, I'll be around. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. And uh, there's a really, really nice basket back at that table. All you do is spin the wheel and you may take that home. So make sure you stop by and see all of our vendors, as he said. At this time, we're going to have Dr. Antonio Cooper, Jr. Uh, join us. He was born in Birmingham, Alabama, after graduating from Winona High School, uh, attended Alcorn State uh, University, HBC, and on full athletic scholarship where he earned uh, a bachelor in elementary education and an MS in guidance and counseling. And you can read the rest of his um, bio there, but I know Dr. Cooper from when he was a uh, principal here at a local school in the county. And I remember him having me come out and speak to the men, uh, the, uh, the Tony Dungy uh, men's ministry and 
So we go way, way back. Uh, he's a lot younger than I am, even though we go way back, right? Y'all, it's okay to laugh at that. Uh, but but uh, he, he has done some awesome things working here uh, in, in our school system as an educator, as a principal, uh, as a leader from the central office. And uh, today he uh, serves as the director of curriculum and instruction uh, for the Vestavia City School System. Uh, and he is going to, how many of you have heard CTE mentioned, you know, numerous times today? And, 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 and that's one of my passions is that our school systems, the bridge that we need to make sure that we're building uh, both ways is a bridge to those who want to go to college and those who want to be workforce ready uh, or ready to go into another skill or a, a different career path that may not require uh, education. And he's going to lead uh, a discussion over that. So if you would help welcome Dr. Antonio Cooper, Jr. afternoon. I hope that I am not the soft elevator music after you've eaten lunch that puts you to sleep. Um, but thank you all for having me, Mr. Houston. Um, that was all pro dads. And we got a legend to speak at a legends uh, function there. So our students were very excited. And our dads, um, that morning, that was our most attended event because they had one from the national championship team come, a member of it. And I think we, we, we filled our gym up, and our gym's capacity is about 680. We had about 700 dads in there. Uh, one of the dads was the fire marshal. He was like, it's fine. <laughs> we're, we're listening to Martin Houston. Everybody's good. Everybody's good. All right, so um, like Mr. Houston said, I, I'll be talking about preparing for a financially sound future. Um, and I want to start, I don't, I don't know everyone that spoke before me, but like I introduced this the last time, I'm an educator, so any opportunity I can to throw some quotes up and bring relevance to it and use it as an educational moment, I will. So Dr. Benjamin Elijah May said, he who starts behind in the great race of life must forever remain behind or run faster than the man in front. And when we're talking about preparing for a financially sound future, we have to realize that and take on that, that mantra as we're working with our youth. We have so many people that are behind by the time that they're an adult based off of parents taking out credit cards and things of their na that nature in their names and just not having a good sound financial background that we have to make sure that we're instilling that in our youth as early as we can from every different facet of raising a child. It's the old statement is it takes a village. So I'm talking about community agencies, uh, schools, of course, and as well as business and industry. And the next quote is, it is easier to build, build strong children than to repair broken men. And I mean, the gentleman before me was talking about all of the people that are in financial crisis and things of that nature. Well, it's hard to get out of that. But it's easier for us if we all pour into our youth at an earlier age so that they don't grow up that way. Growing up in Birmingham, I saw a lot. I saw a whole lot. A lot that um, you're not supposed to see ever in a lifetime, I did. And one thing that I kind of took on myself was I will learn from what I saw instead of experiencing it. And that's a lot of the things that we have to show our students, you know, and, and be able to impart into our youth is you don't have to go through everything to learn lessons. And I think a lot of them have that mixed up and, and a little backwards. So it's easier to build them up when they're younger. So join me in that, in, in that charge. All right, so the importance of financial literacy in school curriculum, uh, I don't have to argue that. I think I'm preaching to the choir on that one. It's, it's extremely important nowadays. And, um, but I got a few facts that I want to share with you. There's a decline in college population. And as you can see up here, colleges have lost 1.5 million students in the past five years. And males make up 71% of that decline. Males make up 71% of that decline. Um, another set of facts is more males are opting out of college. Four in 10 college students are males now, so 40%. I think it was about 60, 60, 40 the other way when I was in school. 
but I mean, it's flipped on his head now. So we have a lot of our males and a lot of students in general that are opting out of college. And so, you know, what does this information have to do with financial literacy and school curriculum? It has a lot to do with it. Because the students aren't going to college as ready and willing like they used to, then they have to learn how to manage their money and make money and be able to live and sustain a healthy lifestyle according to what they want to have in high school, in middle school, in elementary school, at home, in commu at community organizations, at church, in all of those different places. Otherwise, we're just going to continue to have programs around to repair broken men. Um, it has a lot. I said it before I pulled up the slide. I'm sorry. Um, we're just moving on. Another fact in that is the gap year is becoming more and more um, popular in the United States. Okay, you know it originated in other countries, but now it's becoming more and more. It's the cool thing to do. I just want to take a year off from school. A lot of those students don't come back to school. You know, and, and you, you'll see it later on in their lives, in their 30s and 40s, where they want to start going to school to get some skills and things of that nature. When if we put the focus where it should be and really join in as a team and as a family, as a community, to be able to impart knowledge into our students, they can get those same experiences that they're going to wait to their 30s, 40s, and 50s to get while they're in school, while they're outside of school and community organizations, while they're walking around different businesses and industries. How can students learn more about financial literacy and acquire industry and work-related skills in school? Mr. Houston already teed it up. Career and technical education. And one thing I want to say and make sure that you leave here with, if you leave here with nothing else, um, it isn't the same as the Voltec of old. It is not. But a lot of our parents think that. A lot of our parents really want to forego CTE classes in lieu of AP classes, in lieu of advanced honor classes in high school for that highly esteemed GPA. They want to play the race game of being able to have the highest, most heaviestly weighted GPA in school because they feel like that looks good on the college resume. But what we'll have with that is, and they'll skip Bo Tech because their parents don't value it. They think it's what it was when they were in school. And they'll skip it. So I'm going to skip this one and go back. And then they'll turn it to this young lady here. She has a college degree. She's like, now what? And what you'll find is a lot of students that actually skip CTE courses and any of those kinds of opportunities when they're in high school, I mean, they change their majors. I don't even want to ask the question in here how many of you all changed your major while you were in college. I know I did, because I was one of those students that was chasing that weight. I mean, I was a football player. I had a full scholarship to play football at Alcorn State, but I still graduated number two in my school, class over 400, and I value that more than anything else. So I skipped a lot of CTE classes, and I changed my major <laughs> before the fall of my freshman year started. I took some summer classes, and once I took those summer classes and saw the trajectory of what it was that I said I wanted to do, uh, I quickly changed that. So I want to talk about that for a second because it's not in the program, but I do want you to see a lot of the things that are going on. So I went to Winona High School in Birmingham. It was a 6A high school at the time. We had about 800 students in our, in our building, and that was one of the largest schools in Birmingham at the time. They have way more than that now. But I chose a major in pharmacy. Somebody asked me why. I, was just, I did that to make sure you weren't asleep, make <laughs> elevator music. I did that because I was number two in the class. And I felt like that was the answer they wanted me to say. Because it wasn't, what are you going to school to major in? That was, the question was, where are you going to school to major in? Comma, dash, semicolon, colon, whatever you want to call it. Uh, doctor, lawyer, pharmacy. Um, yeah, that was it. Those were the three. Doctor, lawyer, or pharmacist. So I had no, I had no options. So if you're doing that to youth in high school and middle school, stop. Because I could have ruined my life going through and then having to change majors my sophomore, junior, senior year and have to do extra years in college when it wasn't for free. I felt like that's what I needed to say. So when I filled out my paperwork at Alcorn, I put pre-pharmacy. And I saw all those chemistry classes. I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to do that. But I knew in my heart of hearts I wanted to help people. 
And I saw nothing better than getting right on the front lines and being an elementary school teacher because what I did not see growing up was a lot of people that looked like me. And I went to Birmingham City. I mean, it's all black. And I didn't have one black male teacher until I was in eighth grade. And a lot of my friends, just like mine, we didn't have fathers at home. So I went into something that I was passionate about. Um, but please stop doing that if you're doing it, talking to students about what they're going to major in. And if they're number one and they want to go and be an electrician, applaud them at that. Show them the different areas where they can be able to excel in that field and let them continue to go on. I mean, I don't want an electrician that doesn't know how to tie shoes. And I'm sure you don't either. All right, so what is CTE? We're, we're schools are tasked now with preparing students for careers that currently do not exist. And the way we can do that is through career and technical education and doing some innovative things like that are being done in the city and the county here in Tuscaloosa. Um, but we have to do that. The Alabama STEM Council has this new mantra of modern learning for a modern workforce. Well, we have to really work hard to modernize the things that are going on in school. So school should look like something completely different than it did when you all were there. And I'm going to challenge you and put a little pressure over here if it doesn't, make some noise about it. Because your job doesn't look like it did 15 and 20 years ago. Your meeting rooms don't look like that. So schools shouldn't either, if we're really going to prepare the students for the future. So career and technical education, as you can see, a lot of different things come out of that. And students can start taking classes in that field as early as middle school. They can start taking CTE classes as early as middle school. And a lot of them don't know it. Um, as far as the career clusters, there are 16 of them. As you can see them up there on the board, they pretty much lead you into any kind of job that you want in your life, even if the job has a lot to do with college degrees and things of that nature. And a lot of people don't know that. So yeah, we know that we just had welding and small engine. Other than that, <laughs> we had a keyboarding class and we had to have that one to graduate. I took keyboarding and I didn't realize how much I like welding. Until it was over, I could have been a welder. They make a lot more money. I would be at a different conference, but it's a lot of money. <laughs> but yeah, so it's, all of these are the different fields and facets. And I'm sure all of the businesses and nonprofit organizations in here, students can take a CTE course and hop right into your, your uh, venue and be super successful and very helpful. Um, as far as finances are concerned, here are just a few of the financial literacy classes that are offered at pretty much every high school in the state of Alabama. And then high schools have the opportunity, school systems have the opportunity to add a few more courses to their course selection guide for students to take. They can add a, a, a few more principles and standards in their curriculum um, and create the course and give it its own name. And so if you see something within our at finance classes that is not necessarily matching what you all are doing in your, your, your jobs, go meet with the school curriculum directors, meet with the superintendents, talk to them about that so that we can build a better future and prepare our students financially and prepare your next workforce. All right, so Governor Kay Ivey said a few, it was a few weeks ago, um, understanding the skills and credentials that compose the DNA of Alabama's in-demand jobs is key to providing every Alabamian with access to on to an in-demand career pathway. She also said that Alabama is developing skills-based, learner-centered, and employer-driven talent development system that is focused on connecting talent to opportunity. And everything she's talking about is for adults. Everything she's talking about is for adults, preparing adults for jobs that are currently right now in demand to which they have no skills for. They are not qualified to have those jobs, so to, to acquire those jobs. So now they're trying to work to get a not working population into jobs. I know you all seen a lot with the um, unemployment rates and I hope you know how false of a narrative that is because the number is low but that's just the people that are eligible to file for unemployment. So a whole bunch of people out there that aren't working that makes that number look very false. And a lot of those people aren't working because they don't have the skills to get those jobs. A lot of these jobs have prerequisites. But, and I know I said science wasn't my thing, but I highlighted DNA in red, um, deoxyribonucleic acid, 
and, and that's the key thing that all of us have. And our DNA ties us to family members. Our DNA ties us to communities where we come from. Our DNA, DNA ties us to villages and other countries to which we were born. And all doctors have to do is pull that out. So I found it interesting that she said it composes of the, um, the composed DNA of Alabama's in-demand jobs. Well, DNA is different in every community and region, as it is in every individual and family, but the connections are clear. And as I have written up here, not only does business and industry have to match the DNA of the community and the region, school CTE program offerings must do the same. So every one of the communities, Brookwood, if we're talking about the county schools, Brookwood's DNA should be completely and is completely different than Sipsy Valley's. Northridge's DNA is completely different from the DNA in Central. The jobs, the things that are in those areas, so those CTE programs and course offerings and things of that nature and the businesses in those communities and community agencies should recognize that DNA and pour into it. Now, you can continue to expose the students to the world, but a lot of times students don't really leave where they grew up. At. And if we're not preparing them, that's where you get the unemployment. That's where you get the crime. That's where you get all of those things is because the students left high school and they weren't prepared for the world that they live in in that area. And so we, make, we have to make sure that our DNA matches that. Now, I'm not just talking out of the side of my head. Somebody actually gave me a doctorate on that, okay? That's what matters. And I'll have three different areas to be able to talk to you all on. Parents and families, I'm talking about involvement. Business and industry, I'm talking about investment. And community organizations, I'm talking about uh, outreach. So it takes more than the school to determine community needs and student interests. Parents, we need you to provide additional information and background on your children. Um, we, we need you to be invested in the school and the student's education. And we need you to advocate for all of the students, not just your own child. Uh, business and industry that are in here, we need your investment. Equitable exposure of products and programs to all youth. Don't just pick a place and say we're going to invest into this place, maybe this specific uh, demographic. Invest in all of them because you don't know who your next rock star is. And your next rock star may not look like anybody in your building and they can flip it over for you and help you break that ceiling that you keep hitting. Um, we need you to have programs for you starting at the elementary level. We need internships, job shadowing, apprenticeship opportunities, and school mentorship programs from you all. Come in and be honest and vulnerable and say you don't know what to do. To a certain extent, schools don't either, but everyone together in that area, schools don't in that area. Everyone together can, can create a plan that'll be able to make you effective for students. Because a student with a goal will make better decisions than a student that thinks that the world hates them and that the world doesn't have a place for them. And if we can build those goals in students when they're in elementary school, it'll carry them through the hard times in middle school. And it'll also carry them through the hard times in high school. My mom gave me a goal when I was in elementary school. Starting in first grade, all the way to my senior year, she wrote a check and she did not date it to a military academy in Northeast uh, United States and told me if the principal called my house <laughs> or if I got a grade under a, under a B minus, no, under an 85, a B, she was sending me off. And she did not date that check. That was my motivation, but every student doesn't have that. Some of the students need the motivation from school. Some of the students need the motivation from your companies or your community agencies. And parents or community organizations, we need connecting. We need your help in connecting parents and business and industry together and providing counseling services and prevention services to our students. We, we need that help. We need you to be the glue between schools and business and industry in some cases to be able to point us in the right direction and work together. Um, and use your area of work through your circle of influence. I mean, my circle of influence are students. So I wrote a book for students that look like me, that came from areas that are similar to areas that I came from. Now, I'm not saying write a book, but you have a circle of influence, and this is now my new circle of influence, so that's why I put it up there, okay? It can be found on, it can be found on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, my circle of influence, that's what I work in. 
And I'm not asking you all to go outside of that. Go, if you're a financial organization, go into the school and say, hey, we have knowledge in this. Show us how to impart this into your students. And they're not the only ones that need it because educators, we, we, we need a little financial education too. So talk to the schools about how can we help your employees. And don't do it from an avenue of trying to increase your clientele as far as people to come in and be vendors. Just do it out of being good people in the community. Invest that and pay it forward. It'll come back to you faster than that. Um, why? Because perception matters. If your company never comes in, those students are going to have a negative perception of you or they're going to have the perception of their community and their world of your community organization and or, or of your building, of your, of your business or industry. And per perception matters. Perception is reality to the ones that perceive it. So if you never interact with a certain demographic as far as youth is concerned, then that certain demographic is going to develop a perception of you that may not be flattering to your business. And then when those youth grow up to be old and you want to solicit their services or you want to solicit their support of your company, they're not going to come around you because you didn't come around when their brains were still sponge, sponges. So do that to boost that perception, to give them a real narrative of who your organization and who your company is. Um, because otherwise they'll have that limited uh, perception. So this is Roger Bannister and this is President Kennedy. Before Roger Bannister ran a four minute mile, people thought that your heart would literally explode if you tried to do it. They thought that you would die on the track, that it was completely impossible. Your body would physically give out and then he did it. And all of them were like, oh, it's the same thing with what you all, where you all are. You all can partner and be able to help our students out in ways that are not yet fathomable. And once you do it, you'll set the blueprint to be able to be replicated all over this nation. But we can start in Tuscaloosa by going and just being vulnerable, saying, I don't know what to do, but I'm here. These are my hours of availability. This is my staff's hours of availability. And they'll plug you in the right places. And you all can feel your way through that. It doesn't have to be written out perfect. You can perfect it as you go through. Everybody has an issue with that, that, that stigma of perfection. I mean, there's really nothing perfect. And you ought to always see it as something that can get better and better and better. And President Kennedy is saying we, cho we choose to go to the moon. And I don't think we had a rocket powerful enough to, to circumvent the globe one time at the time. And when you're going on that, if you're going to be brave enough, I say watch out for the cave people, the citizens that are virtually against everything. Because you're going to have a bunch of people in your organizations around you that's going to say, why are you going in that school to try to help those kids when you already know those kids aren't going to do anything for you or that family and community doesn't have anything to support your, your mission? Stay away from them. If you have that idea and that initiative to go in there, go in there and do it. And the last piece I have down there is some people don't even know they are cave people. Let them figure it out on their own. It's not for you to convince them of the work that you're doing. If you have it in your heart to do it, go and do it. I have a video about the power of career and technical education. I want to show you a few minutes of this, all right? Example of the mind, how the mind works. Three men were laying brick. The first one was asked, what are you doing? He answered, laying some brick. The second man was asked, what are you working for? He answered, for five lousy dollars an hour. The third man was asked, what are you doing? Same project, same work. He answered, hum, helping to build a great cathedral unto the worship of our God. What do you learn from that? Three men working on the same building, but all three has completely different attitudes. The first one could only see the bricks. The second one could only see how much little he's being paid. The third one saw a finished cathedral with people worshiping. Now, who do you think had the better attitude? Same job, but three completely different people. Only because of their minds. 
power of the mind could make you have a different experience on your job right next to a lousy worker. The future of a job is not in the job. It's in the one who holds the job. Number 10. So powerful information. And that's what our CTE programs can do. We can hook students up with their passion. Things that they don't even know that they're passionate about so that they can see their job as not the next paycheck or not the only thing that's keeping them from not having a house, but instead seeing their job as actually having a true purpose for the greater good of the community. And that's what I want to challenge you all to do as far as your jobs and whatever it is that you do. See how you can create that in our, in our youth. Because they'll be the ones that will take care of us soon. So expose and connect them to their passion by giving them a pathway to accomplish their dreams. Alright, so food for thought. Character is when your words, deeds, and actions are one. If you're teaching, if what you're teaching is not working for you, it shouldn't be taught to others. Lead with your life. Uh, life is made up of customs, rituals, and taboo. So don't just talk about you, you, you are for the community and you're not pouring into the schools or pouring into the youth in some kind of way. Um, and you do that through core values. The difference in the mentality of those people that Dr. Monroe was talking about with just core values in general. I challenge the schools to make sure that they're having focus on core values just like I'm challenging you all to do. Because core values in the school, think of if we can get all of our students to embody these core values. All of our teachers, dependability. <laughs> I know you sub problems. Um, dependability, things of those natures. If we can get our students and our staff to be able to have that, we'll create a better future. In society, so parents, if you can get your children at home um, to embody acceptance, accountability, empathy, and things of that nature, how much better would the world be? In the workplace, there's dependability again, integrity, loyalty, respect, responsibility, all of those things. If we can teach those things to our different avenues and different fields, we'll make this world a better place in our own circles of influence. I'm going to land this plane because he used to play fullback and he can still tackle a little bit. Any questions? All right. Thank you all. That is awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Cooper. At this time, I'm going to ask our uh, panelists uh, to begin to make their way uh, to the stage. Um, We're going to have a, a superintendent slash administrator uh, panel at this time. Sean McDonald, I mean McDaniel, uh, presently serves as the principal and career technical director uh, at Pickens County College and Career Center. And he also teaches biology and microbiology uh, through Bevel State Community College. 15 year uh, plus educator uh, in the Pickens County school system. And uh, he is personally dedicated to assisting the Pickens County School District in providing the best education possible for students in Pickens County. Uh, he also serves as the pastor of Highland Baptist Church in Gordo, Alabama, and is married to his high school sweetheart, April. They have two sons, Noah and Eli, and he loves traveling and serving on various mission trips and running marathons. Ooh. Is that the fun part? <sighs> It was good till you got to that running. But anyway, Dr. Darrier, uh, Mike Darrier, uh, is also one of our panelists. He's superintendent of the Tuscaloosa City Schools, uh, the school system uh, serving over 11,000 plus students uh, here in Tuscaloosa, the city of Tuscaloosa. Prior to becoming superintendent, he served in various roles from a teacher to a principal, uh, to human resource director and assistant superintendent. He graduated from the University of Alabama with a doctorate in educational leadership and earned his National School Superintendent Certification from the American Association of School Administrators in 2019. He serves on various local agencies, serves various local agencies uh, as the Tuscaloosa Education Foundation and junior achievement amongst those organizations. 
Uh, he's married to his incredible wife, uh, Susie, who teaches at the University of Alabama. Uh, they have two sons, uh, Nicholas attends university, and Tyler, who is still in high school. And then last but definitely not least, Dr. Kerry Johnson uh, is superintendent of the Tuscaloosa County School System since June of 2020. Poor thing, what a time to take over <laughs> a new, new, new role in a new community, a new city. But she has 23 years of service in public education and served as a teacher and administrator in various positions in school districts, including Oxford City, Shelby County, and Alabaster, Alabaster City School System. Dr. Johnson has a bachelor's degree from Jacksonville State University, a master's from University of Alabama, Birmingham, and an EDS from University of Montevallo. Dr. Johnson is married to Chris Johnson, and she has three children, Emily, a senior at the University of Alabama, Abby, a freshman at the University, and Will, a senior at Chelsea. This time I'm gonna come over and join you guys. guys so much for I sorry about that thank you so much for agreeing to uh, be a part of this panel uh, education impacts every aspect of our life and we've talked a lot about the various roles and different things uh, that we have facing and challenges and opportunities uh, not problems but challenges and opportunities we have in the educational system and so I'll start off by asking you all uh, that question kind of what have you seen as the most challenging aspect uh, of the last 18 months? And whoever wants to swing for the fence on that one first, uh, take it. Thank Good. you for thank you for having us, and great to see you all. So many familiar faces in here um, who are doing so many great things. So thank you, um, and thank you for engaging us in this dialogue. Look, the last 18 months, um, we all I think hope to never repeat in so many ways. Now, good things came out of it. Um, Dr. Johnson and I were just with the leadership Tuscaloosa, and I, I think I'm going to start answering that question, not as a COVID-related question, but as a professional-related question. Um, I, I look, there are a lot of educators in here, and unfortunately, there are not a lot of educators out there. And for me, and I think for us, the biggest, the largest crisis facing us 18 months in the past, and I think, unfortunately, several years in the future, is the teacher crisis. We do not have enough teachers to fill our classrooms. Dr. Johnson and I both talked this morning about how many teachers we have on alternate certificates. Um, we are putting people in classrooms who don't have any background or training to be in education. Um, we are in a really, really tough spot. We can have the best strategic plan. We can have great resources and great programs. But if we don't have a highly effective teacher in every classroom, we will never meet the mission that we've got for all of our students. So I, I would put out there working to really um, get at that teacher crisis. You know, I heard, uh, actually, I think it was Monday or Tuesday, they said over a half million educators, uh, teachers and administrators have left the system since COVID. 570,000 teachers and educators. And I'll, I'll, I'll say it in, in the words, uh, in the voice of Coach Stallings, uh, it's God of mine, it's not about the Jimmys and Joes. I mean, the X's and O's, it's about the Jimmys and the Joes. And, and that's the reality of it is, if you don't have good Jimmys and Joes, teachers and educators and leaders and parents, I think parents make up that other part of the Jimmys and Joes, it, it's, it's mission critical. Well, and I would also um, add on to that, that mental health is a huge issue for us right now too. And, and it's not just student mental health, but teacher mental health as well. And um, I think, huge part of our teacher mental health is our student mental health. Um, you know, COVID did present some challenges to us as a, as a nation. Um, we've had parents and communities who've had to deal with things that they never had to deal with. And unfortunately that has trickled down into our, our kids. And even the ones that we've had in school the entire time, they've still been dealing with things at home that are not typical things that they should have to be dealing with. And then when we have kids who are stuck at home, for one reason or another, they're they're living that with their parents, that that trauma and stress day in and day out. So um, that has pre presented some big challenges for us this year. Um, kids have come back to school, and a lot of what we've had to do from the beginning of the year is just kind of teach them how to be in school again. 
um, it's it's been um, quite a challenge in in schools, mental health wise, and then. So our, our philosophy on that is we got to meet the mental needs of the mental health needs of the students so that our teachers can do their jobs. Well, one of the things that I would add to that from you know our side of the CTE perspective is that we just like regular classroom teachers, we can't get CTE teachers across our state as well. And, and y'all are very familiar with that. And a lot of that has to go back to what Dr. Cooper elaborated to just a few minutes ago is business and industry are, is paying them so much and, and teaching salaries are not comparable to, to bring them back on. So so that's a real challenge uh, on, the, on the career and technical education side because if career and technical education is going to expand, we've got to have teachers that can get in the classroom and uh, teach. And of course, a lot of those teachers that you hire are coming directly out of business and industry and you're getting the retired guys in uh, who said, you know, like Coach Stallings, when I said do it this way, son, do it this way and and it don't work that way a lot of times in education anymore and so they're having a hard time making to that adjustment without classroom management and skills so that's something we're seeing and dr johnson you you mentioned this but one of our questions that we had posed to you all was uh how have the school districts um and you personally how have you uh, provided that support for the mental health of the the teachers so that they can um, be prepared to work in the classroom? Well, you know, we, we are so thankful for our teachers. Um, the work that they do every day is just, I mean, it's phenomenal. The, the job is, is not the kind of job that, you know, you can ever walk away from. You're, you're always on. And um, our teachers are, and I know from the other school systems as well, I mean, teachers everywhere should just be thanked and commended and it is thank a teacher week so if you have not thanked a teacher yet this week um reach out to them um in an email or a text message and, and tell them thank you but um you know it's hard to meet the mental health needs of adults because we're in the business of meeting the needs of kids so um you know ag again if we feel like if we can meet the needs that the kids have then it keeps the teachers from having to also take on the, that extra burden and hopefully we will in turn meet their needs as well but we have added um, social workers throughout our schools um, we've increased over the past two years last year we had or three years ago um, there were five social workers in the county um, through a partnership with um, the county commission and tuscaloosa one place last year we added five additional social workers so we had ten and this year we've added seven more because we have 17. So all of our, all of our schools are touched by a social worker. Um, and then we also have a partnership with the university. Um, it's called whole, our Whole Child Initiative. And the, the whole purpose of that is to, is to figure out what can we do to build our kids up? How can we meet their needs? Um, so our big challenge for our current challenge is um, what we call warm welcomes. And our goal is to welcome every child in the building every single day, four times by name. And um, I would like, to, you know, I also challenged our principals to challenge their teachers to do the same, you know, amongst themselves, amongst the, the adults. So we're just working a lot on character ed, you know, partnership with the Education Foundation and Hope Academy. So anything that we can do to, to try to meet those social and emotional needs, we're, we're doing it. <laughs> You know, this, everything that Dr. Johnson just talked about, uh, we're fortunate that we've had a team of social workers in our system for quite some time. And, and what I said this morning to this group is I, th I think we're at 13 and they're amazing, powerful folks, but we need double that number to do the work that needs to be done. Um, but they do amazing work. The, and, and we're doing the SEL piece and go back to the teacher retention issue that I talked about earlier and the recruiting issue. And Dr. Johnson said this, but when our students come to us with so many adverse childhood experiences, our teachers can't leave that. They take on that kind of that trauma and that secondary trauma that then plays into their decision to stay in this profession, quite frankly. So we've got to be really attentive to that. One thing our school system is doing that, that we're excited about, and I'm going to use this opportunity to plug it and get some collaboration, um, but we've got a Stillman Heights that we're turning in. It's our alternative school, but we're turning it in also to a center for supporting our families because we recognize that we've got to do this work in partnership with parents our teachers are amazing during the school day in and after school and in summer learning but to accelerate the growth for all students we've got to have parents as partners not in some places but in all cases so at stillman heights we're working to uh, work with agencies some of 
the agencies that are in this room, that if you provide a service for families or individuals in our community, we would like to get you to partner with us at Stillman Heights. You can have an office space, a clinic space, whatever space is needed, so that our families have direct access all in one place. Not replacing the work that's being done by other great agencies here in this community, but adding to it. And there's just not enough of that, right? So we are, are kind of thinking there is we're open to collaborate. If anybody wants to and has works in that space and, and does that, we would love to talk about um, some partnerships in that, in that family service center. So if I'm hearing you correctly, this, this is a city, uh, Tuscaloosa City School project. And if anyone here and or uh, they know of organizations, you're wanting organizations that are working in that family, serving a family, serving our student space, who do they come talk to? I mean, is that reach out to the city, city you board? You said it better than I did. And yes, you heard me correctly. But because we're here, I'm going to ask Tesney Davis to raise her hand. Ms. Davis is a partner with us in putting that together, uh, and she certainly has a direct line to the work that we're doing there. And if you will uh, get your name and number to Jackie Johnson, I'll make sure I give that so that we can make that a resource. Uh, We've got also, you committed, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, did you have anything you want to speak on that? Uh, you know, one of the things you've said, you, you've mentioned family, um, is, is you know, and all of us know, if you go back to the foundation of our nation, part of, part of, the foundation of our nation and education was faith. And then and, and faith was part of community and then community was part of the school. Uh, but, and that's part of why we do what we do here at Bridge Builders Faith, Education and Community. How can the community, how can the churches, how can uh, the community all come together uh, to help uh, you guys do what you do from CTE to uh, administration? Well, um, I actually have a superintendent's advisory um, teacher group, and I met with them virtually yesterday, and, and one of them, your question is perfect timing. One of my, we were talking about our substitute shortage. Um, we have a really hard time getting substitutes, and some of the questions, you know, are, well, can we increase the pay? Well, the pay is pretty comparable across the state. You know, what we pay for subs is pretty comparable for what you get paid for anywhere that you sub. Um, and then people ask, could we, can we pay for fingerprints? Well, the problem is we get people in and they fill out all of the information and then they never show back up to sub again. Or they come in and they are real gung-ho, but they only want to sub for one school. So one of the teachers actually said, hey, have you thought about reaching out to the churches to see if there might be some church people interested in subbing? And I said, that sounds like a great idea. So I'm reaching out to you guys. Um, if anyone is interested in subbing, um, we would love to have you. We really do have a shortage. Um, it is very easy to get all of your stuff done. Um, Dr. Cooper's wife is actually um, our sub person. She's, she's our sub finder in the county school systems, in county school system. But you can go to our website and just there's a link that says you're interested in being a substitute and it tells you exactly what to do. Um, but that's one way churches can support us. Another way, um, we have our neighborhood bridges. Um, program. Connie Coleman is our liaison with the county schools. Um, we have the city schools and the county schools both have a neighborhood bridges program. And basically what that is, is if there is a child in a school who, you know, the teacher recognizes that their shoes are too small, they could go to the counselor and say, hey, Johnny's shoes are really small. And I know that his three brothers before him have worn these shoes and this is all they've got. Then they can go out and create a, a, it's a need it, they just post a need, and then you can uh, basically just take that need. You click on it that you'll fulfill the need. You can buy the shoes on Amazon if you want to and have them shipped to us, and then they are sent to that student anonymously, and the need is taken care of. It's like magic. It, it's the most wonderful program. Um, so there are constantly needs being posted on there. So if you have a Sunday school class or, or any kind of church group where that's something that you would like to do as a group, that's a great, great thing to do. Um, sometimes all our needs are fulfilled. Just keep looking because they'll be coming. We'll, we always have needs out there. And some of them are easy and some of them are harder. Yeah, you know, I'm gonna take that question and answer it with, um, with what you're doing here today. Because when business and faith and family and community intersect, 
and have a dialogue about the role of education and the power of education and the role of me as the parent in that. And then we do something about it because what I believe is that we, we're not, we've got so much opportunity, especially in this community, but I don't know that we're, we're intersecting those, those groups. And then the second part is, I don't know that there's a call to action when we do intersect, but conversations that can happen in this room, because there are businesses in this room, there are schools in this room, there are organizations in this room that support families and support our children, but we've got to really elevate that role of education in our community. And that's not the role of the schools only. The schools can't own all that. They're, our schools, they're, they're so busy doing the work they're doing to educate children and take care of them. And we recognize that we can't do it without our parents being engaged. But what would imagine what it would happen if all of our faith-based groups here in our community really talked about the role of education and the role of a parent in education what would imagine if the business and industry in our community said you know what we're going to give parents release time to engage with the school imagine if the schools began to really listen so okay how do you, how do you want to engage with us but those are the conversations and then hopefully subsequent actions that can begin to really change this go to your question that you first asked at the beginning 18 months one thing we did learn is parents when we engage them we do better when they engage with us, our, their children do better, right? But we can't lose that engagement. We've got it, and that needs to be for all children, not just some children, not just for a particular group of children, but for all students. We need every parent in order to accelerate the growth that we've got to see in our schools. So I would answer that question just from a conceptual level of saying, let's do more of this, but then after this, let's put action plans that really begin to get at that. And of course, uh, Pastor, <laughs> I'll let I'll let you address that, uh, maybe more so from the pastor standpoint side. than well, from the educator standpoint. Also, you one of the things we see in, in you know in Pickens, I mean Pickens County, it's a smaller district system, but the collaboration, people's lives are built around our schools, and that's because everybody's child's involved and everybody's participating in activities, and every child has something to be a part of. But our churches come together and collaborate with our schools and work together in providing assistance in whatever the school requests. And so because of that collaboration, you see uh, there's so many things that work together in our community to build up. And I think that's what we've got to get back to. And we've kind of moved away from that as districts has grown, school sizes have grown, uh, people have kind of taken certain bias in certain directions. But if we come back together and draw that collaboration together, you're going to see a tremendous effort in education because back to what you said, Dr. Deere, when we work together, when parents work with us in the school system and we work with parents, there's such a collaboration that ignites a student to success. And that's what we wanna be able to do and provide, so absolutely. And I'll go ahead and, and do a little commercial. We do have a panel at the end uh, with uh, Jackie uh, and our uh, Johnson and our CEO, Bill Wells. Our next year, we haven't settled on everything, but our theme for next year is faith in action. Uh, it's part of our theme and talking point uh, for next year, and that whole thing is around engaging churches, nonprofits, faith-based parents, community, and our schools, and how we can, can make a difference. So you're, you're right on point with that. That's the next step of, of what we do. As we, we look, into the conversations we've had today. There's been a lot of uh, mentions or deep dives into uh, career tech. And, you know, for me personally, I, I was blessed to go to college because I had a, you know, football scholarship and, and that, that afforded me that opportunity. But a lot of my family members couldn't afford to go to college. Uh, some weren't even uh, would not have qualified to go to college, but they all could have had an opportunity to get a skill set or a trade or a gift. How important, first of all, is us making sure that we have students, you know, college ready for those who want to, but also workforce ready if they choose a different path? And how are we doing that? I'll, I'll take that one if you want. <laughs> um, first of all, let me start off by saying, um, every kid will go to college. It's determined whether it will be a four-year degree, a two-year degree, or one-year skill set. I think a lot of times we make the statement, well, I'm not going to college, I'm going to a trade. Now, when you go to a trade, you're, you're going to college. And one of the things that we've got to do is change the mindset of the people that are in our communities, because just as Dr. Cooper elaborated a minute ago, the word Votech is out. 
that's no longer in existence now. And with the shift in business and industry and the demand for jobs, we've got to make sure that we empower these kids and put them into, into they've got to find their fit. And I listened to, to Mr. Freeman's presentation earlier, and I hope you could connect with him in this room because the story he shared is we see those stories in CTE where children find their, uh, I'll give you an example, computer science kids. Computer science kids are very intellectual and very smart, but socially sometimes they're not, uh, they don't socialize very well. But once they go into there and they begin to write programs, and we all know programs and coding runs, runs this country. Once they do that and they empower themselves and they come out, they gain confidence. And so for us, it's so important that we help find the kids' right pathway. It's not so much necessarily, oh, well, you've got to go four year, you've got to go to, uh, uh, you've got to go be a doctor, you've got to do these things. You've got to find what empowers you and what makes you successful. And that's our job with, with career and technical education now. That's something that we're moving to. And, you know, one of the questions you said, you know, as this shift happens, we're going to see the demand more and more for students in those areas so that they would move forward and, and be successful. And I want to just encourage you to collaborate and help encourage uh, career and technical education because, you know, we have career and technical kids. We, we have kids that get an industrial maintenance degree in applied science. And, and I can elaborate to this because we built a, uh, our, our county passed a, a one cent sales tax and built a $7 million career and technical education facility because we saw that demand for the people that were going to commute in West Alabama into Region 3 and work in your area who work here today but live in a bedroom community and support their schools as well. And so we built that career tech center and uh, because of that, uh, it has changed. But a lot of those kids in those pathways come in and they, they don't just take the CTE courses, they also take academic courses. So when they leave through a pathway, uh, they may have 12, 15, 20 credit hours of academic. So if they do change their mind after they develop the skill set, you've provided that child with success that research proves that where they might have never went to college, they will have some confidence and say, you know what, I can go over there to the, to the University of Alabama and take some classes because I've had some courses already. And so that's what we want to be able to do um, through CTE, and, and that's one of the things that's so important with the shift. I would just add to that a little bit by saying if I was not here for, for Mr. Freeman's presentation, but if you're not sure about career tech after and the value of career tech after hearing Matt speak, um, we certainly invite you to TCTA to take a tour of it. Um, you can see that our school system puts a great value in that. Mr. Lucas, one of our board members is here and he's an early, an early trailblazer for the role of, of career tech in our community. And TCTA is, is a product of that. Um, but I, I very much wanna underscore what, what was just said here. In a previous presentation, I actually took the picture from a young lady from Central High School graduating with both a Central High School diploma, but then also a Shelton State Associates, right? And I show that for a reason because high schools, school K-12 schools, we have to adopt the responsibility of success after high school. And what's really important that was just said here is it's not so binary. It's not a choice of career tech or college, but what we've got to make sure we do in our, in our business, in, in the K-12 business, is that we give the choice. Every student should have the choice to do the four year, the two year, or the one year, but there must be education post high school. The, it, it, we can't just go get our kids going into jobs. We've got to get them going in and prepared for careers. And that requires post high school education, certification, education. So for us, it is so important as a community and as a school system to make sure each and every student can make that choice after high school for two year, four year, or a credentialing. But education after high school is essential. Well, and for us, um, one of the, the things that we have recognized is that we have to increase our career tech offerings um, because we have, we have two career tech centers, um, one's at Brookwood and one's at um, County High, and they're both wonderful, but they both share students from other schools. So um, we have welding at the career tech center in Northport is a great example. We have students coming from Zipsy Valley and Northside and County High all for that one welding program. We're turning students away every year for welding. We don't want to turn students away. So we are expanding our welding program to Sipsy Valley High School. So they will no longer be traveling back and forth to County High, which opens up more spots for the County High Northside kids. And um, we're also um, adding a career tech annex at Hillcrest and much for the same reason. We just want to make sure that all of our students have all of the opportunities that they need to be able to be successful in these careers after high school.
but I'm going to add to that just a little bit, kind of the role of the community, right? Because I, I think Dr. Johnson's spot on. This community, the, the Home Builders Association, as an example, came to us a couple years ago and said, we need plumbers. We do not have enough plumbers in our community. We need more plumbers. And we said, well, how can we help you? TCTA for us is that is that answer, but we didn't have the resources. Home Builder Association came together and said, we're going to help you get this thing off the ground financially. They gave us a plumber instructor. It took off. Now we offer plumbing. They other group is saying now we need HVAC. We just got to find a way to get there. We've got to meet the demand of our business industry in here in town, because when we meet the demand of business and industry, we win. Our students win, right? Because they go into these high paying careers. Um, another example is uh, Skills Trade Academy of West Alabama. We, we give them an entire portion of our building to run an apprentice program after hours. They said they can take our students, possibly before graduation, but certainly after graduation, put them into a program and have them in industry immediately. That's a win for us. So it, it goes back to that community collaboration and action. How can we communicate, how can we collaborate as a community to make these things happen? We should not have to turn a child away from, from welding or from any other area of interest. Yeah, and I'm probably gonna show my age here, uh, but uh, you said something about choices and I remember, remember in high school, I took computer science and typing. Now, one of the reasons I took typing because all the girls took typing, uh, but uh, <laughs> just being honest. Uh, but, but little did I know, think, think about what we're talking about, building a bridge to the future of education. When I took typing and uh, computer science, we weren't, we didn't have laptops everywhere and, 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 and typing was a, a, a critical part. As you look into the future of education, what do you see is like, like and I, I know I'm asking you to be prophetic here and maybe the pastor has an advantage here, but, uh, <laughs> but no, seriously, you, 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 you have to be having these conversations because the gap that was created by COVID was, was, was real but you were already facing some, some challenges with the speed in which, I mean, things are changing at a lightning speed and you guys are the ones that's responsible for <laughs> educating our kids to be able to be ready to take that. So what do you see as the biggest challenges? I was just, it's not really a challenge, but um, you know, I'm lucky enough to be part of the education, Educators Workforce Academy. Um, and I, we've got someone else in here too, probably more that I just can't see, but. Um, we heard from business and industry la just last week, it's not even really like skills, like putting your hands on things and being able to do things that these industries are looking for right now. I mean, we heard it over and over and over again. They want the same things you want in employees. They want someone who can, who will come to work every day, who will come to work on time every day, and who can pass a drug test. I mean, it sounds very simple. And then they, they said, we can teach them whatever they need to know. If they come willing, if they come, they come willing, they come on time, then we can teach them. So um, it's those soft skills that we have to teach across all of our career tech programs. On top of the skills that they're learning, the soft skills really seem to be the more important things right now than the actual hands-on skills. We, uh, you know, we have something in the state called a simulated workplace. Uh, many of you may or may not be familiar with it, simulated workplace for the state of Alabama. And that's something that's been implemented and funded into all of our career tech centers now. But that's the most difficult thing to implement. Be on time, attendance, because you can't be an employee, you're not gonna be employed if you're not on time, and we all know that. Those are the hardest things in our school system. It's not to teach the skill. Once we get somebody that can teach the skill, we can do that. But teaching them to show up on time, attendance, because I think that's a real issue since COVID because 18 months kids have had the ability to Zoom and be on their phone, be home, no structure, no time. And so when you're trying to bring them back into a CTE setting or even to a general school setting and teach them function, uh, to be able to function, then of course we fight the mental health problems that we're fighting. Same thing on the CTE side. Uh, they're just not ready and motivated. And so uh, what is that going to hold for us in the future? The challenges are going to be great. Dr. Darren. Yeah, so I was at the West Alabama, the um, talent conference yesterday, and somebody quoted this, and I'll get the number wrong, but he said, of all the resumes on Indeed, like 60% of them are requesting uh, virtual at-home work, and they don't want to work in the, in the physical place. That's a scary thing to be competing with at this point with a, a not with our workforce that says, I'd rather work from home, right? 
But here, I'm going to answer your question on this part of the future of education. So, and I, there are people in here who know more about this than I do, but you know, we have Camgen here in town, okay? Camgen joined, um, came into Tusk about two years ago, and I sat down at the river market when the, the president came to introduce. And I don't even know what Camgen is, okay? So I sat there and I said, oh, the guy's gonna explain it clearly. Well, he starts explaining what Camgen does. I didn't understand what he was saying. It's all artificial intelligence. And I kid you not, I had this sinking feeling, because as he's talking about what his company is doing, in artificial intelligence, I start sinking in my chair going, we're not preparing our kids for that. And I still think we're far away from the future that we don't know yet. We're still in many ways just trying to catch up. But yet this, this is moving faster than our, our systems are, are, are doing. So I think we've got to really plan for this thing that we don't know yet. And the Camgen coming to Tuscaloosa I think is fabulous, but there's a whole lot we're not, for which we're not preparing our students. And so thus, the reason we do things like this is to start the dialogue. And as you said, there's a gap. And what do you do? Everybody tell me, what do you do if you want to close a gap? Build a bridge. That's what I'm talking about. All right. I want to go ahead. add no, go one ahead. thing to that. You know, <laughs> virtual, and we talk about CTE, CTE, a lot of CTE is hands on. Matt, uh, Matt uh, have y'all got any virtual welding bridges going on? Anybody drove? Anybody drive over any virtual wells come to work today? I don't think it's going to happen. And so CTE has to be hands on. So we're limited. I mean, and, we can't just back up. And to Dr. Darius, I was at that same thing. I think he said ninety percent of the jobs were were right. in in sixty percent right. of the applicants wanted it at home, but ninety percent of the jobs were show up in in uh in person so uh absolutely amazing the challenge that we we have and i would say two things based on what you all just said we i think it's bill uh, our ceo's dad was a basketball coach and i think he told bill and i still believe this what has won will always win and if we educate our kids but we don't teach them the character side of what you just said we're gonna be in trouble. And I will commend Dr. Darrier for our Character of Champions initiative that we do. Uh, uh, I highlight Scotty Hollins who runs that program every Wednesday. And, and that's mostly in our athletes. We need to expand that even more in, into our schools, but we highlight a certain character every week and, and they teach that in the school system. So while we're doing show up and all that, we have to find out that bridge and build and it's going to probably be multiple bridges uh, that we we see that we don't have much time left so i want to kind of give you uh, the freedom to kind of express what do you think your most important role uh, or responsibility is in your current role and what would you say to to get us engaged you know uh, i know we've had the 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 COVID infusion of engagement but post COVID, post mass post uh, social distance, post all of those things that are politically charged, post that, what and how do we uh, get involved and help you accomplish what you believe your greatest mission is? I'll start with you, uh, Dr. Johnson. Well, I believe as an educator that our, our number one job is for our kids to have something to do when they graduate school. No matter what that piece of paper says that they're certified in or what diploma they have or what their GPA is, if they are not prepared to go do whatever is in their, what's the, whatever their next step is, then we have not done our job. And I mean, I think it's pretty simple. That's our, our number one job is to make sure our kids are prepared for when they leave us. Um, so that's what we are always working towards in Tuscaloosa County. You know, our tagline is learn, grow and achieve. But if they're not, if they're not prepared when they leave us, then we've lost our opportunity and we failed. And I hate to see our dropout numbers. Um, to me, one dropout is too many. So that's something that we are working really hard on. We're, we're working on changing um, how we help our kids before they get too far behind so that we don't have as many dropouts. And the best thing that you guys can do to help us is just, just support us. Um, offer your services, volunteer. Um, if you know someone who wants to be a substitute, encourage them to substitute. If you have a company that um, you think that we can help you with or that you can help us with, call the principal of the school, call the career tech director, call me, call, you know, just 
be involved. Don't wait on us to come to you because we don't know what all your skill sets are. Um, you know, we don't, there are so many things available to our kids that there's no way we can know what they are, but you know what you do. So tell us, you know, give us those, um, give us that information so that we can partner with you to help our kids as they move forward. We want to produce the best employees and the best citizens we can. So anything you guys can do to support us, we are open to hearing it. You know, I'll offer much the same. Let, let's collaborate. You know, we've said this for several years now in the school system. Our school system is our doors are open. Our schools belong to the communities we serve. And our school system cannot be successful without our community. And that's the entire community, faith-based community, business community, you name it. But until or unless we're really collaborating at high levels and we really begin to do that collective impact work, we're, we're all aligned on the same pillars. And, and a lot of us already are, Education Foundation and other groups, we've got these four pillars that are important for our community. Let's align our work on those four pillars of literacy, character, career discovery, workforce readiness. When we all get behind those goals, we can do magical and amazing things. But businesses have to be willing to say, okay, I wanna collaborate on that, but we've gotta be able to say, um, here are ways to do that, right? So my answer to your question is let's collaborate. And if we're not all collaborating to lift the entire community through education, um, that's where we need to be. So I, I would say reach out and say, I want to collaborate with you. There's really not anything else for me to add to that because I mean, <laughs> you did a great job of that. One thing that just sticks out in my mind as we collaborate, as you come together and as we work together as partners, one of the most important things that I see is the child itself. Um, you know, every morning, every child don't come from the perfect home. When they get on the bus, their parents drop them off. Um, they, they come from some very difficult situations. And as an educator, that's where our heart's at. Our heart's with taking care of the children and providing every opportunity to. So the more you collaborate, the more we work together as a community uh, to help meet the needs of our students. Because, you know, one of the things our superintendent reminds us all the time is they don't care how much you know till they know how much you care. And so when you care about a student, their life changes. And so as we come together, they see the community cares, they see their educators care, they see we care together, then we bring hope to their life. And that's ultimately what we want to do. We want to put them out and give them hope to give an opportunity and together we can do that. I give you three words, care, collaborate, connect. If we do those three things, we'll see a bridge be built to a future of education that, that we can all uh, be proud of and that's strong enough for us to walk back and forth across. So I thank you all so much for your time. Wish we had more time, but uh, Dr. Darrier, Dr. Johnson and Mr. Uh, Mc uh, Daniels, thank you, thank you. Sean, me too, call him Sean. But thank you all so much. If y'all would give it up for them for their time, thank you. And at, thank you guys so much. Uh, at this time, we actually have a, a couple of uh, giveaways that we need to do for our educators and uh, we wanna welcome the team up um, for that, so. So we have two giveaways. This is for teachers. You should have the gold ticket. Which one are we giving away first? We're going to give away the basket first. All right. Okay, wait, can I your mom? Okay, there you go. All right, this is a basket full of stuff. Office supplies, my favorite. <laughs> Six five six zero zero six. Oh. <laughs> hey, that, Good job, right here. <laughs> All right. Yes. Um, if you would meet us in the back, we'll give you back a picture. All right, and then the last giveaway is for some money. It, this is a, a donation. Oh, well. One hundred and fifty dollar. Uh, room makeover, okay, classroom makeover, so, all right, this is for a teacher, uh, six, five, six, zero, two, nine, yes, Woo! good job, all right, thank you, that's it. All right.
right. Um, at, at this time, I'm going to ask uh, Bill and Jackie to go ahead and make their way to the front and, and kind of give you a little preview of, of next year. You heard me briefly mention it. Um, our nation was founded, um, you know, not necessarily perfectly, but founded upon some principles that um, are, are, are faith-based and faith was such a huge part of education and the community. And so next year, every year, we, we'll, we pick a serve day, uh, a day where we'll go out into the community and, and, and do something. And this year, we're going to take that day uh, to encourage, engage all of us back, starting with our churches. We're going to uh, be reaching out to our churches and, and the faith community and encouraging them to get involved with our nonprofits and with our schools. Uh, and we'll put more flesh on this as we get closer and you'll know more about it. But uh, we're going to rally around bringing some support and resources uh, to those who may need school supplies, clothes supplies, et cetera. Uh, I think was it neighborhood bridge? Is that what it's? Neighborhood bridges, uh, make sure we get your number before you, you leave. If you are here representing an organization and you want to be a part of that, uh, we want to make sure uh, that we have your name and number to reach out to you directly. And we'll also get that name for um, Miss um, Davis. Miss Davis will get uh, that information as well. Uh, but uh, thank you all so much. We'll, like I said, there'll be more details about that uh, to come. But at this time, we're going to have our um, Alabama One panel. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, would you please bring me my folder, sir? Right there. Just grab that sheet on the top, right? Not, not that one, the next one. Nope. In the folder. That one. That's it. Should say Bill and Jackie, right? Does it say it? There we go. Thank you, sir. All right. All right. Well, before we get started, uh, Jackie, how do you think it went? I think it is amazing. I'm so excited. Thank you all. Now that I'm looking out and I can see everybody, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. So I appreciate every everyone that is here supporting and um, I especially thank and appreciate all of the blue shirts that are in the building, all of the Alabama One crew. Thank you guys so much because we did this together. Yes, and, and thank, uh, as Jackie said, thank you to, to the great team members at Alabama One and thank you to all of the uh, organizations, the nonprofits, the speakers, our vendors, uh, and, and you for being a part of this and uh, really, really looking forward to continuing. Um, well, we'll get things started here. Um, you know, we've said it, faith, education, nonprofit, community sectors. Why have, uh, Bill, I'll ask you, and, and Jack, you can come in off of it. Why have you chosen to uh, intentionally invest in these three pillars or sections of the community when most financial institutions uh, don't necessarily put a high priority on that focus? Well, it, it started uh, back early in my career about uh, I was a bank regulator and one of the things that we always would go in and look at how does a financial institution meet the needs of its community and during those time of I guess my career I watched how financial institutions may not have done that so well. And I knew that when we came to Alabama One, we wanted to make sure that we were investing back in our community. And one of the things we always thought about was the educational piece was always key. Faith-based is always how you can make a connection using your nonprofits. And we really kind of, that's where we developed our financial wellness program. Jackie, you have anything on that? I think he covered that. You, if, you get, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, this is the third annual Bridge Builders, and, and every year, you know, we, we, we focus on all of them, but we 
tend to highlight one of those pillars and next year, of course, will be faith. But this year we focused on education. We, we did three luncheons and, and then of course the conference, which was mental health, the learning gap and financial literacy as a part of education. And then of course, br building the bridge to the future. Why uh, did you feel like this was uh, the right topic uh, at, at this time? Well, for me, um, education, I have several friends that are in that in that uh, business or area and just beginning to hear probably late November, December, we started hearing a lot because COVID had already, you know, been impacted and we started hearing a lot of, you know, just, oh my gosh, we can't, you know, we have so many students that are unaccounted for because we were in the virtual setting. Um, or I heard parents saying, when is school going to open back up because I'm not an educator, I can't do this. Um, we heard Miss Ando say earlier, she loves her child, but the whole being at home all day with them and, and all I kept thinking about was, wow, how is that really impacting the parents? How is it really impacting the teachers when they are used to knowing where their students are and they are now unaccounted? And so listening to those things and just thinking about, you know, where are we going to go from this? You know, if, if students are not in school, they're not learning, where are we going to go? So I said, we got to talk about education. So that's how it came out. All right. Um, what has, you know, I mentioned the, the three conferences once again. Um, we had the luncheons, I'm sorry, not conferences, but the three luncheons. One was the learning gap. One was mental health and one was financial literacy. Uh, both of you are welcome to come in on this. What were your biggest takeaways as we've gone through this year and spoke on those different topics or even you can bring in today as well? Uh, the first one I'd say is the mental health issue, which was talked a good bit about today. One of my daughters is a social worker for the uh, Tuscaloosa County Schools, working with Tuscaloosa One Place. And just to see what they have gone through through these past 18 months is quite unusual as far as dealing with, with kids, but then also other teachers. And so I was very happy when the team came back and wanted to speak about mental health because we thought that was gonna be a key issue, not only for the school system, but what we also were uh, facing in our business also too. And for me, I think it was mental health as well. Just kind of listening and, and speaking to some of the educators and hearing the stress um, coming through their voice when I'm speaking to them. Or uh, we did a, um, it was early on um, during COVID and I was asked to do a virtual financial wellness um, session. And I remember it was a teacher um, at Central High School and we got on and we were all excited. And normally she's all chipper and I'm like, hey! And she's like, hi. <laughs> and I'm like, you okay? And she's like, yeah, we just got some more news. We're gonna be virtual for a little while longer, you know, and, and, and I'm not really sure if it's if the if the kids are getting it. And she just kind of needed that moment just to stress, you know, all the stress that was in her life. And so I'm thinking, wow, if the teachers are having a hard time, how what are the children getting? How are the children responding? How are how are they handling the stress of change? And you know, we as adults, we don't even like change. So imagine for a child what they're going through. So for me, it was definitely mental health. Yeah, and we've said mental health, and I would ask you you two the same question. Uh, it's a hot button topic. It's said a lot, but but what does it mean when, to you when you say mental health? We wanna we want it to impact. Uh, mental health, uh, you know, and it could mean so many things, but uh, what do you uh, address? I mean, not how do you address it, but what do you define that as? You know, I, it's almost like through the, uh, through the lens of my daughter is just being there and watching and listening to, I guess, her being a resource uh, to open up, to listen, to help, to provide resources. And that's really what we try to do here is connect nonprofits, the faith-based community, educators now, with different resources. I just don't believe there's a good connection. We use that word out in our community. And that's what we're really trying to do with this, this conference, is to make that connection. Because uh, one of the things I noticed that my daughter did was put together a binder of all the resources in Tuscaloosa. And she takes that binder around. And when there's a need, she goes out and goes to one of these resources. And it was just so neat to me what she was doing 
is something that we could replicate kind of from our side or help the community out. And for me, I think mental health is just really, you know, your mindset, where, where are you? And, and at this time, I don't, I don't know that anybody, I'm, I don't know, maybe they can, but that can say, oh, I'm just perfect. Everything is just great. You know, there's so many changes that, that has happened over the last 18, 20 months. And, and you know, where are we? And, and one of the things that Ms. Spencer said earlier, actually, I don't know, she, I think she said it, but it's also on, on this card. And I wanna say, if you all have not picked this up and read it, it, it's pretty amazing. But one of the things that resonated with me is she said, you know, we need to choose to lead from a place of rest and not over exhaustion. And a lot of times where we are right now, everybody's just going, going, going. And I tell my husband all the time, I don't ever wanna be busy doing nothing. I want it to be on purpose. And, and then, you know, you can find rest in that. But when you're just busy, 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 you're exhausted. And, and what can you really accomplish with an exhausted mind? And so for me, all of that is kind of like my mental health, what, how I would define it. All right. We've heard a lot uh, in regards. By the way, you can. I, I know someone can say they're perfect, but no, I was talking about me. It wouldn't be true, <laughs> but I could say it. <laughs> no, just just trying to help y'all's mental health. Laugh a little bit. <laughs> no, seriously, we've talked about uh, career tech, work ready, education uh, a lot. What are your thoughts uh, as far as this in this arena and? Uh, would you give any suggestions to the leaders, teachers, parents, or students in that area? Well, why don't you tell a little bit about what the career tech they did for us, the project we had, Mr. Freeman did. Well, I, I am a fan of career tech. I am a fan, 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 everybody knows of Mr. Freeman. Um, I would just say that, is it needed? Absolutely. Um, Everyone, as you all know, I, mean, I know I'm talking to the choir, speaking to the choir, but everyone doesn't learn the same way. Everyone doesn't process the same way. You know, I'm a visual learner. You know, they were like, Jackie, what do you think if we put this up here four feet? Now, I don't know what that means. You got to show me, right? And so what I found with Mr. Freeman, um, he did an amazing project. You guys can see it up on the, um, on the screen. But... I purchased them. I'm going to tell the story so they can hear the backstory. So I purchased this bug. I don't know. It's probably been eight or nine. Months what was ago. your budget? Uh, <laughs> my, my budget was, well, originally one of my coworkers, former coworkers wanted to spend like $1,500. Right. And I said, nope, because I'm a cheapskate. I believe that we need to save money and we pinch pennies. And I said, no, 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 I think we're gonna get somebody to give us this bug in kind. Now, everybody in the blue shirts know they hate when I say in kind because I think we're a nonprofit. We need to you know, not spend a lot of money. So long story short, we found this bug, this, this gentleman that sold this to us, it was $1,800. And I was like, nope, can't pay $1,800. Long story short, we got the bug down. He drove it here from north of Fayette, brought it to me for $200. Now, y'all can clap, it's a great thing, right? However, <laughs> the bug does not have an engine <laughs> and it doesn't have a transmission. And so when we got it, uh, we parked it outside at Alabama One in the, in the parking lot. And one day I was getting ready to leave the job and Doug Kilo, who does our security and things, I saw him out by the bug and I said, I drove up, came up by him. I said, what are you doing? He says, who put this piece of crap in our, in our parking lot? I'm getting ready to have it towed. And I was like, please, please, please. I said, that's mine. And he said, Jackie, only you. What are you going to do with it? Now, remember, no, it had no headlights. Uh, it, again, it did not run. And so all I could think was, who could help me get this bug going? You know, not drivable, but who could make it look presentable? And the first person that came to mind was Mr. Freeman. And so I text him and I said, hey, it's Jackie and I got this crazy idea, but I think you and your students can help me. Can I, let me tell you what it is. And he said, get it here, Jackie, and we got you. And so prior to that, we thought we were gonna have our Alabama One team help clean the bug out because it had not been used and it was pretty nasty. And when one of our team members found a dirty syringe 
and some other things in it. And I was like, ah, we better pay somebody to do this. So long story short, we found somebody to clean it out enough to get it to Mr. Freeman. And Mr. Freeman and his guys completely gutted the entire inside of this bug, gutted it out. Um, they put the, the top, which is going to be our drop bin for school supplies. They welded that on there. They did all of this amazing, amazing job. Uh, Fast Signs, who we partner with often, did the wrap for us. And so this, this bug that you guys are seeing, we're going to use it to collect school supplies for all schools that we partner with, which is pretty much everybody, West Alabama, Tuscaloosa City, all around. And so we are displaying this for the first time today. We believe it's the first in Tuscaloosa. We're excited to say that. Um, and we're just going to ask that you all keep in mind about this share bug, and we call it the share bug because we are going to share school supplies. We're, we're partnering with Backpack Connections and anyone else who wants to partner with us but we want to collect school supplies year round so that you teachers, you, know, you all don't have to worry about, you know, when little Johnny comes back in January and there's not enough glue sticks or there's not enough, you know, whatever is needed, scissors or what have you, we want to be that resource for you all. So just saying all of that to say that we would not have gotten this far without Mr. Freeman and his students Amazing job. We thank you. You guys need to give a hand clap for the for them. There go. Awesome, awesome, awesome job. And um, we're excited. Very, very excited. But CTE is needed. They they loved it. They they pulled out stuff and they said, hey, we can make money off of the, the seats. We can make money off of this subwoofer they found. And I said, whatever you find and you can make money off of, you keep. So that's what we've done. And so it's really, really cool. And you will see more about it around one day and school supplies and, and different things like that. So we're excited about uh, our share bug. And as you can see, it's a she. Uh, and, and we may have a Mr. Share bug at some point, Mr. Freeman, just so you know. Yeah, it's coming. <laughs> and, and, and he's built on my body size and not Jackie's. <laughs> just y'all will catch that in a minute. Uh, but seriously, uh, other than this conference, uh, you know, this, this started out of our financial wellness department and people sometimes say, well, why do you, uh, how does financial wellness end up doing this? Well, it's all inter interrelated. Other than this conference, what other investments uh, do you make or have you made in the education arena in the past year or so? Well, I mean, it, it really started, we had a vision at Alabama One to invest more in our community. Uh, we started this about six years ago and Jackie came on board about four years ago, three years ago, all right, so third annual conference. So uh, one of the things we started about is how do we get financial wellness out into our school system? And uh, we've done from Mad City Money to maybe name some of the other programs that we've uh, taken on. Financial education, we've done the financial education passport, at Hale County, we've done it um, at Davis Emerson Middle School, and that is a seventh grade program that we put together. That's basically about a seven week course. We kick it off and then we give the financial curriculum to the teachers and then they will do um, deliver to the students. And then we come back in and give awards and make sure that they're learning all the things that they need to do. So that's been very successful in the seventh grade curriculum. Um, you were speaking about Mad City Money. Um, I'm proud to say that this, this year, um, Tuscaloosa City Schools partnered with us and we are doing Mad City Money for all 11th graders. Um, and that was through, um, um, led by Andrea White, who's um, under Dr. Daria. And so we, um, we did Bryant High School and then we have Central and Northridge scheduled for January and February of next year. You may be saying, what's Matt City Money? It is a real life uh, budgeting simulation uh, where they go to nine different vendors, they get a profile, and they literally have to do life, they have to take all of those things, budget, uh, and then I get to play the role of Mr. Fickle. Some of you may have seen the uh, the kiss imitation back there on the back, but uh, I bring either bills or 
unexpected blessings and they have to be ready for that and manage their finances around it. So it's true in real life and it's really impactful. Uh, and we've seen kids grow through that. If you guys were in charge of the education system of America, you're the big dog, um, not a big elephant. Uh, we can't say dog this year because of Georgia, but the big elephant. Oh, oh, and, and of course, Mississippi State too. So uh, elephant, you're the big elephant and you get to make the What would you, what would be one or two changes you would say, hey, this is what we need to do to build a bridge uh, to the future of education? Um, I, I would probably say one, and, and someone said this earlier, I'm not sure who it was, but really meeting the students where they are, um, I think is huge because everyone, they all do not learn the same. We, you know, I have three children and all three, the way they learn, the way they process is all different. You know, if, if I could take, you know, our son and, and, and just put him in a school where he can show his talent on dancing and singing, but somehow incorporate that, you know, math and all those things into that, I think he would excel further versus, you know, our, our middle child who is a bookworm and all she wants to do is read. And so I think one, the first thing I would do is try to, let's figure out a way, and I don't know exactly what that is, but how do we meet them where they are? Um, and then the second thing, I think that something that we can help with as businesses um, is, is giving them, um, the students more to do outside of the classroom. And what I mean by that, you know, maybe we do field trips and they come see us and they ask us questions or we come to you all and, and they ask us questions or, you know, maybe do some early internships. And, you know, I think I want to go in banking. What does that look like? A day in the life with a banker, you know, a, a day in the life with an engineer, I think. And I'm not sure if you all are doing those things, but that's what I would do. I, I think the more hands on, the more we can let them see exactly what they do, because it may change their mind. You know, I thought I wanted to be a banker, but now I think I want to go over here and, and I want to be a nurse. Well, what does that look like? Can you handle the blood? Do you want to do those things? That I would just give them more to do outside of the classroom. Well said. Well said. And I would uh, concur with that. And I would say try to figure out how to get us more engaged. I know, you know, as a pastor, one of the things that uh, I teach my church was we always talk about revival. We need revival. We need revival. Well, you know how many people have to be revived to have a revival? One. If every single person, just, just one person, you don't need the whole group, just one. But you be that one. Well, it's the same thing in education. Uh, if we want to close the gap or build a bridge, uh, we don't know what all those bridges are and we don't know what all those pathways are, but I promise you in this room, there are enough resources that if Dr. Johnson and Dr. Daria had the problem of telling people, hey, y'all, we, we, we got too many people. Have y'all ever had that problem? Okay, all right. So, so they, they've not had that problem. So I would encourage you Find out what your gifting is. You know, uh, it's, it's, it's corny, we say it a lot, but teamwork makes the dream work. Uh, and together everyone achieves more. Every single one of us brings a talent to uh, the table that can help build this bridge we're talking about that we don't even really know what that bridge looks like. But I promise you it's gonna take all of us uh, to do it if we're gonna do it effectively. So. Uh, that's what I would say the biggest thing I would do is try to figure out how do I get you individually involved in, in the education process. So um, it, just a couple more quick things as we, we wrap things up. We do this every year uh, and we will be back next year. So I, I guess the question is kind of what's, what's on the agenda, uh, Jackie, for next year? And we'll talk a little bit about that. So as you can see, there's a save the date, um, November 9th, we will be back here at Bryant Conference Center. Um, really, again, the focus is going to be a lot about, you know, faith um, and, and how we bring the faith community into education and just 
overall how we all can come together. Um, I have not thought of that much detail yet. I know you think I do think ahead of time like that, but not that much. Um, but I, I will say it, it is going to be great. We will have more speakers, we'll have more engagement. But I would ask you all, um, and, I, and I thank you for staying um, all the way to the end. If you have suggestions, comments, um, things as educators that you would like to see next year or different things that you would like to see, it's not up here, but I'll tell you, you can email me at Finwell, and it's F-I-N-W-E-L-L -L at alabama1.org. I would love to hear your comments, um, any suggestions. I, I will say that in 2019, when we had our first conference, um, Tanaya Jackson, who's here, I just saw her sitting back there in the back, um, because she spoke up at the 12th hour, I think it was, and talked about, hey, where, where are the people my age? Why are you not engaging us? We actually started Gen Talk, um, and we did one series this year, but we started Gen Talk because of her suggestion. You know, how are we reaching the millennials and the Gen Zers and all of those, you know, their, their conversations may be a little different than what most of us in this room would want it to be. So I, I would ask and suggest that if you have comments, finwell at alabama1.org, um, please send them to me and I would appreciate it. And Bill, I'll let you close things out is, you know, we can't do this uh, without the support of, of your CEO and, and the support of our entire organization. Um, why do you believe uh, so uh, adamantly about investing in these three pillars? And uh, we'll let that wrap things up. Well, first of all, we appreciate everybody uh, uh, joining us. This is our third one. And uh, just the, the format, the crowd, uh, the participation has really been awesome. We learn each time we do this. The reason we do it is this is who we are. This is who Alabama One is. We want to be known as uh, a business, a financial institution that invests back into its community. I always call this the softer side of financial services where we're reaching out to our members, uh, to our community, and trying to make their lives better, our communities better. And so we're committed to this. We're building a team around this. Uh, you'll see us start to expand what we do in this area because we believe this is who we are. This defines who we are as an institution. All right, well, we wanna thank you once again uh, so much for your participation. Please come see me, Ms. Davis. Please come see me, uh, Neighborhood uh, Bridges. And anyone else that, that is interested in being a part of what we do, as you said, next year, it's not necessarily the name of the conference, but it'll be about getting churches, schools, in the community engaged. I believe uh, part of the bridge uh, of building the future is going back to the past. Um, our country, if you go back and look at our greatest institutions, they were all faith-based. Uh, when it comes to education, many of them were, were faith-based in their founding. And we need to get the churches back involved in the day-to-day -day education, day-to-day -day community, uh, and day-to-day day lives of, of our students. And so we'll be uh, encouraging that next year and we'll need you to, to make that, that possible. I will close with, with one other thing. This is the big conference and many of you may not be aware, we do three virtual luncheons um, on whatever the focus is for the year. Uh, and so if you would be looking for those dates and we'll, we'll make sure we communicate them, but we'll do one a quarter uh, and it'll be around the theme for the year. So we so much appreciate uh, you for being a part. And as Alabama One, we say Alabama One, we're one together and together with you, uh, we can build a bridge to the future of education. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Well, I'll, I'll just do it from here. I'll just leave it up there so they have a date. Yeah. Okay. Awesome job.